hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. If you guys remember this, uh, we all probably prescribed a little bit of hydroxychloroquine. At that time, there was a notion from, um, from the executive branch, what do we have to lose? At the same time, AHA and ACA issues a warning about hydroxychloroquine, particularly the ubiquitous use of hydroxychloroquine indiscriminately. June 8th, the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet retract all the hydroxychloroquine studies. And then June 18th and 20th, the WHO and the NIH stop hydroxychloroquine trials. On June 29th, Gilead sets the price of remdesivir for $3,120, keeping in mind that the National Institutes of Immunology and Infectious Disease paid for the study for remdesivir. So this is the landscape that we were operating in and navigating in in the year 2020 in the first six months. So whether you listen to the NIH, the WHO, or whoever, remember that everything that is promised to you is not exactly true. Everything at the end of a rainbow is not exactly a pot of gold. In fact, oftentimes it's just the opposite. Well, what do we have to lose? This is what we had to lose, and this is what we lost. We lost one million Americans, and you can see through the roadmap. And this is, this is a very sobering statistic. Anything that I've been through has, has not prepared me to be a healthcare provider in a situation like this. So we learned on the fly. We learned with very little information, and we were really flying without a net in terms of evidence-based. So we had, to make, we had to make adjustments on the fly and to take care of our patients and treat our, uh, uh, keep our uh, staff safe. If you want to put it in perspective, basically you wiped out Rhode Island or Montana or Delaware. And that's, that's a very sobering statistic. So, what do you do in a situation like that? The only thing I know to do personally and from all my training is, is, to, is to use a scientific method and try to make observations. But the problem that Alfredo and I had when we, when we started this program is we didn't even know what question to ask. Who were we treating? Where were they coming from? Why were they seeking care? And what could we do? So the first thing we did was an observational study that just looked at who our patients were and why they were coming to our clinic. So why this study? Well, first of all, th there was no how to do it papers. Like I said, we were flying without a net. Um, we needed to uh, look at how we were personally doing it, and we thought that information may be helpful to other people. We had a responsibility. We are a healthcare system for a certain population in Indianapolis, and we have a responsibility to those patients and to serve those patients. And that's our primary mission at Olivio. There was lack of resources. The published papers that we had were really from hospital settings or from emergency room settings. This is not very helpful in the time of, of a private clinic trying to, trying to see patients where the rubber meets the road. And like all primary care facilities, we're the first in and the last out of a pandemic. We're seeing it before any of the papers are published. Um, we're dealing with a sequela and we're dealing with all the delayed care and sort of the so-called collateral damage. So the first thing we found out is why do patients come to Olivio during a global pandemic? Well, those with suspected COVID, they think they have COVID, they come. Patients with test confirmed COVID with or without symptoms. Patients didn't know what to do if they had COVID and, no, and had no symptoms. Those who encountered suspected or confirmed cases, and patients who were simply anxious about COVID and wanted testing. There was a lot of that. There was a lot of anxiety. If you measured the generalized anxiety of the country, it was sky high at this time. We turned to work and school testing, travel testing, other reasons. They come from very, very many reasons, diverse backgrounds, to this clinic to find out information about COVID, information that they could rely on. The population that we treat doesn't have a lot of confidence in some of the other information sources. So we became, we became that source for them. During the time of the study, which was from May to July of 2020, we saw 6,000 patients in Olivia. Only 409 patients came and were triaged to the COVID area. Now that's, think about those numbers and that ratio. Only 6.2% of our general practice, even during a pandemic, 
came because of COVID. So the vast majority of patients came to Olivio for other reasons, management of chronic diseases, et cetera. Out of those 409 patients, 161 tested positive for COVID. The other thing we faced with is how do you test patients for COVID? PCR was a four, uh, four day turnaround. We had no rapid antigen test. You couldn't go to the pharmacy and buy, and buy a test. So we got involved with a company who was making a rapid antibody test and we were instrumental in, in, in coming up with some of the protocols and determining this uh, positive and negative predictive value of that particular test. And we used this test throughout this early period of COVID testing. The other thing we noticed was the patients presented with clusters of symptoms. And it seemed if you lump the patients into clusters, you have a better predictive value of detecting who has COVID and who doesn't, who could be symptomatic and who can. not By far the most common was the constitutional, followed by, by respiratory. This is the early days, remember. This is not Delta virus we're talking about. This is the so-called alpha virus here. It's totally different, it changed. And I'm gonna show you a graph here that looks at, this is taking a bioinformatic approach of all our patients in our systems, clustering them into this point in time. This is a three-dimensional diagram, but if I could do it and I had the resources to do it and stretch it out over time, I could show how these symptom clusters change with the different strains of the coronavirus. And I think that's very interesting. The coronavirus that I'm seeing now is not the same coronavirus even as Omicron. It's totally different and we're seeing another little wave at Olivia right now. So it's very interesting to look at these clusters and then understand that the more symptoms in different clusters you have, the more likely you're gonna have COVID. It's just not one symptom. And so the screening of do you have fever or not and you can pass or not pass is really a very insensitive marker. You need to look at a whole syndromic effect of how COVID presents. Here's another thing, different from, our, different from other patient populations. Our patients had a higher probability of having prolonged COVID as opposed to other populations. In the literature, it's reported as 10%. We're at 57% of our patients having uh, what they call long COVID, long haul haulers, however you wanna call it. And you can look at the different um, uh, low energy, alteration in taste and smell, sleep disturbances, anxiety. In total, 57% of the patients had prolonged symptoms defined by greater than 30 days. Why is that in this patient population? We also looked at our socioeconomic issues. 50% of our patients were considered essential workers. Work construction, factory warehouses, food services. 16% had health insurance. 84% didn't have health insurance. And of, the, and of those 16%, most of them were what I consider underinsured. In 36 days of missed work for these essential workers. Think about that. These people are living hand to mouth. They have about one paycheck ahead of bills and they missed 36 days. It wipes them out financially. This disease did a number on the patient that we see in our clinic. The WHO defines severe COVID as less than 94% or respiratory rate as greater than 30% and they recommended that these patients go into the hospital. Now that we know about our patient population, we know something about the demographics, we know something about who our patient population is, we're now in a position where we can start answering some questions and formulating hypotheses. Well, they define severe COVID as, greater than, as, as a saturation less than 94%. What's the, what was the treatment recommendation? Hospitalized patients, but does not, this is straight from the CDC, hospitalized patients, but does not require supplemental oxygen. Well, they recommend maybe using remdesivir. They recommend against using corticosteroids, hospitalized and require supplemental oxygen. So what, if you're in a primary care setting or if you're seeing patients in the field, what are you supposed to do based on these recommendations? Are you supposed to treat or not treat or just wait and see what they do? Whether they go from home not requiring oxygen to home requiring oxygen to the hospital requiring oxygen to the hospital being intubated. How are, you supposed to, how are you supposed to manage those patients? 
So finally, we were able to ask a question during this whole thing. And our question was based on a premises for patients with a diagnosis of severe COVID, by whose definition could an aggressive treatment protocol utilizing early oxygen, steroids, nebulizations, and very aggressive physiotherapy prevent hospitalization? Remember, at this time, the hospitals were, they couldn't get into a bed. They were in the hallway. They're called hallway patients. And our hypo hypothesis was that most patients with severe COVID requiring oxygen do not require hospitalization. This is our data. We looked at 103 patients, and out of those 103 patients with CDC severe COVID, only 19% had to go to the hospital. When you look at the group of hospitalized versus non-hospitalized, the resting oxygen is not that much different. I don't know how my pointer works here, but I could show you. It's, a, it's, it's almost at the bottom. But the exertional oxygen was substantially different. So our test was very sophisticated. We used a, we used a very sophisticated test to determine what the exer exertional oxygen was. And that was basically put a pulse ox on and walk for 20 feet and come back. And we measured your oxygen again. When we did that, we saw that exertional oxygen on the 19 patients that eventually had to go to the hospital was substantially lower than the patients uh, that did not have to go to the, ho uh, the hospital. And then we, cal we calculated what I call the delta SpO2, which is the difference between the resting oxygen and exertional oxygen, and that again was highly significant. So resting oxygen does not predict who goes to the hospital demographics does not prevent who goes to the hospital but exertional oxygen does and the delta between the exertional oxygen and the resting oxygen does we also wanted to look at the chest radiographs and and we divided it based on a numbering system we found in italy we divided them into six different categories and each category could get a score of zero through three based on how bad their lung disease was. You can look over on the left and you can see a panel um, or chest a score of one, below that is 10 and 14, and you can see a progressive increase in pulmonary disease. Remember, the highest you could get based on this score system is 18. First thing we noticed was that COVID preferentially affects the lower lung fields above and beyond the upper lung fields. I don't know that that's been observed before, but we certainly saw it in, in, our, in our studies. The other thing is, our lung injury stores versus hospital versus non-hospital was not significant, but profound. 10.95 for non-hospital and 11 for hospital. White blood cell, lymphocytes, D-dimers, CRP. If you want an idea of how sick these patients are, look at our CRPs across the board. 98, 92, 134. These are significantly ill patients. Liver enzymes, the liver enzymes are high as well. When we enter all this into a multivariable logistic regression, we see that in this variable, nothing really pans out. However, this model is a little bit oversaturated, and when we look at the, the model, taking an entry criteria of everything with a p-value 0 0.10 or less on univariate, putting it into this multivariate, and the only thing that comes out is the delta oxygen saturation. So we think this is a pretty profound and simple test that you can use to look and see what patient may do worse and have to go to the hospital. I think what it looks at is it gets to the point of pulmonary reserve, how much pulmonary reserve you have. And the patients who have less pulmonary reserve drop the oxygen more on exertion. It's a simple test and you can do it in the office. So, in conclusion, most patients sought care during the pandemic for non-COVID-related illnesses. Clusters of symptoms are better than any individual one symptom. Our patients are essential workers. Most of them missed, on average, more than 30 days of work. The triage we used worked. In this particular time, very few of our employees got sick with COVID by using this method of triage. 57% of our patients had symptoms greater than 30 days. Our patients were mostly uninsured and therefore exempt from the governor's directive to stay home. You can't stay home if you're an essential worker. This is a point I really want to get across, is the lack of evidence or lack of guidelines does not equate to treatment nihilism. We stayed open and we did something. We didn't exactly know what to do, but we did something 
uh, with our resources and what was at our, dis our disposal. It may not work for other places, but it worked for us. And I encourage everyone in a time of pandemic to look around what they have and use the resources that they, that they have as a, at their disposal. Over 80% of patients with severe COVID can stay home with an aggressive and highly um, uh, close monitoring system. Uh, the calculating the dynamic difference between resting and inventory oxygen is likely indicative of a pulmonary reserve and SpO2 delta was predictive of hospitalizations. I think during the COVID pandemic, we all kind of felt like this. We all were kind of alone. We felt like we were groundless and um, and there wasn't a whole lot, uh, we looked to the left and looked to the right and there wasn't a whole lot of people there. Um, there's a Buddhist philosophy that I think to take it to the next pandemic or the next wave is that nothing is permanent, nothing is finished, and nothing is perfect. And I think we can live with that. Thank you very much. We need to move on. We're gonna save questions until the breaks because we're, we got started a little bit late and we're gonna move on and catch up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next is Dr. Javier Sevilla. Dr. Javier Sevilla is a professor of medicine, a professor of family practice in the IU School of Medicine, one of the first contributors of Alivio Medical Center 20 years ago, and um, really a leader in medical education, um, making sure that students get a diverse exposure to a diverse population. So he's gonna talk today about the model to serve the Hispanic Latino community from the academic perspective. Welcome, Javier. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Lopez, for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here in this wonderful celebration. Alivio Health Center has um, really been part of the health of the community since uh, 20 years ago, and I was one of the first, as uh, Dr. Lopez mentioned, to participate. I heard of uh, Dr. Lopez in town, and I was Dr. Sevilla in town, so I said, that sounds like we speak the same language. I went and looked for him and found it in uh, West Washington. And uh, so we, we became friends and, uh, you know, started to look for ways to serve the community. And I, I always had a, a dream to be an academician. That was my goal, to come to the United States and seek training to teach. Uh, I, I am a, a, a teacher of elementary school in Honduras before I went to med school. So I always had a passion. And that's what, what I have um, done during this uh, past 20 years. 20 years in Indianapolis. So today I will be talking about, you know, how we have approached the Hispanic Latino community through academia here at the U.S. School of Medicine and specifically at the Department of Family Medicine. So when we were here in 2000, I don't know how many of you remember, but there was a, in the star, first page, it said uh, Latinos will bankrupt um, Wishart Health uh, Hospital. There were 30,000 visits in one year for Hispanic surnames. And so there was the concern, why are these people going to the emergency room? And the answer was obvious, but so I decided that I wanted to I approach it. So I will tell you how we did it. We will de I will describe you a series of programs that we de have developed. I will describe the process for implementation, and I will also would like to hear from you. I know some of you, even if you are not in a formal academic center, but have the experience to develop um, programs that you could also share how you have done it and what has been the outcomes. So I, what I did, you know, I wanted to find out what were the barriers that the Hispanic Latino community was experiencing to access healthcare. So did a very simple survey in the community. We um, did it uh, in Alivio Health Center. We did it in, uh, in the um, uh, uh, grocery stores. We did it in the soccer fields. 
We did it in the Mexican restaurants, Honduran restaurants, in health fairs, everywhere. And so we found that cost of service, you know, was the number one barrier that the Hispanic Latino community was uh, experiencing, lack of insurance, but that wasn't specific to the Hispanic Latino community. In 2002, there were more than 44 Americans, million Americans, who were without health insurance. So this, this wasn't a problem of the Hispanic Latino community alone, but there was language, for example. And so language was the third barrier that we needed to overcome, fear of the system, and this had dif different aspects, you know, uh, people being afraid of being mistreated at, at places, not only because of immigration status, that's, as most people believe, is also the fear to be mistreated. I will never forget how fearful I was when I couldn't be understood the first time I tried to order a McDonald's when I came to the United States. So it, it produces a fear in, in, in the person. And then transportation, you know, people don't know how to get, don't have the means for transportation and the, or doesn't know the available services. That was the other uh, um, final. It was like no services after the hours. Alivio was the only place in town that had Saturdays at that time. Yeah, and so that was, that, that was wonderful. So what we, uh, we asked what to do. The community told us what to do. They wanted a health center like Alivio with uh, services in Spanish. They wanted uh, a listing of services available, and we did that. I will show you how we did it. More bilingual staff in clinics and more interpreters in clinics and all that was the same. They wanted after the hour services or weekends. So what we did, we, we presented these outcomes in the community and we started a, a series of uh, collaborations. You can see Indiana Latino Institute with smoking cessation. We hired the um, tobacco cessation uh, services from Washington, D.C. They came, trained us, and we started to provide uh, smoking cessation in Spanish because it didn't exist at that time. That was around 2002, 2004. And then we started the um, health segment with um, Indiana Minority Health Coalition and Univision. I, some of you might remember when Univision was part of the, of the services in, in Indiana. Then we also did the Jornadas de Salud with the Indiana State Department of Health in Marion County, we will take over the uh, apartment complexes, uh, we'll borrow the, the administration building, and we will set up there a clinic, and we will do screenings and education. There were stations, like blood pressure station, diabetes station, cholesterol station, obesity station, and smoking cessation station. So patients will come through, and they will have a a, 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 a form to, to fill, and, and then they will have special prices at the end. And it was truly a, a, a joy to see the community participating and with several um, organizations. Then we also started a, uh, a partnership with the, the School of um, uh, World Culture and Languages, and we integrated Spanish into the introduction to medical uh, uh, clinical medicine in the School of Medicine, first and second year. And so it wasn't a, a, a um, teaching English, it was an integration, Spanish, I'm sorry, it was an integration of the Spanish into the learning of medicine. And so we also started the Hispanic Latino Health Summit, we then called Clarion Health, now IU Health. We had four of those, we educated the community leaders and, and health system about the needs of the community, inviting experts from around the nation. And then in the academic level, you know, we, of course, we saw language was the barrier, so we introduced El Señor Martinez, first week of medical school. So it was a full case. I will come with a, with a student or a volunteer from the community who will be the patient. It will be standardized, you know, but they could answer what they want, but Senor Martinez was the patient. We will do the interviewing in front of the whole new class, and we are the largest medical school in the nation. And then the whole week, all of the competences of medical education will be covered 
studying the case of, of El Señor Martinez. And that was an eye-opening. It was a pro, uh, provoking and also, also a cultural awareness for our students and sensitizing for them to care for our community. And as I said, we integrated Spanish. Then we started the family medicine clerkship also in Spanish. And uh, our students have to complete it. And those who are bilingual, not everybody is bilingual, or graduates bilingual from my US School of Medicine, but we have a group that does graduate. We have graduated over 400 bilingual physicians in the last uh, 20 years. And so that is about, what, 10 at first. Now we are graduating like maybe 16 per, per year. And so those, uh, some of them have stayed in, in Indiana, some are around the country. And then uh, they come to places where we have a significant number of uh, Spanish-speaking patients and have to be obviously fluent to be able to provide care. And our students, by the time they finish second year, they have to take the IU health system as equivalent to the uh, Eskenazi health system bilingual provider exam. So they have to pass a test to be clear to, t to interview patients in, 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 in Spanish. So they, they do have a an standard. And then we created an elective care for, care for the underserved when they come and learn specifically about the Hispanic Latino community and other underserved communities and how to serve. We develop a global health elective in Honduras for an immersion in culture and language. Our students can stay overseas for up to eight weeks, live with a family that they speak only Spanish, and volunteer in the community and observe in, in, um, at the ho local hospitals. And then we also founded the Society of Latino uh, Medical Students and the Medical Spanish Interest Groups. And finally, we integrated the Indiana University Student Outreach Clinic with this, which is a free clinic that we have been running since 2009. So my days to, to collaborate and, and serve at Alivio were Saturdays, but once I started it, this is a free clinic that runs in Saturdays, so I couldn't come back. But if we still collaborate. Alivio Health Center provides services to um, the clinic because we don't have um, x-rays, ultrasounds, and that kind of services, or even CTs, so we get them through Alivio Health Center. And um, so this is the free clinic. It's the largest interprofessional clinic that, um, and service learning that there is in the nation. We have included medicine, pharmacy, nursing, social work, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Uh, we have a legal clinic. We have an eye clinic. We have dermatology clinic, women's health clinic and so on. And um, so we serve on Saturdays only, 10 to 3 p.m., but now we are getting a build, building finished across the street from a church where we have been running it for the past 13 years. And it, it was uh, something that, you know, we embarked on it, and we didn't know what we were doing. When we got this building free, ba basically we just had to pay $25,000 for the taxes that were owned on it but it was empty, uh, it had door, uh, door floors, and uh, so it, it was $400,000 to finish it in 2016 when we got it. To finish it this July 15, it was 1.2 million. But we were able to fundraise it, and it's going to be the grand opening on August 27th at 3.30 p.m., so you are invited. Thank you. And so the, the students love it. They, they fill the places to volunteer in two minutes. Two minutes. The calendar opens, and in two minutes it's closed for the month. And so that, that has been a, truly a, a, a joy to see that. Clinical services, we partnered with the community centers, Alivio Health Center, and we were declared at the Family Medicine Center the Hispanic Latino Health Site for IU Health or Clarion Health at that time and we re have recruited an um, uh, average of four uh, family medicine residents from all Latin America per year during the last uh, 20 years. So, so, so far, the 10 years outcomes, 80 Hispanic Latino medical students from 20 in 2002, 
So we went from having 20 Latinos in the largest medical school in the nation to 80 per, uh, you know, for the four years, so 20 per year. 14 Hispanic Latino family medicine residents in 2000, to the, the largest in the nation that was at that time, so in Indiana. So that was a great uh, joy to see, and we have graduated 45 family physicians, and 15 of them are still in Indiana. And we have a well-established clinical services at the Family Medicine Center and at the um, Student Outreach Clinic. So we have done a health profile of the Hispanic Latino community at the Family Medicine Center. Uh, I repeated my various research 10 years later and found that language has improved. The community see language not as the main barrier. Obviously, it's for the services that uh, we have created in the past 20 years, like Alivio and others that are, have joined the community. And the, then we are doing, a, we started the longitudinal experience at a US um, uh, outreach clinic with the bilingual students. They can do it throughout their fourth year of medical school. And we have done research on quality measures. We demonstrated that the IU student outreach clinic treats hypertension better than the national average in the poor and underserved. So the recommendations are to always to be proactive. You know, we could have said, oh, what are we going to do? Let's open another uh, emergency room. But instead of that, we have to go and find the solution. Invite them to come. Build them, and they will come. That's what the movie said, right? Assess community needs assets, because the community also has assets. And that's what we found. And that's how we collaborated in networking, partnering, like we have done, for example, with Alivio Health Center and other organizations here represented today, and implement new services and evaluate. So that's what we are doing. And in summary, you know, the need for services to meet the needs of our community have to be approached from the academic perspective in a way that not only brings uh, curricular innovations, but also we can uh, learn new, new uh, um, ways to do it and apply to the teaching to you know, graduate physicians who are prepared to care for our community. Thank you. So if, if somebody has any question or would like to comment or share an experience of something similar or recommendation of how we could improve, welcome, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Incredible work investing on the youth. Of course, multiplying that impact in the community. That's what Dr. Sevilla did. Rolando? Oh, Dr. Arno? Oh, yeah. Free laboratory. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. We're switching gears now. We're moving towards imaging, towards radiology. Uh, where, I don't see him. Where is he? Oh, okay. Um, I received a phone call from Dr. Vince Matthews. Vince Matthews was the director of neuroradiology at IU. Uh, he, he had trained at Johns Hopkins, really well-respected individual. And um, I was a stroke doctor back there in, in, at IU. And he called me, and Alfredo, could you check this, this resume? I, I, I'm not sure where this guy comes from. Some, some name, Tejada, Juan Tejada. Can, can you check and see, if, should we interview him and keep him? So I, I review his resume, and this, this individual was a professor of radiology at the School of Medicine at Universidad del Valle. He was a teacher, was studying, publishing. I mean, it was a, he was a star. 
And I called back Vince and said, you better keep this person now. Don't let him go. He's going to be a star for your program. Dr. Juan Tejada is going to talk about endovascular treatment of intracranial aneurysms, what has happened over the 20, past 20 years. This doctor can put a catheter, a little microtube, in any blood, vessels in, in blood vessel in your brain. He's incredibly talented, incredibly skilled. Juan, welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, very much, Alfredo, for that nice uh, introduction, and um, well, appreciate uh, the invitation, and congratulate all the Alivio team in those uh, in this its first 20 years serving the Hispanic community. Um, so we just in the next 20 minutes, we're just going to briefly talk about uh, intracranial aneurysm treatment. Uh, there's uh, start with from the beginning. Let's define what an aneurysm is, which is a dilation of any vascular structure. We're going to, uh, today we're just going to talk about uh, arterial intracranial aneurysms. They're not congenital, they're acquired, um, degenerative, uh, related to degenerative changes of the vessel wall. Uh, about 2.4% of the population will, will harbor an aneurysm. There are some that are congenital, but they are, they are not the majority. Uh, and they're important because they can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage, which uh, is a pretty bad disease to have. Uh, they rupture in the fifth or sixth uh, decade of life. And, the problem is that 50% that, uh, of the patients who experience uh, a rupture in aneurysm, they will die. 25% uh, will have severe neurological deficits, and only 25% will go back to baseline neurological status. This is how subarachnoid hemorrhage looks like. Um, where's the, the point? Okay. So the white um, stuff in the CT is uh, the blood in the brain. Uh, in the subarachnoid space, so that's what we're trying to prevent. And this is what causes uh, that blood, like this. This is the aneurysm. This is a 3D uh, angiographic image of a right MCA aneurysm showing a, a secular aneurysm of, of that area. So um, why do we treat uh, aneurysms using minimally invasive surgery and, and, and uh, endovascular approach? Uh, it was not always that way. If you remember uh, not so long ago, the gold standard w uh, for intracranial aneurysm treatment was craniotomy and clipping. So about 20 years ago or so, um, they came out with this uh, trial that is called the ISAT. It was a randomized trial, multi-center trial, 2,500 patients. And the primary objective was to show if, uh, to prove the hypothesis that endovascular treatment was somehow better for the patient that craniotomy and clipping. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the, the trial came back positive, and uh, the, the difference between clipping and coiling was a statistically significant regarding uh, the, the, uh, the, the status of the patient after the intervention. So uh, more patients were uh, not disabled or dead if were treated with endovascular surgery. And that difference was statistically significant. The uh, definite risk reduction was 7.4%. So this is the Kaplan-Meier analysis. So this gap is uh, the difference in the vascular surgery and neurosurgery. And that difference was maintained over time. Uh, the re-bleeding rate was almost zero. And the recurrence rate was the criticism of that trial, that it, it, it was thought to be too high. But um, then most of the aneurysms that recur did not need a retreatment. The retreatment rate was only 10 to 15 percent. Then uh, there's a different disease, which is the unruptured aneurysms, the one that we find incidentally. Uh, let's say when a patient has a car accident, goes to the ED, gets, gets scanned, and then we see an aneurysm that is unrelated to the accident or unrelated to the headaches. So those are a different entity, uh, and uh, all, all the aneurysms that are ruptured need to be treated, no question, but uh, not all the aneurysms that are incidental need treatment. So they, uh, about 20 years ago, also in the 1990s, early 2000s, they did a, the uh, unruptured intracranial aneurysm trial. It was retrospective and prospective. The prospective cohort was um, running in the early 90s. They followed the patients for about four years, 6,500 patients. They were divided into two groups, one group which prior subarachnoid hemorrhage from a different uh, aneurysm, and one group without, group, group two without uh, history of subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
And the conclusion was that the larger aneurysmal, uh, that, that the, the stronger predictor of aneurysm rupture was the size. So the magic number was seven millimeters, meaning that uh, uh, patients with aneurysms great, uh, bigger than seven millimeters should be treated. If they were smaller, they should not be treated if they were incidental. Um, somehow, the posterior circulation was higher risk, and for whatever reason, they included the posterior communicating artery in the posterior circulation. Uh, and then these are the, the numbers, again, familiar uh, numbers, 15.7.4% uh, and 13.1% risk of morbidity and mortality with clipping uh, and 9.5% with endovascular treatment, so that was statistically significant. And again, um, endovascular treatment was proved to be, um, have better outcomes than uh, uh, open uh, surgery. In a table, uh, this is kind of sums it up. If you have an aneurysm that is incidentally discovered, measures less than seven millimeters and is in the anterior circulation, the risk of rupturing is zero. Uh, but if you have a large aneurysm or a giant aneurysm, which is by definition greater than 25 millimeters, then you have a, about 50% of risk of rupturing in five years, like 10% per year. So there's no question we need to treat this, but we do not treat, do not need to treat this. So that goes against the, the common theory that when, when, when a patient has an aneurysm, they uh, tell them that they have a time bomb in their heads, and that's uh, definitely not true. Um, so, um, so how we do this, we, uh, we do it with a, with a growing puncture. We access the femoral artery, uh, get uh, catheters all the way up. I use a triaxial system, which is a, a big cat, a big sheet, like it's a femoral eight French sheet with a six French catheter, then a micro catheter, so that's why it's called a triaxial technique, because it's three catheters to give more support. All the patients are heparinized, um, normotensive during the surgery. There's no antibiotics that we need to use and we use uh, heparinized uh, flush bags, and some of the patients require double antiplatelet therapy, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, uh, mainly the ones that require a stent or, or a flow diverter. Uh, we, when we, we finish the procedure, we achieve hemostasis in the groin, either with compression or with closure devices, which we use more often now. Uh, patient recovers in the ICU for 24 hours and goes home the next day. It's usually just an overnight admission after the surgery. The patients that uh, have a stent will need uh, aspirin and Plavix for a couple months after the procedure. Then how do we follow them? Uh, we, we do cross-sectional imaging in the first six weeks, uh, MRA, without contrast for the patients that have coiling. And if they have another device, we do CTAs, we do have flow diverters or stents. And then we, all of them will get a catheter angiogram follow up at six months. And then we repeat the cross-sectional images for about three, four years until document stability, and then we release them from the clinic. We basically evaluate for a residual neck of the aneurysm, coil compaction recurrence, and decide if there's a need for retreatment or not. So devices that, the devices that we use uh, come from the very basic ones, which are the coils that everybody has heard about. It's just wires. They uh, have been used since 1995. The, the first physician that used them in an alive subject was Dr. Vinuela from Uruguay at UCLA in 1995. Um, so they're, but they're just basically a wire that comes soldered to, to a pusher wire, and then you detach them in the aneurysm. So they look something like this. This is that pusher wire, that's the coil itself, and that's um, the junction that you melt with this handheld detacher that you put in the, in the pusher wire. You supply a current, and in, in two, one and two seconds, this coil is detached in, in, in the aneurysm, inside the aneurysm, and then you pull this wire out. Um, they very, they're becoming different degrees of softness, so very soft, a more, little more uh, sturdy, and, and, and they you know, take all these turns to fill the aneurysm gaps, and um, they come with these two filaments, which are the stretch-resistant technology, meaning that you can, it's very difficult for, for a coil to break nowadays. It happened a lot before, but not now, because uh, they, these two filaments make it stronger, and you can, pretty much can always pull the coil out if it's not going well. So this is one of our early cases in early 2000s. Uh, 
This, this is the aneurysm right here. It's an injection of the internal carotid artery. This is the ICA bifurcation. And uh, then you have a, two, a catheter with two markers. When you cross the second marker with this uh, line on the pusher wire, it means that the whole aneurysm, the whole coil is inside the aneurysm and is safely to detach. And then you detach it, you just pull this out, and then you keep doing the same thing until it's packed completely with, with coils and the, the blood is not going inside it anymore, so it, just, it prevents it from, from bleeding in the future. So which aneurysms are good for coiling? Well, this is, it can get better than this one. It's a, it's a large aneurysm with a, with a very nar narrow neck, meaning that the neck is less than four millimeters or the ratio between the neck and the dome is less than 0.5. So that means that all the coils are gonna stay in the aneurysm and they're not gonna go into the internal carotid artery. Right? This is a posterior communicator artery uh, aneurysm. And uh, this is the six months follow-up and the four years follow-up. We don't do routinely four years follow-up. This patient was just lost to follow-up. She was from Panama. She went back to Panama and came back a few years later. And then we just decided to do a uh, catheter and geography. But her treatment is, is, has been durable. Uh, along the, you know, like the, 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 the lines of the, the, these last 20 years, um, like in the mid 2000s, the, the 3D technology came uh, to. Is there, is, there, is there a way to turn this light down a little bit? Can you turn the lights of the room down, please? Yes, so. yes it's just they're not projecting very well here. But, um, you know, this is an anterior communicator artery aneurysm, so you cannot see exactly what's going on with the anterior cerebral arteries. You don't know if you're gonna put a coil here if it's gonna herniate on the normal vessel and cause a stroke. So that's why the 3D technology is, is very good because it lets you know exactly where the aneurysm is and where the normal vessels are. And then you can document after the treatment um, where the coils are exactly. So. So it's, a, it's very helpful, and that was started to develop in the, let's say, in the mid-2000s. Um, so then you can, in the same room, you can acquire CT-like images like this. In this case, we just wanted to see where the coils were. But you can, in, in brain windows, you can see if there's a bleed or if there's a herniation of the brain or if there's a complication, just without having to transfer the patient to the CT. Uh, uh, sweet. Then uh, if the neck is not really good, then um, you can use a balloon. So the Professor Moret from Paris, he uh, described this technique. Um, it's, uh, it's basically consists of inflating a balloon adjacent to the neck of the aneurysm and just put the coils in there. So it's as simple as putting the balloon here, getting the catheter in the aneurysm and putting the coils and then deflating the balloon. And they're very soft and very compliant that they conform to the shape of the, of the vessel and, and even herniating to the aneurysm. In real life, it looks like this. This is a very complex uh, middle cerebral artery aneurysm. Could we play the video, please? Chris, can we play the video? It's this one right here. If you click on it, yeah, just click on the arrow, please. Or, or scroll, yeah, or, or yeah, scroll through it. Thank you. So that's the right MCA injection, and that's a, the aneurysm. Those are the, the normal vessels that we need to preserve. And then uh, on the 3D reconstruction, you can see uh, how those branches arise from the neck of the aneurysm. So what to do, then uh, we put a, ba a small balloon, push, uh, protect the branches, push, push the coils, deflate the balloon. Uh, let's play this one, Chris. Thank you. And then you deflate the balloon, rest right here, and then the coils stay in the dome and they don't go back. That's the lateral projection. And then at the end, then, um, yeah, we, we can stop uh, the scrolling now. And then let's scroll through this one, please. Then um, now, uh, at the end of the procedure, then you can see that the aneurysm is protected and all the normal vessels are patent. So that's the, the beauty of the balloon remodeling technique. Thank you. 
Um, then when you cannot use a balloon or is the aneurysm is too complex, then you can use a stent, but it's mostly for um, unruptured aneurysms because remember that they, these need aspirin and Plavix. There's a need for double antiplatelet therapy to prevent thromboembolic complications, meaning a stroke after you put the stent. So if the patient already has a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's usually not a good idea to, to uh, put a stent in. Uh, they come in uh, different sizes and shapes. The, the neuroform was the first one. It's a laser cut stent. This is the Elvis. It's a, um, you know, a, um, a, a braided stent. It's, it, it's, it's actually a little better because you can see the strut, the, the stent better, has more radial force. Um, there's a trade-off, and it's not as trackable as the laser cut stents, and the companies always come up with really funny names for them, and then this is technically called the low-profile visualized intraluminal support system, the Elvis in short, and, but it, it, you cannot help to think about this Elvis when you use it, actually. Um, and they're made of nitinols, so they are MRI compatible. Uh, they promote healing of the aneurysm, and they prevent the coils to herniate to the parent vessel. So it works something like this. You got a huge neck uh, of this uh, carotid ophthalmic aneurysm, and then uh, you put a stent, which are these little struts here. Then you put a tiny catheter inside through the stent, and then you pack it with the coils. And then that way you can achieve these results, which are uh, no residual aneurysm at two years. This is a case um, that is very complex, this paraclinoid aneurysm. We pack it with coils. We're very happy when we brought the patient six months after, then the aneurysm has recanalized. Look at all this dark stuff. It's uh, recanalized aneurysm. The coils have push, been pushed back. That means the coils have compacted. We need to do something else, so we put another stent, more coils, and then at six months, we got a good result. Uh, um, our institution, we have, you know, weird Pathology. This is a basilar fenestration aneurysm. The basilar fenestration is a, um, a congenital variant and, and it's associated with aneurysm. So we have this bilobed aneurysm uh, that is very rare, but we were able to coil some, somewhat, but then we were concerned that those coils could come back to the basilar area and occlude it. So we put a stent and completed the coiling. In uh, uh, three years, there's a durable result with, without evidence of uh, recanalization. Sometimes the anatomy is it's it's crazy. I mean, like this aneurysm is very very has a very wide neck, has incorporation of both uh, posterior cerebral arteries. You can see that on the angiogram. So one stent is not going to do anything to this. So you have to become creative. So you could put two in this T configuration, one on the one side, one on the other side, and then the coils on top, and then. Um, that way you can safely coil the aneurysm without occluding the posterior cerebral arteries. Uh, and this is the six months follow up and two year follow up without evidence of recanalization. Now the Elvis is uh, this stand, which is more visible, though the other ones were the neuroform. And then um, you got situations like this where there's this basilar artery aneurysm that incorporates the posterior cerebral artery and a duplicated um, superior cerebellar, so you have to protect those. So we protect it with this stent, put the coils, and then have a good result. Just with one stent, we didn't have to put another one. Uh, the neuroform atlas is very trackable. It is very good to get to distal places like this anterior cerebral artery aneurysm. Very wide neck. We did this simulation in our, our workstation to see how the stent would uh, look like um, on that parent vessel. And um, then after that, we put the coils. And it, went, it got a good result. Now, 10 years ago, there was a game changer in, in our specialty, the flow divertus. When Olivia was celebrating 10 years, uh, then uh, we. Uh, we had this uh, device coming out, the pipeline embolization device, which is uh, a, a, a stent that has more metal on it, and it's got the capability of curing the aneurysm without using coils. Um, they, they did this trial in Buenos Aires, and uh, very good result. Pretty much um, all the aneurysms at 18 months were cured, about 95%. And they reported uh, a 0% uh, rate of stroke and death. I always joke that in a very Argentinian kind of way, right, like zero, we didn't have any complications. <laughs> uh, then uh, uh, then um, 
it, they only had like three uh, transient uh, cranial nerve paralysis, and, and that's uh, Dr. Lillick published that paper, and, and that changed the history of how we treat aneurysms. This is how it looks like. It's a very flexible stent. This is from their original paper. But then that experience was reproduced with multi-center trials, like the PUFS trial with uh, 106 aneurysms. Kind of the same results regarding effectiveness. Occlusion at one year was pretty good. And a more realistic uh, uh, number for stroke and death, about 5.6%, which is, I, I think it's accurate. I think every time that I'm going to do a procedure on, on an intracranial aneurysm, I tell the patients that they have about 5% risk of having stroke or dying while we're doing it. Um, so um, then uh, the PETA trial also reproduced the same experience. Uh, and this is how it looks like. You've got this complex uh, paraclinoid aneurysm. Then it looks like, looks like a stent, basically. The aneurysm is here. Then we, you put the stent in the vessel. You've got this uh, crescent sign of contrast, which is a stagnation of contrast. The aneurysm doesn't go away at, immediately. Continues filling, but over time it's going to thrombose and it's going to go away. So three months after, we got complete remodeling of the vessel and the aneurysm has disappeared without putting any coils in there. Um, then uh, it, it works even in giant aneurysms like this cavernous one that we were not treating for about five years until this became available. And uh, then again, put the stand, got the crescent sign, and you just can have dramatic results like, like this, where this, this is the pre-AP uh, view of the anterior, uh, internal carotid artery, and this is the post where there's no aneurysm, and the lateral where that big aneurysm has gone away and the vessel is completely remodeled. Um, then uh, more companies started to do flow diverters. That's not only the pipeline, but we got the FRED 17 now. This is a case with uh, uh, a traumatic pseudoaneurysm of the cavernous ICA. We put the thread that is also more visible, kind of easier to deploy, and, and it's equally effective. This is the six-month follow-up without evidence of uh, recanalization of that pseudoaneurysm. We were, uh, a few years ago, with, um, we, we, we used the Fred Jr., which at that, at that time was not FDA approved. We, we had a, an FDA exemption to use it. It was a small stand that we could use even distal to the posterior communicator artery because the other ones were just authorized, uh, FDA approved to use below the posterior communicator artery. This one we could use distally. Uh, at the time was not authorized, so we were the, one of the first places here in the Midwest to use it and the third in the country at Eskenazi Hospital to be able to do this. Uh, with a good result. Later on, when it was FDA approved, we've been using it more often, like in this case, it's a patient with a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, a blister aneurysm, which is this tiny little thing that it's there, it's almost not visible on the, on the 2D images. Uh, we put that uh, stent, which is not really well seen here, uh, but then at three months uh, follow-up, we had the stent that is patent, and that six months follow-up, we can uh, see that there's that small blister aneurysm has disappeared. Let's play this video, Chris, please. Chris, can we play the video? This one. So then, yeah, like right here in the distal ACA, that irregularity has gone away. So uh, that, then you're sure that the aneurysm is gone and it's not gonna bleed again. Okay, thank you. So what's gonna happen recently, uh, uh, more recently where we have, uh, there's, there's been, um, you know, some uh, work on, on, on getting the scores to see which aneurysms, unruptured aneurysms should be treated. We cannot just say that we don't, we're not gonna treat aneurysms that are bigger than seven millimeters. We got new equipment, we got more devices, we got, we're starting doing the radial approach. We're not only doing the femoral artery catheterization now, but we're doing them uh, embolizing aneurysms through the hint. Um, and there are, the devices now have become more bio-intelligent, I guess, with, uh, with, with some coding that they have, and there's new devices that we're gonna show. So those are those scales, basically, they, they take into consideration the, the, the risk of the, the, the patient history, the shape of the aneurysm, the size, the location. You put a number to it, and then you come 
come up with some more arguments towards treatment or not. Same, same thing is this, the FACES score, which uh, it, it evaluates the, the risk of an aneurysm rupturing in five years. So you put, put a number to it, you can do it online, and it gives you what's the, what's the risk of rupturing uh, of that particular aneurysm in five years. So this is the angio suite that we had before. It's a Philips biplane, which is really good. We had it for 10 years, but then now we have the top of the notch technology, which is a, a Siemens Icono that let us do pretty cool stuff at Eskenazi. Like, uh, like, uh, like in this case, where you have this anterior communicator aneurysm that looks like a heart, it's just by lobe, but then when you do the 3D, it's just like actually three lobes. I thought I had to use a stem, but the neck was actually favorable, so we just did coils. And this is the one year follow up that looks really good, no recanalization. And, um, and then um, when, uh, when we do these 3D reconstructions, then now we can do a dual volume reconstruction where the coils are purple like this and the normal vessels are gray like that. So you can, you, you're sure what, where the coils are. So can we play this video please, the one in the middle? So, and then you can turn around in all, all planes and you can make sure that there's no either like a small res residual aneurysm or anything. And, in, and then you can even get even better because you can subtract this whole purple thing and then let, let's play this one, Chris, please. You can subtract that one and then um, the aneurysm just goes away and then you can see the normal anatomy of the vessel. Thank you, Chris. Sometimes uh, even all the gadgets that you have are not going to work, like this giant aneurysm of the middle cerebral artery with all the branches, in, uh, distal branches incorporated. So there's a, another device that looks like a flower. It's called a pulse rider that you can put in the, in the vessel, uh, the stem in the vessel, the petals inside the aneurysm like this, and then fill it with coils. So we, we've used this a couple of times. It's, it's, it's good for the right indications. These are the co uh, coded pi uh, devices, like the pipeline shield that is covered with phosphoryl choline, which is like a lipid that the cell membranes have. So it's trying to trick the organism, the, the body, into thinking that it's part of the body and not establish like a thrombo, uh, thromboembolic reaction, no, not platelet aggregation. You see that there's less platelet aggregation with this device, even without. Uh, having aspirin and plavix on board. So that's the hope that at some point we don't have to use aspirin and plavix anymore. And the FRED X is now kind of going on along the same lines. It's a coded device. But I would say that the game changer in the last two years, uh, it's been the web device. It's a, an intracellular flood disruptor. It's, it's like a little mesh that you put inside the aneurysm and uh, just that device is gonna occlude the aneurysm. Uh, they, um, did this trial, this was again a multi-center trial, pretty good results, uh, pretty good occlusion rates, 84%, pretty good numbers regarding morbidity and mortality. Mortality is a little higher actually, that's about one to two percent, but, but it's still pretty, pretty good. And, and no adverse event after 30 days. So let's play this video, Chris, please, the first one. The, the other one, the, yeah, that one. So that's a, a basilar artery aneurysm that is showing uh, incorporation of both PCAs in, inside the, the aneurysm. Let's play this one, please. And then on the 3D, you can see that in highly high detail, how if you put a coil there, it's gonna herniate, so you will have to use like that T configuration stand. Um, so uh, let's get the next slide, please. The, so then uh, what we did, instead of doing the, the, the uh, T configuration, we, in this patient we have to go, go through a radial approach because she had several surgeries in the groin, so, so there was no way that we could do a femoral approach, so we did a radial approach. And then uh, you get that little sphere, metal web thing in the aneurysm with the catheter, with a small catheter. And this is how it looks like in the lateral projection. It's like a cage that you put inside the aneurysm. It's very soft. It looks like it's like a hard metal thing, but it's not. Still have the potential to perforate a vessel if you're not, especially when you're deploying it, but, but uh, um, you know, for the most part, it's very soft. 
This is the 3D reconstruction showing the, the, aneurys the aneurysm filled with the web device, and this is the six months follow-up showing complete remodeling of that basilar top without filling of the aneurysm. And um, you know, we've done several cases, and this is an MCA aneurysm uh, with the superior division incorporated in the aneurysm. That's the catheter inside the aneurysm, the web device. And then at six weeks, that's the CT follow-up. And then um, at six months, this is the pre and this is the post on 3D, showing that the aneurysm is completely resolved. As there's no filling of the aneurysm. Same uh, result with this ACOM aneurysm. Got the catheter. This is the web device still attached to the catheter. Then you detach it, and the aneurysm is gone. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, people have been talking about flow models for a while, vessel wall imaging, medical treatment. Some people think aspirin is helpful for aneurysms. The theory is that there's an inflammatory reaction in the dome of the aneurysm that prom promotes rupturing at some point. So uh, you can evaluate that with vessel wall imaging, see if the aneurysm is enhanced. Uh, and then it is something that is kind of a little bit of science fiction now is gene, gene therapy to prevent recurrences after endovascular treatment or to even just prevent the aneurysm formation period. So uh, flow models, the, the results have been contradictory. So the theory is that you can build a mathematical model and calculate the shearing forces in the, in the aneurysms and kind of detect which aneurysms are going to rapture. If, but the parameters have been contradictory. Some studies show that a, sh a high shearing force promotes rupturing, and some others show that uh, decreased shearing force uh, will promote rupture. So I, I don't see, I don't hear very often to talk about this anymore. But it's 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 out there. What has been more promising is vessel wall imaging. Uh, this is a, a seven Tesla imaging, and it shows that there's this uh, posterior communicating artery aneurysm that when they put contrast, it enhances, the wall enhances. So the theory is that if the wall enhances, it might be the aneurysm have higher risk of rupturing. But what's more important is if it doesn't enhance, then the negative predictive value is pretty good. So if the aneurysm does not enhance, it means that the aneurysm has a very low risk of rupturing, and you probably should not treat that aneurysm. Still in the works, too. It's not, it's not ready for prime time yet, I don't think, but, but it's going to get there. So in summary, we talk about rupture and unrupture aneurysms. There are two different entities. Um, we talk about the randomized trials, or what was the rationale for, for, for us to do what we do. Uh, we talk about that not all intracranial aneurysms should be treated, and uh, definitely the, 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 uh, the mantra that you, the, an aneurysm is a time bomb in your head is not true. Uh, and uh, that the goal is to treat the aneurysms, all the aneurysms that have rupture and cause subarachnoid hemorrhage, and to treat the ones that will have a higher risk of rupturing. And we went through all the substantial advancement and an understanding of this intracranial disease in the last 20 years uh, with outstanding advances of the devices and the equipment and patient selection. And uh, all of that has uh, now taken us to, to to the last conclusion, which is that uh, endovascular surgery has become the first line of treatment for rupture and unrupture intracranial aneurysms. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for that very comprehensive uh, summary. What, will these cases take about 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tejada. I, I forgot to mention that oh. <laughs> I forgot to mention that Juan Tejada, Dr. Tejada, started our imaging center at Alivio Medical Center, ultrasounds. Then Dr. Useche, who just stepped out, also helped us with that. So we were very fortunate in having such a prominent physician um, helping us with imaging. And a lot of our patients with serious conditions, we refer to him, aneurysms. Uh, vascular malformations, or in cases of spine fractures for vertebroplasty, they're incredible. So we're very fortunate of having you. Next is Dr. Javier Romero. Dr. Javier Romero is one of those students by profession. He is a neurologist. He studied in one of the finest institutions in Colombia. Then came to Harvard University, 
and under the leadership of Dr. Ackerman, became one of the world leaders in carotid artery imaging. He's been working on different modalities of how to assess disease of the carotid artery, which is very important for stroke and other conditions. We're very fortunate of having you. We are always super good friends, except in one situation when the Patriots play the Colts. This rivalry has not been resolved. We'll, we'll keep working on that. Dr. Javier, please come in. Well, we have six rings just to <laughs> rub it in. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I really have to uh, congratulate you all and definitely Dr. Alfredo for this beautiful celebration of an institution that provides uh, health care for immigrants by immigrants. And you're also an immigrant, uh, <laughs> Chris. So. But nevertheless, this is, I know it's a Herculean uh, effort in order to provide care for our community. And I, I please give me, uh, let's give a, a, a round of applause to the first. Okay, without further ado, I would like to speak about non atheromous disease. What I'm trying to do here is to couple what is imaging parameters with uh, clinical aspects. As most of you know here in this room, Atheromas disease is the most common. However, the variations of this disease, the non-atheromas disease, are the ones that probably give us most problems, not only in the diagnostic aspect, but also on the treatment aspect as well. So let's try, start right away with a case. This is a 53-year-old female with migraines, and as you can see in these, um, can the lights go a little bit down? I'm a radiologist, this light could really scare me. <laughs> if you can put the lights a little bit lower, that would be great. Uh, but nevertheless, let me just highlight what we're seeing in this particular patient. Let me, uh, there you go. So this is the carotid artery. This should be a very smooth area and wall of the carotid artery. As you can see, it has little crescents in it and lobulations, which we call beaded appearance. This is something that we, thank you, Chris, I appreciate that. Um, this is an appearance that is abnormal, obviously, for patients and could give some dif difficult uh, symptoms. And I'll go that further on. Thank you so much. On the right hand, a little bit more magnified, you can see that not only it has striations and beady appearance, but it also has a significant stenosis. This is another patient just showing you that has cervical pain, showing you that not only can it have abnormalities of the wall, but it can form what's called carotid artery aneurysms. And here is a 3D model of that particular disease showing that these are little outpouchings of the vessel uh, right at the skull base of the patient. This is an associated uh, case as well, 45-year-old female with TIAs, bilateral carotid bruise, and hypertension. The carotid ultrasound could demonstrate some irregularity of the wall, as you can see in this illustration. This is the angiogram of that of a patient. And here I want to illustrate that not only it could provide the irregularity, but severe stenosis. This really puts this patient at a higher risk of stroke. And this is why we are really uh, interested on this disease. Which is this disease? This is called fibromuscular dysplasia. 90% of these patients are women in middle age. Really interesting is also that they present with significant amount of migraine, they can present with elevated blood pressure, secondary to also compromise of the renal arteries, resulting per se in hypertension. The involvement of the renal artery and the internal carotid artery is equally prevalent. This was uh, uh, demonstrated by the registry uh, done at Cleveland Clinic. And I'll show you a little bit about that trial, which I think is actually the, the cornerstone of this disease. The reason why these patients have this uh, abnormality in the arteries is because there is an elastic destruction of the, of the fibers. And this has to do with a collagen disorder. The classification here, I would like to do a parallel, is histological and angiographic. Um, histological, as you can see, 
it depends ex particularly on the type of collagen that is affected on the, uh, that patient. And as you can see, it could affect the medial, the medial hyperplasia. It could also uh, perimedial fibroplasia and medial hyperplasia on, on different uh, patients. Now, how do we classify through imaging? There's two particular um, consensus. One is the French and Belgium, and the other one from the American Heart Association, and they were a lot simpler, multifocal versus focal. And this is the way that we can detect. Now, one of the things I wanted to highlight in this room is that the more we do CT angiogram on patients, and we've been seeing a lot more younger patients with headaches as, as we're looking for aneurysms, we're looking for we are seeing a higher incidence of this pathology on women. And this is very interesting. Uh, we have to really look into uh, carefully because, as you know, previously we didn't look at the arteries for patients uh, that had headaches or migraines. Or, so um, probably we still have more to say regarding the incidence of this pathology in young women. The associated factor about this muscular fiber muscular dysplasia is that 21 to 51 percent have in, uh, intracranial aneurysms. Again, not only affects the neck, it affects intracranially. So we always look at the vessels in the head as well. Just what, like Dr. Tejada showed you, those are the aneurysms that we may see in this pathology. The plethora of symptoms range from severe chronic migraine headaches, almost invariably patients have migraine. Pulsatiotinnitus, they could also have cervical pain, stroke and TAA is the most feared one, and um, some unilateral neck pain as well. 70% of, uh, 7 of the patients have family members with this diagnosis, and uh, more or less 70 75% have a compromise of the renal arteries and carotid arteries. So, a very high incidence of, of compromise of these vessels. Now, the consensus point is that there are no currently genetic tests to assess this. And this is really where we are limited. The diagnosis is only based on imaging parameters. And really, we don't have, in other words, we don't have a genetic test to make sure that our patients have. So we are confronted with patients who have irregularities of the arteries. Is it FMD, yes or no? Is it going to progress? I think this is a really phenomenal area to start researching. Let's talk about another pathology. This is a, now another group of patients. These are older patients that have also headaches. But this is a 68-year-old male, headache with neck pain, visual disturbances. This is a CT angiogram of the carotid arteries in the coronal view, looking at AP. And you can see here that there is some irregularity at the distal, uh, distal carotid, but nothing really uh, curious about this. However, when we looked at the subclavian arteries, this illustration demonstrates that the patient had also arm pain, progressed to classic claudication and absent pulses, really important to look at the pulses on patients. And you can see that the subclavian arteries demonstrate significant irregularity and stenosis, even all the way up to the axillary artery right distal to the arm. No wonder he was having claudication and arm pain. Now, this is a new technique. Uh, Dr. Tejada touched it um, uh, briefly, which is vessel wall imaging. It's a new technique in, in radiology that has helped us. We, ha we were um, fortunate to have a machine that was capable of looking at this, and what we are looking at is at the wall of the artery. We're looking for patterns of inflammation in the wall. This was never previously been able to do in vivo. So basically, five years ago, uh, a lot of the, this was actually brought from the cardiology uh, literature because the cardiologist had a technique called black blood in order to look at the coronary arteries. We transferred that technology into the brain, and this is the results. In this particular patient, as you can see, the superficial temporal artery right here demonstrates enhancement, and it's an inflammation, and it's called giant cell arteritis. That's exactly what this patient had, and it's really the, one of the most uh, significant uh, advances in, in imaging in trying to look for inflammation of the arteries in the neck or in the brain. There's also other techniques which are called FDG PET, and as you can see here in the upper thoracic, we can see these two rings of enhancement. This is the aortic arch lighting up, showing you the amount of inflammation 
that is happening in this particular patient. This patient has really significant disease and, and uh, you can see that also a little bit higher up in the carotid, those two bright spots. I know that this looks like a broken television in a way. <laughs> But definitely, we do make diagnosis on these images. It should be, and I'll show you how it looks normal so you don't think I'm bluffing. <laughs> the patient had a biopsy proven GCA. He was uh, uh, treated by, with telucosumibib and prednisone. Uh, later, the pet, this is how a pet, normal pet should look like. So there is a difference, right? I, I hope you realize that one. <laughs> Excellent. We can also make the diagnosis with ultrasound. And this is also a, a very nice tool uh, with ultrasound. It really requires a, a really good technician to look into these arteries. And you can see that there's a halo of a dark rim around the lumen. The lumen is the, the red spot or the flow. And around it, you see the inflammation. And this is really critical because a lot of our surgeons are actually uh, guide their biopsy based on this particular abnormality. These are some of the techniques that we use to diagnose this, this pathology. As you can see, uh, ultrasound has a sensitivity of 87%, a specificity of 96. The MRI uh, shows a sensitivity of 88, a specificity of 97%. So I think we have really good tools in order to detect the disease. The problem really with these diseases, I have to say, is the clinical diagnosis. Patients going with vague symptoms, a little bit of headache, um, a little bit of myalgia, it is very tough. So um, although here it looks very nice, but I have to say it's really challenging for, our, for you, Chris, and for all the people who are looking at these patients every day. I mean, this is really a tough diagnosis. Here is the body pet, and as you can see, the arteries actually should not be showing up. We do see the arteries are lighting up, which looks like uh, intermediate gray. And that is just because it's uptake of, uh, of, of the FDG, which is inflammation of the arteries per se. Okay, so these are the vessels, sorry, these are the vessels that are compromised on patients with giant cell arteritis, the carotid artery, the subclavian artery, the aortic arch, and also the iliac and renal arteries. This is another pathology. This is a 34-year-old patient with aphasia. Here we have a, a diffusion image weighted uh, that really detects acute stroke. And you can see this little tiny dot right in the center of the centrum semiovale, and that is a small stroke. He also has in flare what we call the late of transit. This is a map that we do with its brain perfusion. And what only this is telling you is that the brain, the, sorry, the flow is arriving a little bit delayed, almost four microseconds com uh, delayed compared to the contralateral side. It may seem very, uh, very uh, subtle, the difference, but this really has significant repercussions for brain function. Here, what happened, why does this patient have a delayed transit of a blood flow to one hemisphere? He has a narrowing of the vessel, right distal of that uh, carotid artery. Normal right vertebral, I just want to show you this vertebral artery that shows that it's exact, perfectly normal. But I'm going to take, keep that in your mind. That vertebral artery is normal. The patient came back four months after therapy. We were treating this patient, and just like any atheromatous disease, we said, okay, this is normal, and let's give him some statins, and which we, what we do normally. However, four months after treatment, he comes back, look at that right vertebral artery that was completely normal. Now has shows significant narrowing, multi-segmental within the uh, right vertebral artery. So what is this? The patient had headaches. Young patient, 37 year old, we were puzzled. In fact, this is a case in the New England Journal of Medicine in the case reports that we published because we didn't know what, 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 is, what was it exactly. We really struggled with this case and I have to be sincere uh, that this case uh, really uh, bounced around a year and a half in terms without a diagnosis. So I think we should learn from some of our mistakes and this is one of them. We can again see that the patient uh, also had uh, the internal carotid narrowing really distal on the contralateral side. We did genetic testing and it turned out that this patient had what's called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome type four. Now the curious part of this is that we were treating him for a year and a half, thousands of dollars in investment uh, and trying to get to the, the diagnosis and actually the tests that uh, make this diagnosis cost only $640. And uh, we now know what this patient had because 
She clinically, the patient did not have any stigmata of Ernest Danlos, which is our tall patients uh, with morphinoid, a little bit of the, the fingers are a little bit long. And yeah, this patient only had short stature and translucent skin. So again, uh, although the, gen the genetics give us really significant, the phenotype sometimes confuses us. If they don't fit perfectly. That's uh, something that we have to, I guess, uh, more importantly in here is just the genetic testing could help us significantly. What's the biggest problem of patient with endodontitis is actually arterial rupture. In this particular uh, casuistics from Mayo Clinic, uh, published in New England Journal, shows that of their uh, 131 cases, uh, a, a, a large amount of males, 62, had arterial rupture, and, um, and that's a pretty good number. Let's change a little bit of case. This is a companion case, a, a disease that's very similar, and this is a carotid ultrasound showing you that the carotid has a big little septum in the middle. And this patient had a syncope, and we were quite uh, puzzled about this. Carotid ultrasound, these are really high waveforms. The brain has, has a very significant low resistance. It is built that way in order to provide significant flow to the brain. It consumes significant, right now, where you're, although you're sitting there, I hope that it's consuming almost 20% of your blood flow. <laughs> now, that is why it's a low resistant system. But what we're seeing here is a spike, which is called a high resistant waveform. Now, why is that? The problem is that this patient has what's called a dissection of the artery. And that artery, that hema, there's a hematoma right between two walls of the artery. And that acts like a stiff wall. And that's why you have this high resistance. What does that happen? That your brain is not going to get the flow that requires for that functioning and looking into this lecture. Good. Let me show you how this looks in CT angiogram. This is our, actually the aortic arch of this patient that has a Marfan syndrome. This is FBN1 gene mutation. This is the hematoma. And the bright line here is the flow. So you can see how poor flow is this patient having to his brain, kidneys, and other systems. Here, the actual images show you that the carotid shows a dissection. This patient did have classic marfanoid uh, symptoms and phenotypes, so this was a, a more easy diagnosis. Next case, this is a 52-year-old patient in transit episode, left hand numbness and headache, previous stent placement, sedimentation rate elevated, carotid ultrasound shows irregularity of the vessel wall, this little rippling effect or waveform effect, and very high velocities in the common carotid artery. The velocity of the common carotid artery is approximately 80 to 120. This patient had 343. In fact, the tech comes into my office and said, Doc, I have a patient who her brain is gonna blow up because the velocity is so high, but I can't find the lesion. So let's, let's take a look what's going on. And here we see a little bit of these, it's almost like little mouse bites right at the wall. This is the MRA, and it shows that this patient not only had an occlusion of many vessels, but narrowing. Look at this carotid, common carotid artery. It looks like very thin in the bottom, then it goes thicker, and then it goes really thin. Here it all actually disappears on the contralateral side. So this patient had multiple occlusions, and the subclavians also have narrowing. And you can see how uh, a magnified view looking at that carotid artery looks narrow in the lumen. This is Takayasu arthritis. This is a chronic inflammation of the arteries in women uh, in the second and fourth decade. It's an autoimmune disease uh, affecting the aorta, uh, primarily then renal and carotid. Uh, 60 percent of the patients only show malaise, fever, malaise, sorry, fever and arthritis. This is a case of, this is something that you may see in your office more commonly. It's called keratodynia. It's a pain right here. It, patients actually can almost point out to that particular aspect of the, of the neck where it has significant pain. You can see that the ultrasound shows some low signal. You see the bright signal here is actually fat and around it is quite dark. The fat should go really all the way up to the uh, borders of the lumen. Here we see that there's some inflammation around that artery. MRI is actually nice to see because you can see that there's 
all this enhancement of the artery, and it's an inflammation, very focalized local inflammation called keratodynia. I actually think that we don't need images for this. <laughs> this is a diagnosis that most people can make in their office, and basically it's only when you have risk factors of dissection and other things or trauma to the neck that maybe we need these, all these images. I'm only showing it just for the sake of uh, academic interest, but however, this is actually a diagnosis, and with anti-inflammatory medications, this actually improves uh, very well. Okay, so here, just to resume, at least the levels of some of this disease, spontaneous dissection occurs right at the skull base, higher up in the neck. As I showed you, fibromuscular dysplasia also affects the higher part, actually this, this distal aspect of the neck. Then traumatic dissection and atheromatous disease happens at the bifurcation, a little bit lower uh, within the neck of the carotid artery. And Takayasu arthritis in giant cells actually affects the more proximal aspect right at the origin of the vessels in the aortic arch. Good, so let's, um, this last patient uh, I want to show because this is an experience that I'm now, uh, this is a new, uh, program that we have at MGH, and it's the Vessel Wall Imaging Program. Uh, Dr. Tejada showed you a few cases. Right now we have more than 650 patients scanned with this technique looking for inflammation in the brain. And I have to say that uh, we have uh, had uh, fortunately success with this patient. I'll show you our first case and what happened to him. This was a 54-year-old male, three days of worsening headaches, hypertension emergency, and a right thalamic hemorrhage. His blood pressure was 200 over 100. And right away you would say, well, this is a classic um, hypertensive hemorrhage. We see that every day in every clinic in this nation. This is the imaging. We see the small hemorrhagic within the thalamus. We see the, this is susceptibility weight image showing you that small hemorrhage right in that area. And we see a patient with white matter changes. This is our every day. And that's exactly what we thought at that time, that this was just a hypertensive hemorrhage. Next case, right? Now, well, let's wait. He also had these punctate foci of infarction, not only hemorrhage, but at the same time he had infarction. That really turned us a little bit down. We said, well, probably something else, but actually we sent him home with uh, medications to uh, control his blood pressure and statins to see if he improved. Notably, his arteries, if you look at them right now, they're perfectly normal. MCAs look normal, his carotids are normal, his internal carotids, everything is normal. So what's happening to this patient? The patient came back almost, uh, I think it was two, uh, two to one month later with new strokes. Now the stroke within the basal ganglia, periatrial white matter, and these are territories of the brain that are small, tiny vessels, perforating vessels that go. These are not big arteries. So probably that's why his big vessels were normal. It's actually the small vessels that are, were involved. And this started catching our attention. However, I told the neurologist, let's do this new technique that's called vessel wall imaging. And the neurologists are scratching their head. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and we did it, and I showed them uh, and here it illustrates here that there is enhancement. I hope you can appreciate this. Right at the tip of the basilar, there's this enhancement. I'll show you some other images of the tip of the basilar artery. Really, the wall of the artery is enhancing. This should not enhance at all. The, the vessel wall should be black. We look at other vessels and you start seeing this subtle enhancement of arteries all over the brain. This is probably the most uh, interesting one. This is the vertebral basilar junction, and you see enhancement of both arteries right where that arrow is, and that is abnormal. Here's a curvy format of the basilar artery. You can see that the walls everywhere, they're enhancing. So we said, you know, uh, I Dr. Vena, you probably know him, uh, he's a stroke neurologist. This looks like vasculitis. And he said, okay. I'm gonna just give him more antihypertensive medication, send him, and I don't blame him. This was the first case we did. He shouldn't believe me. He should not believe me at that point. However, this was our first case, and when he came back, uh, he came back later, and he had another stroke almost a month later, 
And that's where Dr. Venna said, okay, let's do a brain biopsy. And it turned out to be primary CNS vasculitis, a vasculitis. He started a salumadrol, prednisone, and this patient has been asymptomatic for the six years on, on this treatment after almost two years of, of, of multiple strokes. Now, after this case, every neurologist wanted vessel wall imaging, and they they're really believe in this technique, and they're really uh, very enthusiastic at the point that I can't get a biopsy to confirm my findings now of my trial. So I'm in a really crux here of trying to get data. But nevertheless, I think it has helped a significant amount of patients that before was very hard to diagnose their vasculitis. So um, just here, this cartoon is to illustrate what do we see in, in vessel wall imaging. And a normal case is just the artery without enhancement. If you have vasculitis, what you have is thickening of the wall and also enhancement of the wall. That's how we diagnose a vasculitis. Dissection, as you know, it's an extra eccentric lumen with enhancement. A, a, a dissection results in this really very, very uh, strong enhancement of it. This is an inflammatory process. You have a hematoma within the vessel producing this really uh, strong enhancement. Moya Moya, I have mixed feelings about our, our, help, our, our really um, how useful it is to diagnose this because sometimes it's enhancing and sometimes it's just burnout, I think, inflammation, so I don't know exactly I couldn't say which, if this really works for this disease, although papers out there do mention that it is helpful. And atheromonas disease is the most interesting, at least to me, because it is a public health issue, and it, although more prevalent in Asian and African American populations that have intracranial atheromonas disease, Caucasian populations have more carotid disease, so it is a very important factor in trying to diagnose them. Some can be eccentric, preservation of the lumen, as you saw, our, our patient, one of our patients had normal vessels, but had inflammation of their arteries. So this is really important for our diagnosis. And so the applications are multiple inflammatory disease. I think vasculitis may be number one. If you have a patient with this, uh, you're questioning this, this is a very good technique. I, my lab is researching an atheroma disease, particularly those patients that have pre-stenotic disease, I think it precedes when, it, before it even narrows the vessel, you can see inflammation of the arteries. We've seen patients, even from 30 years old, starting to have plaques in the brain. Probably a lot of McDonald's, but really we have to, but we really have to, uh, or chicharrón, <laughs> I love it too, <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's very important. And I always would like to uh, uh, say thank you to my mentors. Dr. Simila Fisher was in our hospital and was the mentor of my mentor, who is, uh, as uh, Alfredo mentioned, Dr. Ackerman, who's a pioneer in PET studies, Gil Gonzalez, a pioneer in spectroscopy, and Mike Lev, a pioneer in stroke imaging. So I really thank you very much for your attention. And again, congratulations, Alfredo. Thank you very much. Once again, it, uh Excuse me. Once again, it makes us realize that one of the main reasons to consult the neurologist is the MRI's broke. <laughs> um, remember, we're going to take a break after this next talk. Um, if you haven't, a lot of people came in late. If you haven't registered, please register. You'll get five CME credits for this, for this event. Uh, during the break, take time. Uh, in the next room over, uh, there are refreshments and there are the booths. Spend some time with the booths. Spend some time talking with the people. They have uh, generously sponsored our event and allowed us to do this. So um, um, give, a, give them some of your time. Thank you very much. Hello. Javier, it's nice to see that picture. Four giants of vascular neurology there, yeah. really. Really good, excellent talk. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Francisco Eraso. Where is Dr. Francisco? Oh, Dr. Francisco Eraso is a DDS. He studied in Colombia in Javeriana University, then came to Indiana University and has become an expert in orthodontics, in imaging of the oral and maxillofacial areas. 
And um, he's this incredible person who can see a patient with general dentistry issues, or he can devise a metaverse type of education and systems in cutting edge technology to improve the experience of the patients. Um, Dr. Arasso will make you smile. He'll make you smile beautifully and often. So Dr. Arasso, please come. And we're very, very grateful. He's also the owner of Alivio Dental. Good morning. How are you? How's everything with everybody? Thanks for coming today. And uh, my presentation is about the impact of Alivio Dental in our community. And um, I've been thinking about a story that I was going to tell you before I start my presentation. And I came with this story. In 9-11, when the tragedy happened, the firefighters arrived to the station and the chief said, what happened with Bobby? Okay? I said, no, Bobby, is, 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 I think he's is lost there. So this guy said, don't worry, I'm going to rescue him. So he went and rescued him. He said, don't go, because I think he's dead already. You know, all of this tragedy, I think he's dead. So he said, don't worry, I'm going to go and rescue him. So he went and rescued him. And of course, he arrived two hours later with Bobby in his hands. And the chief said, I told you, he was dead. He said, no, he was waiting for me. Was well, the last thing that he said is, I was waiting for you. The parallel with this story is that people look and leave you for that. They know that we are going to take care of them. The experience with COVID show us that, okay? These guys deliver good care to the patients. They came to leave you first to receive good care. But not only that, they come to leave you for dental care, for a good massage, okay, for medicine, and for everything that we can give you. Because the people are waiting for us to treat them. Okay? So the new reality in dentistry today is that we are going to treat the people globally. Generally, we're going to see everything. In dentistry, or at least in Alivio, we are just not looking for teeth. We are not filling holes. We are not cleaning teeth. We are not uh, doing simple things. We are doing amazing things. Orthodontics and dental. I'm an orthodontist. I'm an oral and maxillofacial radiologist. And orthodontics and dentistry influence not only the facial or dental, but also the facial and the skeletal structures. And when you go to our office, you're going to receive that. You're going to receive a, a global overview of your problem. Because the teeth are not alone in your mouth. They're connected to everything. Okay, muscles, the skeletal structures, and everything. So we will influence everything. Trust me. When you go to our office, I, I'm not only going to see your teeth. I'm also going to look for your soul. And this picture, unfortunately, this doesn't have a sound. If you can play this video, I love to see this reaction of people, how we change people's lives. OK, can you play this video, please? Unfortunately, it doesn't have a sound. You can click, click play. No, go back. <laughs> Sometimes I, I love to have my own computer, but uh, could you go back to the previous slide, please? Now you can click play there. Just click the play. This is the reaction that we have in our patients. We change people's lives, okay? One is my, I remember my mom always dreamed to be a dentist, okay? And, and the reason why I think she wants to be a dentist is because she loves to see people smile like she did, okay? The best results in dentistry is start with an adequate and complete diagnosis. And I apply all of my knowledge in oral maxillofacial radiology 
to supplement all of the clinical care that we are going to give our patients. In Alivio, the routine is this. We are going to see the new patient arrive to our clinic. We will connect to the patient through the clinical examination. Then we will create an overview of all of the maxillofacial complex with records, photographic images, radiologic uh, exams, and intraoral scans. By the way, everything is digital. Then we will have a treatment conference with the patient. We will present to the patient all of the information and we propose a treatment, and then we start a treatment either with braces, aligners, or any dental care. The digital information, <laughs> do you want me to use my computer? Or? I'm one of those guys that <laughs> I always like a think like my presentation is going to go well, but I'm, I'm sorry for the difficulties. Go ahead and double click in the Alivio seminar. It's, a, it's a, an excellent question. Those are the general issues, you know, the issues of dental hygiene, the issues of periodontal problems, inflammation, and decay. Those are the general issues, but what we will do is we'll take care of those basic needs and we will lead you or guide you to them to the growth and development. Because, it's, again, we are not only um, do, do fillings, but we will try to manipulate growth and, and provide them the best smile. But yeah, it's a very good question, thank you. So we have a, a complete digital environment in our practice. All of the records are digital. And with that, we create something that is called a diagnostic key. We are not only see the dentition, but we'll see vital surrounding structures such as the airway and TMJs. Of course, we don't have such a amazing information that you have with MRI and, and CT scans, but believe it or not, we are now using a dental CT and I remember in our first presentation 10 years ago for the anniversary, we, I was showing them the advances of three-dimensional imaging in dentistry. So we are going to have an overview of the maxillofacial complex, and we are going to create unbelievable images that are going to show us the problem in different ways. We are going to segment the anatomy, we are going to have pictures, we are going to have x-rays, panoramic for example, we see a lot of impactions. We have lateral and posterior anterior views and the articular the temporal mandibular joint. So you see, you see the airways, the dentition, and the temporal mandibular joint. Then we will explore the problem visually, clinically first. The only thing that we see in our clinical examination are the crowns and the gums, but literally you have something behind that. Then we have uh, an x-ray that shows us a different problem impactions, what is going to happen if we make decisions about pulling teeth, what happens if we are moving the teeth forward. So we are going to have an overview, we are going to see important structures such as the airways because I think it's more important for the patient to breathe rather than to have straight teeth. So we are going to <laughs> manipulate that as well. So we are going to measure and going to quantify the problem if you have an airway problem. For example, this is a quantification of volumetric rendering of the airway spaces. The airway spaces has certain dimensions, okay, for us to breathe, to, to, to literally take the oxygen that we produce in the lung to the brain. So something is happening right here. There is some kind of up level of obstruction. It's produced by the tonsils. So we are going to have an image of the tonsils and adenoids. So you see, we are not concentrating first in filling teeth. We are seeing a problem more in detail. And here is a problem about breathing. The patient has sleep apnea. A patient that is growing, that cannot breathe is a big problem in growth and development. 
So we are going to address that maybe first, not necessarily by us, but some of the physicians that we have in our clinic. The temporal mandibular joint is a structure that will give you the stability for the occlusion and for the balance of our bite, okay? So we have to rule out any pathology in the temporal mandibular joint. We have to make sure that the position of the temporal mandibular joint is in a stable place. So here, for example, you see that the condyle is positioned a little more posterior. This is the external auditory meatus. This is the glenoid fossa, articular eminence. And the condyle has to be positioned concentrically. If the TMJ or the condyle is positioned posterior, when we bring that condyle forward, the bite is going to change as well. So the bite is going to have certain or more issues. So we have to address those problems first. Then we have to address the big problem, the impaction of the teeth. So what are we going to do to bring this maxillary canine, the left side, down? Are we going to pull teeth? Is this pathology? You see there is a little hypodensity or radiolucency surrounding the crown of this impacted canine. Is that real pathology? Is that important that we address that first before we start any treatment? So you see we are not just filling teeth. We're doing a lot of stuff before, so this is the clinical examination. And then we produce images that will guide our referring oral surgeons to have a surgical approach if we need it. So our input in diagnosis and treatment plan is extremely important if we have a global view of the maxillofacial complex. Then we have to take the literature, okay? And we have to see that there is appliances that we use in dentistry that will influence not only the soft tissue, because we are going to try to have a more pleasant tissue, but also to correct the bite. And how these appliances will also influence adjacent structures such as the airways and TMG. This appliance is called the motion appliance that I use literally 100% in my patients. We first correct the bite, correct? When we do that, we achieve facial harmony. You're going to see that the, the lips will follow the new position of the teeth. So now you have more pleasant smile of soft tissue. Then because of the mandible is positioned anteriorly, you're going to increase the airway spaces, okay? Once you rotate the mandible forward, also the position of the condyle, which was not stable, is going to be repositioned and positioned position more concentrically and more stable, okay? So I have to prove that. So it's nice to see videos, it's nice to see articles, but how I'm going to prove it in my patients with records, comparing before and after results. So then when we have the results, we are going to close the spaces with aligners. A lot of our patients here, we have patients here that are using aligners. And then we have the final results. We have functional and aesthetic results. Great. So how am I going to move this into our clinic? We have to visualize the end before we start any treatment. Three-dimensional imaging will allow us to do that. Will allow us to see the results before we start. So some of the patients will say, okay, let me show you how your teeth are going to look after we finish with the treatment, before we start. So we're going to visualize the end before we start. Also, we have to use the literature to see how we influence a structure such as the, the airways. The airways will grow 10 millimeters square per year. So the, the dimension, the most constricted area of the airways for a five-year-old should be 50 millimeters square. For a 10-year-old should be 100 millimeters square, okay? So we, an article says that the appliance that I'm going to use will increase the airway spaces almost 35%. But I said, you know, 35% of 10 millimeters is nothing. So if I only increase 3.5 millimeters in the airway spaces, that is nothing. I want to maximize the airway spaces. So this appliance that I'm using is maximizing the airway spaces because I'm changing the position of the mandible. I'm going to increase the airway space. I'm going to have a stability of the temporal mandibular joint. And I'm going to have a beautiful smile. 
So let's go ahead and use it in a patient. This is Alejandro. This is Alejandro. is, uh, is the son of uh, my multimedia guy, the guy who helps me in all of the things in Instagram and my homepage and everything. And I treat all of the family. I treat Alejandro was one of the successes that I have. Deep bite. You see that the, the bite is 100%. The maxillary incisors cover almost 100% of the lower incisors. Severe crowding, something that is called an overbite. And look at the position of the canine. Remember that video that said, I'm, I'm going to move the, the canine back. I have to move this tooth right here, and all of these teeth have to settle in the right place. Okay? How can I do that? Before, the way that I did it is, let's go ahead and put in braces, and let's pray. And pray because I was <laughs> relying, <laughs> you like that? I, I was relying on the patient to use the elastics or the rubber bands. If the patient, think about this, we align the teeth, great, anybody can align teeth, okay? Then we're going to reposition the mandible almost at the end of the treatment, and it's, it's already two years in treatment. And then if the patient is not wearing rubber bands because it's, it's two years, it's so tired of the treatment, we're going to finish the treatment early because the poor patient compliance. Treatment failure, huh? Because no good occlusion is no good occlusion, okay? No settling, no right place. We are not going to influence their airway spaces. We're not going to position the TMJ in the right place, and no, we're not going to have a good occlusion. But we have a straight teeth. And 10 years later, the patient is going to come with the same smile, crooked, with headaches, with problems in the TMJ, and we didn't do anything. We didn't change people's lives. Remember the video at the beginning? The patient is smiled so much, and I live for those moments, that the patient is smiled after I finish the treatment, because I change people's lives. So let's see the three-dimensional imaging. K9 is positioned anteriorly. We have to move the K9 right here. Look at the molar, has to bite right here. This is a picture, remember, we have to document before and after. If not, you are not going to be able to measure success. The, 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 the temporal mandibular joint is here. This is the external determinators, glenoid fossa. Look at the condyle, it's positioned posterior, okay? I have to rotate the mandible and move the condyle forward, okay? And the airways are not a problem for Alejandro. Alejandro doesn't have an airway problem. However, if I maximize the airway spaces, what is going to happen? He is going to have more oxygen, and he is going to grow much better. More oxygen into the brain is, is beneficial for, for any patient. So I use the appliance. The appliance, without any braces, open the bite, correct some of the crowding without any braces in three months. Alejandro was excellent patient. In three months, we correct the bite. Okay, look at the canine is in the right place. The canine is in the right place. We developed some spaces at the beginning. Those spaces are money in the bank at the end of the day. So the people are like, oh, but I'm going to have spaces. Don't worry. We're going to, don't worry, Bobby. We're going to close those spaces, okay? And then we finish the treatment in less than a year and a half. In 14, 15 months, we finish the treatment rather than two, three years, okay? Because of the patient's compliance, because of the appliance that we use. And we have straight teeth, but I don't care about the straight teeth. I care about the influence on the maxillofacial structures. Look at the airway spaces. This is a PVC tube, or like this is a huge tube. <laughs> the patient can breathe very good there. But we have to measure the airway spaces, the most constricted area, was 300 millimeters a square at the beginning of the treatment. We almost double the airway spaces by rotating the mandible forward and positioning the mandible in the right place. The condyle was positioned posteriorly. Look at how concentric is the mandible position. And in addition to that, I have a straight teeth and I have a stable occlusion. So the new reality in dentistry, which was the title of my presentation, but this is what we're doing in Alivio Dental Clinic, 
is we are treating the patient globally. We are not just treating teeth, okay? So we don't have patients. We don't create patients for the, for the ability to have more money, okay? Greed creates stories. Luis, I know people by name. I love people's smiles. Jennifer, everything is, of course I'm showing you the smile, but I have a document, all of the changes that we have in the surrounding structures. Emily, you look awesome. These are pictures from Instagram, by the way. You can follow me in Eraso <laughs> Orthodontics. <laughs> Gabrielle is amazing. Look at, look at how beautiful is that smile. So dentistry is about changing lives, it's changing lives. It's not about just aligning teeth and, and again, doing, creating some holes and filling them. Sienna is a family for some of the patients here. We see patients from any race, any income, anything that you can imagine in our practice because people come to us for service. The people don't come to us because uh, we are just the dentists that they have in the book of insurance. The people look for us. Leslie, crazy Leslie. Again, all of these are stories. Alejandro, of course. Juan Jose. All the people from Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico in that picture. Florinda, it's, it's an amazing story of Florinda. Was, maybe we can talk about Florinda at the end of the treatment. Uh, Michelle, is the wife of one of my best friends. And of course, I can go on and on and on. So again, thank you for coming today. I know, let me tell you something about Alfredo Lopez, okay? He is first my friend. I have a deep admiration for him. He is my mentor in many things in life. He shows me that with a smile, like my mom, you can open many doors, you know? His kindness and his ethics to provide the service in Alivio are like anybody else. He reminds me, my parents, my, my father was a physician, and they always smile to people. They always have a good answer, okay? And that's what you are going to find in Alivio Medical Center. Congratulations for your anniversary, and let me tell you something. We are going to, we're going to be celebrating 50 years very soon. Okay, I love you, Alfredo. Congratulations. Terrific, we're gonna take a break now. Um, we're gonna reconvene at 11.05, 11.05 back here. Uh, we're 15 minutes behind, which is a home run for me uh, with this crew, so we're, do we're doing great. Uh, please enjoy the refreshments in the ballroom next door. Have some coffee, visit the exhibitors. Thank you for your attendance. I'll see you back at 11.05, 11.05.
OK. A couple more minutes before we get started for the afternoon or for the second morning session.
All right, we're going to get started for this next uh, morning session. Is Alex Garrido in the house? There he is. I see him. Okay. It's with great pleasure I get to introduce my new friend from Tennessee, Alex Garrido. I know his family very well. I know his father and his sisters and brothers. They come from Columbia. They're great people. He is in charge of family medicine and geriatric medicine down in Tennessee. Welcome, Alex Garrido. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, Alfredo is not here. I was going to start by saying something for him, but he's not here yet. Oh, there you go. Here he is. <laughs> so I am one of those uh, Latino family medicine graduates from IU that left Indiana. And I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> but I always, I always say that, that in Indianapolis is my hometown in the US because it, it gave me the opportunity to, to, to be who I am professionally. Um, I currently live in Tennessee uh, after a long run in uh, southern Illinois, Carbondale, Illinois, where I did most of, most of my practice until now after graduating from fellowship. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, what I do, who I am, and uh, what I think that could be for the future in geriatrics in the United States. I am not sure if I, OK, there you go. Nothing to disclose. So I did a medical school in Universidad del Norte in Barranquilla, Colombia. I graduated in 1998. Then, uh, long story, but I end, ended up doing, finishing up residency in Indianapolis in 2011. Uh, my inception into the Alivio family was about 2007. Uh, and little we, we knew that we were going to share family, you know, <laughs> at that point. Uh, that's 15 years ago, believe it or not. That's how long we have kind of known each other. Um, fellowship then in 2012, also Indiana University. And most recently, I just graduated from an MBA. I, I thought that I was not going back to school because, you know, I don't know why I did it. I think it was pandemic related. I had too much time in my hands, and I decided to just go back to school. Uh, I wouldn't do it again, but I, I'm glad I did. <laughs> Um, uh, my, my long run, like I, like I said, in, uh, from 2012 to 2021, I lived in, in, in Southern Illinois, Carbondale. There I had the opportunity to, to get a lot of experience in, in what I knew and, and until then, which is uh, family medicine and geriatrics. Most of my focus has been in, in, in geriatric medicine. I did do some family medicine uh, in Carbondale, but right now uh, I joined Blonde Senior Care Partners, which is a, a uh, uh, this is the only geriatric dedicated group east of Nashville in the state of Tennessee. So it covers half of the state. We do get patients from uh, even uh, Georgia, North Carolina, and Kentucky because it's in the, in the eastern side of Tennessee in, in the Knoxville area. So flags and symbols that defines Alice Garrido, there you go, you have them all. We have, uh, we have li lived in four different states in the United States, and there is a lot of flags that represent who I am. But uh, also, there is, some, there, is some, there is the Javeriana connection there that I was going to talk about. Uh, and it's uh, before medicine, I did two years of, of uh, the equivalent of journalism uh, in Javeriana University, which is proudly uh, uh, Alfredo's university where he went to school in Colombia. Uh, but I, I, when I was doing the, 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 the slides, I was like, well, what defines a human is not the symbols he or she chooses to identify with, but instead how and with whom he or she spends time with and experience with. And I just created that. So I, you know, I love it. So I put, I put the pictures of the things that I, of the, of the things that, that we enjoy doing, which is, of course, everybody that knows us well knows that we love wine and family and friends and food and traveling. So geriatric medicine is the branch of medicine that specializes in the older adult, okay? 65 years of older, 
are, are patients that we can see uh, and as, as, as geriatric medicine specialists. And it's not uh, the same as internal medicine or family medicine because as we grow older, the physiology and how the, how the human body interacts with medications and, and even diseases are different. So it, it, it requires special training, although a, a family practitioner or an internal medicine physician can also do some geriatrics. Uh, it requires a special, special training because things are a little bit different. And uh, not all adults older than 65 meet geriatric criteria just because of the mere fact of being 65 or older. Uh, you can be younger than 65 and, and meet geriatric criteria if you meet one of the geriatric syndromes, which I will touch base with them a little bit in a, in a, a different slide. So we do see patients, let's say a 55, a 50, a 40 something year old person that let's say has cerebral palsy and has geriatric syndromes because of that, or a person that had a stroke and, and developed vascular dementia, which is a specific type of dementia because of that, we can, we can treat those patients. And not everybody that meets geriatric criteria needs to see a geriatrician, but it's com it comes handy if we do uh, primary care geriatrics because that means that you don't have to look for another person to treat your memory loss. You don't have to look for a neurologist, I'm sorry, to treat, to treat dementia. Uh, if you have a geriatrician that is, that is helping you in, in your treatment. So a little bit about the population in the US. Um, the, the graphic on the left side is the United States in 1980 and the projected 2025 on the right side. So if you know a little bit about how the, how the population bells uh, 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 are seen, a younger country or a younger population is on the left side, and that was the United States in, two, in 1980. In, in 2025, it's showing a mature society where more and more people are, are getting to older age and, and, and people are controlling how many kids they have, right? That has been happening for decades now in the US, but it's more apparent right now. And, and it's gonna be more apparent in a few years from there. And, but, but what comes with it is that I'm gonna try to point this out. This area here, in, uh, these people is no longer with us, right? Because they, they grew up, they grew to be older than 100, and, and most of them died, and maybe there is one or two still alive today, but the people that were in their, in their 20s and 30s here are the people that are now in their 70s and 80s and beyond here. So as this segment of the population here goes up, is now right here, and, and if we keep going, this segment of the population here, which are the millennials, are gonna be eventually getting into older age, so this will look more like a column, unless as a kind of a Middle Eastern building, if you see it that way, and here it was more like a pyramid. So as we change, as the, as the population changes, what we'll see is that this big chunk of the population here is bigger now than it used to be. This is the geriatric age population, 65 or older. And this is the projection uh, by year 2025 of the population of the United States. A little bit more in the next slide, I think. So geriatrician is a physician that having completed, I talk about it already, uh, internal medicine or family medicine chooses to train for one or to seven additional years in geriatric medicine. You don't have to do seven years, you can do one, which is what I did. I did a year of clinical uh, uh, geriatric training in IU. Uh, IU Geriatrics is one of, actually the, one of the main uh, uh, um, production of geriat geriatricians in the United States happened here uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, until then, I think it has changed a little bit more, a little bit now, but there was a lot of research also going on about geriatrics in the U.S., and we have the Registrants Institute here as well that do a lot of uh, research in, in, in dementia and, and, and related topics, which has directly to do with geriatrics. Um, so a gerontologist, I always like to talk about this, a geriatrician is different than two other gerontologists because a geriatrician is a physician 
that does the training and, and practice geriatrics. And a gerontologist is a person that is an expert in geriatric medicine or related, but is not a physician. So a, a nurse practitioner, for example, that works in geriatrics will be a gerontologist. A physical therapist or a, or a, or a, or a, a nutritionist or can, is a gerontologist who specializes in geriatrics, but are not a geriatrician. I think about pediatrician, geriatrician is the other end of the spectrum in, 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 in life. So I, I, I say this because it's true. The reason, the reason, one of the reasons that physicians do not go into geriatric medicine is because in general primary care don't get paid very well. Okay? But that can be that can be a twisted true because that's not necessarily how it goes. You can you can be successful financially doing primary care, and I think you know Alivio Medical Center is one of is one of those examples. You're doing a, 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 a work for the community that is needed, and 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 and, is, and, and you do it in such a way that it's a smart uh, uh, move financially, but it's also providing a service to the community at the same time, which is the main reason we're all physicians, right? So we uh, traditionally work more hours and, and complex, work with more complex patients, and, and we have less uh, perks. Uh, compared to other physicians. So less and less people go into geriatrics, and there is a fellowship train, fellowship uh, places that are closing in the, throughout the United States for an aging population. So think about this. Put together the, 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 the population analysis that we just did with how many geriatricians should we have for uh, 360 million Americans, okay? And how many do we have right now? How many more do we need as the last baby boomer become of, ger of, of geriatric age, right? So, just to put things in perspective, in 2000, there, was, there were 40 million people older than 65 in the United States. So that's 12.4% of the population. 2018, there were 52 million. That's 16% uh, of the population. Notice that it's, go it's going up. And by year 2029, when the last baby boomer born in uh, 1964 will become of geriatric age, we will have 77 million geriatric age Americans. That's 22% of the population. And by year 2034, it's estimated that one out of four Americans will be of geriatric age, which is 25% of the population, okay? So let's talk about how many geriatricians do we have in the US? How many people specialize in older adult care do we have in the United States? In 2012, when I finished fellowship, there was uh, 7,700 geriatricians practice in the United States. Many of them were baby boomers themselves, so they have been retiring. Some of them have uh, choose not to do geriatrics. Many of them have become hospitalists and do primary care uh, you know, for everybody practicing family medicine or internal medicine and not focusing on geriatrics. Because it's complicated to see somebody that has at least six uh, chief complaints and, and you have 15 minutes, 20 minutes to see them and, and address all of them, right? And, and please the system where the patient can evaluate you and can say horrible things about you because you forgot to talk about the headache or, or, the, last, uh, the, or, the, or the last chief complaint. Hopefully it's not an aneurysm, right, Dr. Tejada? <laughs> So by, year, by now, we have 7,000 geriatricians because 700 of them we have lost to retirement or, or death or, or who knows, right? Estimated. From those 7,000 geriatricians, not all of them practice geriatrics. And uh, the United States then should, this is all a statistic from the American Geriatric Society, the AGS, um, will have to train about 60 to 50 more geriatricians between now and the year 2030 when all the baby boomers will be of geriatric age. Which means that we need to tra train about 450 more geriatricians per year to be able to supply the demand that we're gonna have. That is not going to happen and it's not happening, okay? So this is why uh, when, I, when I was still a fellow here, I developed a, helping with everything Dr. Sevilla was talking about, helping uh, to create a, a, a geriatric medicine rotation 
and, uh, and, and, and have some lectures that are dedicated for geriatric medicine in the family medicine residency program here in IU. Uh, I don't know if that continues today or not. I lost contact with, with, with some of the people there. Uh, but hopefully they do, because we do need, if we are not going to have geriatricians that have go to, to, to fellowship to, to, to practice geriatrics, we at least need the primary care physicians to know about geriatrics and know about the geriatric syndromes, what medications not to use, what medications, uh, what medications interact with others that we're, that we're giving to patients. And they are different than in, than in the regular younger adult. So the geriatric uh, medical syndromes are, these are the more important, I would say. I'm going to just mention them uh, 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 rapidly. The one that I, that where me, my passion is, is dementia movement disorders. Um, I created in Carbondale, Illinois, where, where, I, where I, I said I practiced for, for about 10 years, uh, a memory clinic and a movement disorder clinic. So we were, diag where we were screening, diagnosing, treating, and following up patients with dementia in the area. Uh, when we came in, um, we, we, we had three geriatricians at that time. Uh, the, the, the primary care providers in the area were treating, uh, were treating patients with dementia with uh, benzodiazepines, which is one of the things that we try to not to do at all costs, because, uh, because benzodiazepines is one of those medications we shouldn't use in older adults. It's one of those uh, principles in geriatrics that not every primary care physician know. So if there is any, any, any medical student, any primary care provider here, any, any resident, I don't know who is who here, but uh, something to take back home, you need, to, you need to read the Beers list or the Beers criteria, which is a list of medications that are recommended not to use in older adults. And this is one of the, one of the principles of geriatrics. Um, besides that, of course, uh, gait disorders is, are, 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 is a big part of what we do in geriatrics. Um, weight loss, which could be related to a lot of things. You know, it can be related to medication interaction, it can be related to depression, it can be related to things that usually a busy primary care physician that is not training, it can easily miss. So this is, where, this, is why I, this is why geriatric medicine is important, and this is why I'm talking about this today. So when Alfredo told me about something about the future, this is the future, and I'm sorry I'm putting kind of the down note here, because it, this is grim, but what we're going to see is an aging American population without the people trained to take care of them. So what we do, and this is what I think I can bring into, into, the, into the symposium today, is that I'm going I'm to talk about the practice that I just joined. I just said that it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the only geriatric dedicated practice in half of the state of Tennessee. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but you know the state of Tennessee is one of the poorest states in the United States. It's, it's in the top lower in the in the lower ten regarding uh, uh, wealth in the U.S. Uh, and there is a lot of needy people uh, regarding healthcare, and those that are more vulnerable, just like in in the Indianapolis, could be you know the underserved communities for for immigrants and African Americans. In in the in in the area of Knoxville is is the older adults like probably happened as well here in the, in, in the metropolitan Indianapolis area. So we have, we are, we have the fortune to have four fellowship trained uh, board certified geriatricians and two uh, internal medicine trained physicians with interest and experience in geriatric medicine. They have been practicing in, uh, with us for, for years before I joined. So they do know geriatrics so even, even though they didn't do the fellowship like it's required now. Um, from the four that are fellowship trained geriatricians, uh, one of them is not yet board certified because he's just joining us in this summer. Uh, he's finishing up fellowship in, in North Carolina. Uh, so what is, what is different about our practice is that we follow patients throughout the medical care spectrum. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a graphic on that to explain what I mean with that. We have uh, 20 nurse practitioners, gerontologists. Remember I talked about the difference? So these are gerontologists, not geriatricians. They are, they are trained and, and, and do geriatrics, but they are not physicians, so they are called gerontologists. Um, and we have a whole team of uh, staff that help us and are dedicated to geriatrics. So in the clinic, we have 
uh, uh, medical assistant LPNs and, and receptionists that are trained uh, to, to help with a geriatric patient. We also, through COVID, have learned to do a lot of telemedicine. And uh, I, ju I just recently recovered from COVID and I, was doing, I wasn't feeling too bad, so I, I, I did my clinic from home which was great, but it wasn't at the same time because I couldn't examine the patient. Uh, but we have developed a system in which we can see telemedicine patients. I saw, I think the day that I saw the most was like maybe 22 patients in one day via telemedicine, uh, which otherwise I would have not been able to see because I was sick with COVID at home. So it's one of the things that we do different uh, there. Um, we also have a specialized nurse practitioner in wound care ostomy care and food care, which are things that are closely rela related to geriatric care. And this is the, this is the hospital. If you can see it there, this is the hospital that we are affiliated with. It's, it's called Blount uh, Memorial Hospital. It's pronounced Blount, not Blount. This is the first thing that I got in when I interviewed there. It was, it's not, it's not Blount, it's Blount. Uh, and there is a whole a myriad of uh, different pronunciations in East Tennessee. They pronounce things different there. So I'm still in training. <laughs> uh, so the next one is, so this is the, uh, there are two of the, two of the partners are here. This is Dr. Teresa Catron, and this is uh, Mary Walker. She's a gerontologist, nurse practitioner. And the rest are um, the nurse, Part of the nurse practitioners we have today, we have more. This is an older picture. Uh, and that is the front office uh, for, the, for the primary care, which is where I work. So I was, I was hired as the, as the first anchor physician for primary care geriatrics, and that's what I do. We are at this point less than a year in, about 75% full in our clinic. Um, and uh, these are the other partners. This is the new guy, Dr. Creasy. We're so excited to have him. He's going to be a sniffist uh, in the group. This is Dr. Kevin James. He's a geriatrician hospitalist, so he follows the patients that we do. In, we, we take care of primary care in the hospital when they go in. Uh, Dr. Catron is the senior partner and founder of the group. Uh, Dr. Renee Hyatt and Kimberly Goodemode, they, are, uh, they both work. Uh, Dr. Hyatt work part-time in the clinic, and she also do uh, nursing home care and Dr. Gutemode uh, do mainly uh, nursing home care. So that's our group of geriatricians and uh, um, uh, internal medicine doctors that uh, like and love and train in geriatrics informally. Um, and Dr. James is, is one of our biggest assets because he is our hospitalist, which means that if I have a patient that I see in primary care and that patient is to be admitted to the hospital, that patient is not, is not going to be taken care of by a physician that doesn't know geriatrics, doesn't know how the medications work. And usually he, he, he has access to our system so he can, he can have continuity care for that patient. So it's very, very important in geriatric continuity care. So that is again a picture of our community hospital, the front, and this is one of the banners they use for promotion. Uh, one of the things that I love about living in in East Tennessee is when, when I go to work, I see these mountains, and it's, it's beautiful. I don't see the fields of corn in, in Carbondale anymore. <laughs> Carbondale, I didn't say Indiana. <laughs> All right, so uh, a little bit about the hospital. We have, uh, it was founded in 1947. It's a community hospital. It's 304 beds, and it has all these services. Um, and it has also a medical group uh, with, uh, uh, that has primary care and specialties. So the model that we follow basically has primary care, primary care clinic. We have one full-time full geriatrician, that would be me. And we have three other uh, geriatricians that do part-time clinic. We have a specialty clinic for ostomy, wound, and food care. Uh, and we have a memory clinic, a, move, a movement disorder clinic, and soon when Dr. Uh, Chrissy joins us, we're gonna have a false clinic, which is a, a subspecialty of geriatrics. So those patients that fall repetitively at home, find out why are they falling, what can we do about it, and what is the plan for the future, okay? And everything in geriatrics is about the quality of care and what the patient wants. It's not what else can we do or what, what else 
different weird MRI or CT can we do, sorry, to diagnose dementia. You know, there these, these MRIs and CTs that, that we can do, we don't have to do if, if we know the clinical diagnosis of, of the dementias. Uh, we do also, the, the senior partner is, is a palliative care specialist, so she does a lot of that, and uh, we also do home care, which is something very important in geriatrics, so those patients that are non-ambulatory, uh, they see patient, they see the nurse practitioner from home, uh, which means that we literally follow them through the spectrum. And uh, I am in charge of those nurse practitioners that do the home visits, so I do, I get to see them via telemedicine uh, every so often or if they have questions and the nurse practitioner is not available. I don't go to homes, but I, I can be present via telemedicine. So I created this graphic. I hope it illustrates what I what we what we do. Uh, these are these are all the the the, spe the spectrums of the healthcare where we uh, take care of the of the patients. The patient is in the center, and the patient may be jumping to to one of the pieces of the pie there and, and during their lives. And what we do is we kind of rotate around them, don't let it them out, get out of the circle keeping them at home, avoiding unnecessary hospitalizations, avoiding complications, knowing their chart, knowing their diagnosis, knowing their medications, and we don't let, we don't let them jump into the uh, medical surgical specialist unless we absolutely need it or they want it, okay? Most of the patients do not want to go to a specialist if we can treat it. So we do a lot of things in our office that otherwise will be treated by a specialist because it's, it's the right thing to do for the patient, for the geriatric patient. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have too many Hispanic patients in East Tennessee. Uh, I think that I have, I just established my first fully speaking Spanish patient this week. He's Cuban and he's lived in, in East Tennessee for many years and he'd rather have somebody that speaks Spanish like Dr. Sevilla's uh, evidence was showing. Um, I have otherwise like two other Latino patients, but they speak English and Spanish, so it doesn't really matter what, what, uh, who take care of them. Okay, so advantages and disadvantages. I, I, I initially labeled it advantages and disadvantages, but I think that these are all advantages, but I couldn't find any disadvantage in how we do things there. Uh, for both the patient and, and, and the system organization, uh, it's, it's just good things, the, 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 trying to keep the patient at home and trying to do the continuity of care, uh, uh, which is, is, is probably the main thing that we provide to the patient. Uh, it, it, has improve, it improves uh, uh, patient satisfaction uh, for the staff. It's, it's very satisfying to, have to, to know a patient and to take care of a patient and a family. And, and the, the best part is when they refer one of their family members to come and see us, because that means that we're doing something good for them. I'm not gonna go into detail here. Um, so what is the healthcare model needed to supply the demand of the growing population in geriatrics in the United States? The baby boomers become our geriatric age, and then you know, a few decades from now, the millennials will be a geriatric age, and that group of, of the population, the millennials, are actually the biggest segment right now in the US. They are more people than the baby boomers. Um, so for me, is what we do, the Blunt Senior Care Partners mo model, uh, but there are other things that we, can, that we can talk about, and that will be GRACE, which was created by uh, somebody closely related to IU Geriatrics here in Indianapolis. The ACE, uh, which is Acute Care for the Elderly, which is uh, basically an inpatient geriatric consultation services. Uh, and then PACE, which is now in style kind of thing, and what they do is that they try to keep the patient at home and have continuity care, which is kind of what we do. These are... Uh, these are, this place actually, this is the hospital, this is uh, the clinic, and this is the, one of the nursing homes where I see patients uh, for uh, rehab. We also see patients at home. So, this is my wish list, okay? I put this together after kind of thinking through this presentation, through making this presentation. This is a brand new presentation I did for today. I have never talked about this before. So. More sites of geriatric medicine, physician training, more fellowship sites, do we, do we need that? We need a, maybe a residency in geriatric medicine. You know, if we have a pediatric residency uh, established in the US, why not to have a geriatric residency in the United States? We need to continue to lobby in, in DC uh, through American Geriatric Society, the American Medical Association, the AAFP, and the ACP. 
This is something that I just recently learned how to do uh, through my MBA classes. It's a lot of work, but I think it can be done, and it can be done only if, if primary care uh, providers get together and work together towards a, a, a same a common goal. Um, increased base placement uh, for geriatrician is just a wish list, remember? It's just that. It's not that it's going to happen. Uh, the pendulum needs to shift back to when physicians were the leaders of organizations. So there is, more, is the, there is more a humanistic approach to medicine and less of a, of a business model only, which is what we have right now. Uh, we need to have integrated specialized services, which is what we're trying to do in, in, down in East Tennessee. Uh, and uh, we need to prepare, and this is painful, to switch from fee-for-service, which is what with our revenue model right now in East Tennessee and throughout the nation, most people do it. Uh, but we need, to, we need to try to change that because, or, or try to know, know how to adapt because it's going to change. And we don't know when or, 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 or what's going to happen, but uh, it's going to be more a quality uh, approach for revenue. And that's going to make uh, the institutions and the organizations suffer. Uh, the patient needs to be the center of the, of the geriatric care or the medical care. So, a little bit of... of a little bit of uh, um, uh, non-medicine related uh, information here. Um, the things you do in life are uh, better when you don't plan them. And this is one of the nicest meals we ever had traveling. Uh, it was a not planned day. Uh, it was the last time we were in a vacation we just had, well, we had a few years ago. You can see the extra weight that I had there, oh my goodness. Um, um, we were in Rome and we didn't have anything to do and uh, a, a friend told us to go to this place. They, they take no reservations. We couldn't call. We had to, we had to be in the front line, in the, in the front of the store for two hours making the line. And it's a really teeny, teeny, tiny place. You see, this is the table and this is where you hang your, your glasses so, because there is no space in the table. And there is a place for the bottle here that you put there in the wall as well. Uh, and this is how big it is. You know, these are the tables. People go through here, and this is the counter, and it's one of the best meals we ever had. This is the Colombian jungle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In two years, I think I'm eligible for the Denny's uh, senior discount, so I might be one of your patients coming up soon. We're going to move right along. Um, we're going to have lunch, uh, a box lunch around 12.15, 12.20. Um, so st stick around for that. I want to introduce Jason Baker. Dr. Baker is um, uh, Chief of GI Physiology from NX uh, Robotics. He is uh, internationally known uh, for uh, uh, GI Physiology and, and in the GI Societies. He became a friend of mine recently as we just purchased a machine uh, to do video capsule endoscopy. He's not going to be talking specifically about that. He's going to be talking about the future of GI endoscopy, the future of, of, of what we can look forward to in non-invasive techniques to visualize the entire GI tract. So, um, Jason Baker, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank Drs. Uh, Lopez and Owens for um, allowing me to have this opportunity to uh, participate. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm a little bit of a, um, a gastroenterologist historian. I was just telling Dr. Owens, probably starting this year, me and a very close friend has been a mentor for a very long time, well-known physician. We're gonna write the book of the history of uh, neurogastroenterology and motility. So I have a little bit of a history thing and a little bit about myself, but I do wanna to add to the Colts and the Patriots argument. I, I did graduate with Tom Brady from the University of Michigan, my undergraduate. So. Uh, um, um, go Brady slash Pats a little bit. Um, and then also to the Colts thing, always been an anti-Colts thing because of Peyton Manning. Because in 1997, I, I was a freshman at the University of Michigan. And um, Michigan went to play in the Rose Bowl for the national title. We beat Nebraska, but we end up having to split it with Nebraska. Or we beat Washington State, we had to split it with Nebraska because Fulmer was upset that Charles Woodson won the Heisman over Peyton Manning, so he put Michigan number four, which pushed them to number two in the AP poll. So a little bit of anti peyton Manning on that in history. But anyways, that's not what we're here for. Um, we're going to look at um, capsule imaging 
overall through the whole GI track. Um, and I think it's fascinating where we're going. Um, this Venn diagram of, um, of, we've kind of heard it through the aneurysm talk, the dental talk, and all these other talks here about this Venn diagram between engineering and uh, medicine. So I think it's a very exciting time for us to be in the healthcare sector right now, especially um, as physicians and providers. The innovation that you have to work with an engineer is uh, cutting edge right now. So the disclosures were already made. So a little bit of objectives we're going to try to get through in the next 20 minutes. So we're going to basically explore the this the capsule imagery, how fast it's come, and how much has expanded just within basically 20 years. It's just amazing. Um, exploring the imagery, the past, the future, small bowel, and stomach. We won't really get into the esophagus yet. There's a lot of stuff happening with Barrett's esophagus right now, reflux disease, but there's an issue with that frames per minute because how fast something moves through your, your esophagus. For basic, for example, if we all take a sip of water right now, and only basically three out of every 100 people have achalasia. So basically very few people in here probably have that. But if you take a sip of water or take a, a bite of your muffin, that's going to go from your mouth down to your stomach in about nine seconds. So you can imagine trying to image that with a capsule, but there's tethers, there's all kinds of things coming out um, that is going to be very exciting in the next five years. We're going to look at what capsule is going to do from a passive to a magnetic control thing to modalities such as biopsy, delivery medicine like precision medicine, sampling, microbiome, all this stuff is coming. And it's in animal models now, some feasibility studies are happening. It's this really exciting time. Then we're going to look at a little therapy, not an imagery thing, but a thing a capsule can do. And there's a couple, there's two of them out there on this planet that are going to help constipation, may help the, the geri geriatric folks because it does doesn't have any pharmacokinetic interaction with any other drugs. So this all, if you can imagine, in 1962, before that, it was about 1960, this, we, so at the University of Michigan, we used to do one of the very few people you use pancreatic function testing and gastric acid secretion with modified sham feeds. Basically, take a tube, non-sedated, transnasally, put it into someone's stomach, lay it down in the antrum like a fish hook, and just basically secrete, I mean, just basically take as much fluid we can out, then we would, you know, do different drugs, do different feeds, have them chew on bacon or sausage, chew, 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 and spit it out, kind of increases this digestive system. And you can imagine the uncomfortability. So someone in 1962, in the Heidelberg pH study, Heidelberg from Germany, they decided to do this, to basically do the exact same thing, the tube, uh, hydrochloridia hydrochlor uh, and all these different things, um, Zolger Ellison syndrome. But the reasons they did that was really because the predicate was very uncomfortable for the patient and t technically difficult for their staff or the provision to put it in correctly and keep it in the right location, the exact location the entire time. So you're sampling the exact same location temporally over time and not getting different samples. And also, it was very inconvenient for the provider to actually score this. So they came up with this tether, this Heidelberg cap capsule, and they can measure the pH continuously, and the patient only had to do is swallow the capsule, and they pulled it back out. That was 1962. But the, the main two reasons they do this is exactly why we're expanding capsule imagery today, exactly what the Heidelberg team thought of in 1962. So, uh, so where are we going? So this is, this is before 2001, we're going to work our way back a little bit, all capsules was basically passive. So I would swallow a capsule, it would go through my body through peristalsis, but I had no control of it. So I'm watching the image of it, and I see an ulcer, or I see a polyp, I can't stop it because it's gone. So I'm looking at pharmacokinetic medicines and animals, it's gone. You, you see it, it's gone. So basically, and this all came about in 1981, this engineer Gabriel Iden, he, was, he worked for the um, Israeli Ministry of Defense, and he had, he, had a, he had passion for imagery and capsules. So he took a sabbatical to actually Boston because he wanted to learn about more about medical imagery. At the same time, there was another physician, there was a physician, Dr. Edian, I'm going to make sure I say his name, Scapa, that he also took a sabbatical to go learn about optics in Boston, Massachusetts. Serendipitous, they did not know each other, and they were neighbors. 
So just imagine all the people in this planet. These two gentlemen became neighbors in Boston, Massachusetts. Didn't know each other. They got to know each other, and they started talking. They had a common interest, capsule imagery. Okay, that was 1981. They go on, they you know, started to collaborate. They go back to Israel, all this type thing. And then in 1993, this, this guy... Iden, he continues the passion for it, but you can imagine all the challenges with that, the microprocessors, the lights, the imagery, the energy, the battery life. He decides to make a very crucial decision. He wants to split it into a couple different things. He wants to have the project look at a transmitter and a camera, uh, the recorder, how it's positioned on the patient, and then the software package to start processing this. So this became a big thing. Then at the same time, an optics engineer, Dr. Eric Fossum, published a thing about how he can reduce the markable energy in optics by a different micro semiconductor. All this kind of came together as these, these gentlemen were starting to think about it. 1994, they raised funds. They, they pitched, they raised funds to start doing this they, in, in Israel. And they basically hired a very talented amount of engineers, optics, battery, all these different engineers to overcome body temperature, all this stuff, light. Then in 1997, same time, they will go to a meeting at Euro European uh, DDW, basically, and there was a guy named Dr. Paul Swain. Didn't know these guys were actually doing this in this team. He was actually created a capsule where you can image the side of a, pug, a pig's stomach. So they were at the same meeting, the same time, and they got to know each other. This is amazing how all this came about. Then in, they, they continued to work, and then in 1999, Dr. Swain became the very first human being to swallow a passive capsule with all these components, and they could image the, image the small bowel. And this all came, so this exploded in 2001, given imaging back then, who was basically the founders of this whole thing, got CE mark and FDA clearance. Then this is where I come in. So I, I graduated from the University of Michigan in 2000. I was blessed to be uh, hired by Dr. William Shea to um, be the lowest technician in his lab, and I was making rectal barostat balloons out of sandwich bags. And then uh, Dr. Laurel Fisher, which is now at Penn, be, was really instrumental in the United States to get capsule um, into the United States, and she was at the University of Michigan. She asked me she wanted to join her team. And it's ironic today, I still write papers now with her daughter at UCLA, so it's, my age is getting there. But um, I was one of the first people, November 4th of 2001, one of the first five people to have um, a patient swallow a video capsule in the United States. We, they give an image and end up flying in 20 professors around the country to watch this 18-year-old boy swallow this capsule, and you can imagine he got stage fright. So all the providers had to turn around, <laughs> and they all flew in to have him watch this <laughs> swallow this capsule. But that was, so this is my history of the video capsule. That's kind of good. So there was benefits to all this, right? There's a black box. You could scope this way. You can scope this way. You can do a push enteroscopy this way. You can push a colonoscope this way. But there was basically beyond D3, the ligament atrites, to the ilium, you couldn't see. And this was what this, this technology solved that gap in the literature, gap in the medicine. It's non invasive, safe. Patients could walk around. They could go to Walmart. They could go to back to work, and they were imaging their stomach. It was this amazing thing. But challenges, right? There's no control of the capsule. Here's the polyp. Capsule gone. You can't see it no more. Can you do biopsies? Can you do any therapeutics? That wasn't ready for prime time yet. So we published this thing. Um, it, was probably, it got published this year, but we did it like three years ago with COVID. It kind of got backed up. But anyways, this this. All this is saying right here, if you follow these lines, this is the same curve of any innovation, the aneurysms, the dental, you probably see the exact same curve if you do the diffusion of innovation theory. There's a technology, you see the spike in 2003. Everybody started doing it because that's the time they got the CPT-1 code where people were getting to pay 91110. People now getting paid for this. The two years before this, people like Michigan and other places were doing it and not getting paid but they believed in they were the Morse theory, the early, early adopters of innovation. But if you can see the curve, it's kind of flattened out. So now we're ready for prime time for new innovations to have that next spike. 
So where are we at today? Now we have four different, four different type of magnetically controlled capsules. This is, this is the next innovation to this whole thing. And these are all published in the uh, peer review, published literature. Again, look at all this stuff in PubMed. All the citations are down on the bottom. But one, there's different ways of doing it. There's robotic. Um, there's actually handheld stuff. There's a hammer type thing. We'll go through all this. There's actually an MRI type of machine. But really, it, it, does it compare to gastroscopy? If you find, what is the sensitivity, true positive, that a polyp is a polyp, true specificity, uh, true negative, it's not a polyp, it's not a polyp, ulcers, erosion, or erythema, all that type of stuff. But if you see on the left side, uh, I mean, let's start on the right side, the top part is the magnetically controlled capsule image, and on the bottom is the gastroscopy image. You can see each one are the exact same location, exact same image. And on the left-hand side, the specificity for both are over 94%. So there's advantages to all these magnetic capsules because you think about it, um, there's, there, it's not sedated, people can go back to work after, there's no like uh, recovery time, you know, coag therapies, all these different things. I think patients now are moving towards this, let me try to do something non-sedated, non-medicine before I have to, I don't mind to do it, but I need to have some justification for it. And all, all these things play a part of it. People's co-pays and deductibles and all these things of this nature. But you can see, this is a robotic one, sensitivity, specificity, very high. The images are very good. The other one is called a magnetic capsule, maneuverable capsule endoscopy. Basically, it was built out of the colon capsule. If you have seen a colon capsule, it images on both sides. Um, same type of idea, um, but they have a handheld thing. So, so the, the, the technician, nurse, provider would kind of do the handheld thing. They did some feasibility studies, 10 healthy controls. They're able to see the Z line about 80% of the time or eight out of 10. But again, the frame rate for this capsule has to be a little bit lower to save battery life and temperature and all these other things. And then um, about 75 to 90% of the stomach was actually visualized, but they did have a challenge with the cardia and the fundus visualizing it with this technology. This is the other one. There's a handheld capsule endoscopy. And you think, we're going to go through a summary slide. This is amazing. All, this is, all these modalities have started over only the last 10 years. So this is one basically where it's a hammer type thing. I don't know if you anybody have seen this at meetings, but we, we play, we, we've used this quite a bit in the labs I used to direct that you can actually swallow the capsule, then you put the hammer right there and you can actually pull it along with you. And then on, on, like on the data recorder itself, you can actually see the real time image. So I need to move it here, move it here. And they were able to hold it at eight, all these specific locations for at least um, a one minute at all of them. And they were successful, you can see, at a minimum of 88% of the time and higher. But the challenge was, was pulling it along on different size people. You can imagine a BMI being different of 18, 25, 30, 35, to pull that along the magnet connections. But um, just amazing the technology that's coming. There's magnetic guided capsule endoscopy. This is known where someone believes like similar into an MRI type machine. There's a technician or a nurse on the other side of the room moving the joysticks around and kind of maneuvering the capsule magnetically that way. They did the exact same thing, They're basically a CAPA study between um, the magnetic capsule and the gastroscopy, and they were pretty good, but their sensitivity was 62% of the time, and they believed that the sensitivity went down because they spent more time with the capsule than a, an endoscopist did staying in that location. That was their justification. Um, but either way, the capsule technology is just exploding. So this is a summary slide, kind of what's happening. You can see all the, all the four different ones that are out there. Um, they're all been out since, basically, this is all has happened since 2010. And you can think during COVID, we can kind of take a little break. This is all within 10 years of what we've done. Uh, the engineers have done, and people, very smart people. Um, you can see the FDA clearance on, on, on one of them, but all the years commercially available, as you see there. So the next step is coming, everybody, if you read any literature or watch anything, everything's artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a tricky misnomer sometime, right? That's deep, deep machine learning is in this bucket. There's cognitive neural networks are in this bucket. So put it all together, we'll just say AI, but there is a little bit differences between all these. 
So you can see there's a nice summary slide um, of a review. The review's down there, it's done in 2020. But you can see there's, probably, there's like seven people have already started looking at artificial intelligence for the small ball in the stomach. And if you can see the different type of AI they use, and really it's how many images have you, have you put into this machine learning to verify the sensitivity that something is true, yes and yes. So you can see it started from someone as easy as 20 studies up to almost 2,000 studies. And these 2,000 studies included about 152,000 images of everything. So they, this is a large amount of data that put into there. And there's the AOC curves, it means the predictability that a polyp is a polyp, an ulcer is an ulcer, is very high. They're all over 85%. But really, if anybody does small bowel video capsule endoscopy here, really the big challenge for these folks is that physicians take about 30 minutes to an hour to review the studies because there's there's eight hours of images. Even if you compress them, you can think about fatigue too, right? If you have four capsule endoscopies in a day in your clinic and you're reading four of those, more than likely there's gonna be some fatigue that happens by looking at an image for four hours. So what artificial intelligence does, if you just look at the red arrows down, it takes, it takes the time to read something from 30 minutes to an hour, 5.9 minutes now. So six minutes, the artificial intelligence reads it all for you. And then this is where artificial intelligence comes. You can see it in colonoscopy now, all kinds of things that artificial intelligence is decreasing the amount of time it's taken for, for a provider to actually review studies. So technology movement. This is, this is as a wannabe biomedical engineer nerd um, over the years, this is, this is absolutely fascinating. The next step is can I be able to deliver medicine to a specific site that I need to do it to? Right, that's really what they're trying to do here in this engineering technology. As you see the one on the left, they, they coined this thing called the inchworm light capsule. So if you ever see a worm after it, after it rains at your house, it kind of does this, like the old slinky toy, right? And that's exactly the idea they took on this capsule is that through pH and magnetically controlling, they can move this capsule to like this, very slow along the way, all to be able to eventually move to the exact location to deliver a drug. Like this is the whole idea of this. So, I mean, in the beginning stages, it's in animal models and, and, and studies bench testing, but what, this, is, this is what's coming. You think 10 years from now, we went from passive, magnetically controlled to this. You know, what, when we're sitting here in 2032 at this conference, what, what this, presentation will look like, right? The passive capsule will be, will be like talking to your mom and dad, you know, 30 years ago, what they, what they were, it's amazing. Then the needle-based capsule endoscopy, same type thing, leading to the biopsy type of thing. This is a spring type thing, and as it springs forward, a little needle comes out, sticks there, pulls it in there, goes back in, slings out, comes back, puts it in there. So you can actually hold it and eventually rotate it 360 degrees at that one location. So this is, what's, this is what's on the brink of the next 10 years. You're an endoscopist, uh, I like the capsules, I like the all the type technology, but I can't take a biopsy. Not yet, but it's coming. Capsule, magnetically controlled, this is a system that this, these engineers have done. This is 2020 publication, very new. This is how they have it set up. This is their ideal model, what's gonna happen. Here's a magnetically controlled capsule. It goes along, you want to take a biopsy at that location, magnet holds it to the superior part or inferior part of your stomach or inside your small bowel eventually if you can insufflate it enough. There's five degrees of freedom, so you're basically looking two vertical, two horizontal, one z-axis. There's a, bi a biopsy punch will come out very similar to a, a, a gastroscopy, and then it, t it takes up to five millimeter uh, cube sample. Pulls it back into the capsule, Basically, if it's not on a tether, people extract it through a stool, you pick it out, or eventually maybe, and if it's in the stomach, on a tether. All non-sedative, taking a biopsy for H. pylori or other type of erosions. Therapeutics, that's now, after you got the biopsy, here's the next thing they're trying to do for hemostasis. You gotta, this is, this is, this is really fascinating, especially if you're a computer engineer or a coder, this is, this is, this is very, very interesting, is that, 
now what they're doing, they, they create this capsule, again, very, very elementary right now, the design, but you can see what it looks like. It's a closed system. Basically, it means there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, the capsule, there's, uh, there's something on the person's, a wireless thing on the person's signal, and a smartphone. Yeah, so, um, so basically what happens is it's basically 433 megahertz. That's about half the size of, uh, of, of old wireless, you know, wireless phone at your house. That was 915 megahertz. So this thing, uh, you know, I've, I've heard of a story that when Apollo 13 went up to the space, there was more technology in my cell phone in my pocket than they had in the, in the space shuttle. I don't know if that's true or not, but Tom Hanks said that one time, so I'm, I'm going to quote Tom Hanks for that. Um, but anyways, so basically this patient is a, a suspected GI bleeder. Um, they go home, they swallow this capsule, they go home, and by radio frequency, the capsule detects blood by pH and other things, and then sends a signal to the person's cell phone to ignite the capsule to inflate to create hemostasis and it stays there for five minutes, then deflates then their, their feasibility study rate, there was no observed bleeding 20 minutes after that. Just think, I mean, that from where we went in 2001 to 1981 of an idea of two gentlemen, serendipitous, end up in Boston being neighbors, 2001 a passive capsule, what is being engineered in engineering labs now? This thing 20 years from now. It's, it, it, you know, it's just a, it's amazing. I hope I'm around long enough to see this. But um, then the other thing, I'm very much in the microbiome studies. I've been blessed to be on many research teams that still do microbiome studies. Hot topic, again, very misnomer as an artificial intelligence, it's, but we'll say microbiome. Here's a capsule. It's close. They swallow a capsule. The magnetic force is so tight. They swallow the capsule, magnetically move it where you want to go. It's right now only animal models that where you want to go. You get, oh, there's a fluid pocket right there because you're looking at the image. You lessen the magnet. The capsule picks up the fluid, closes back up, up to 60, 61 micrograms of the fluid, which is quite a bit. And then you either pull back out by a tether or you get it in your stool. And they, all 11 have been samples with no contamination inside it. Like, you know, th this, is, this, is, this is kind of the imagery of capsule technology. Then drug delivery, this is you know, kind of like the holy grail in a lot of ways, is that can you be able to deliver a drug, a deliver a capsule to a specific, specific, especially in oncology, to the tumor or whatever it is and release the drug on site? Not, because if you, you know, I've been very blessed to be on um, three FDA teams of, of medicine. You, you swallow a drug, um, it has a lot of enteric coating, there's pH or stomach activity, there's movement, there's all kinds of things, Ob obesity, there's all kinds of reasons why it, the drug may not fully have the efficacy of what you're trying to do. But anyways, here's a capsule, you go to that place by magnetically, first phase with low um, uh, frequency, low Tesla, you deliver a drug at a slow rate, you watch it, you watch it, and then when you, when, you, when you feel it's ready for the next dose, a higher radio frequency rate, and you deliver a higher dose. So you can imagine in the world of oncology, GI oncology specifically, the importance of this, this type of technology. So chronic constipation, this is uh, anal rectal physiology beyond, trilled transparent is my main area of research focus. Um, Again, a lot of people are moving towards non-pharmacokinetic reasons to help their uh, stuff issues before they go on to these things. There's two different type of uh, vibrating capsules out there now, but the key is there, these studies need to be done a little bit better because you need to rule out pelvic floor uh, dysfunction before you would do any of these. But anyways, there's a, these people, there's devices now you swallow a capsule and they have different sequences and different frequency rates, but still the idea is that you swallow a capsule and then it gets to a place where it's obstructed, it starts to vibrate. Almost like a high action pressure contraction in your colon to stimulate a bowel movement. And you can see the spontaneous bowel movements between functional constipation, IBS, and healthy controls are just significantly increased by a vibrating capsule. The one on the, one on, um, the left side right there, this is a little bit different. You swallow a capsule, you think you're constipated, or 
it's obstructed, it will send a signal to your smartphone and then you activate the capsule by your smartphone to, to you stop vibrating until you have a bowel movement. Then you stop it. All this stuff, super neat, super cool, but it's endless opportunities. So in summary, you know, basically, it, I would say tech, capsule technology, regardless of it's a modality or just observation, is the possibilities are endless in medicine. I, this is my, I guess, my take home message, everybody, is that as medical providers, we really need to embrace innovation and take chances on innovation. I mean, it's, it's because what you, as experience gets in the field, you may think, we need to do like this, we need to do like this, and engineers are just looking for these type of knowledge because they're engineers in a lab. They're not into clinical medicine. So embrace innovation. And then uh, capsule technology will play an essential role this is really for stratifying patients because, again, being a PhD and not an MD, I, I, I see it this way, person comes in, you need to, we need to stratify them to get to the right intervention quickly and effectively that pr provides opportunities for them to have higher quality of life and decrease the um, burden on healthcare economics. I really appreciate the time and uh, I really enjoyed the conference. Thank you. Okay, so as we've moved through this conference, we went from sort of a lower valence up into the, moving up to the stratosphere. Um, our last talk for the morning before lunch is gonna be um, um, a person I've got to know over the last uh, three or four months. And um, if there's anybody who's like the medicine man, who's been out uh, in the jungles looking for new medicines, it's this guy. Uh, he's been to 67 different countries. He's been a seminarian. He's had a, He's had four lives in one life, and uh, I'm, really, uh, I'm really looking forward to his presentation. He's going to talk about immunology. Uh, Doug McLean, senior, please. He, ca he comes from Texas, so don't hold that against him. Okay, so this is the... Uh how do we advance it? Okay, very good. Well, uh, good morning still. Um, it's a privilege uh, to be here. Um, three of my flights were canceled, so I didn't get here until I walked through that door, so I've missed a whole night of sleep. Uh, I didn't even get here. I only got to Cincinnati, and I, I had to drive here. So. Um, if I start mumbling or talking backwards, please forgive me. The uh, content is, uh, is very good and just forgive my presentation. Uh, this is the age of discovery and the reason I have these notes here is because I didn't have a chance to prep the, um, uh, the, the order of the slides. And um, <clears throat> disclosure, um, I'm a research uh, immunologist and develop uh, therapeutics called biological response modifiers. Uh, Infeprium is our human product. Uh, 13 years ago, we developed a USDA approved product called PumaClear, which is, you'll see later, uh, it was approved as a biological response modifier. Biological response modifiers are the latest classification of drugs by the FDA. It is a brand new science. So any of uh, younger people that are here, that is, this is where innovation is coming in therapeutics. <clears throat> Biological response modifiers are substances that improve the body's natural uh, reaction to pathogens, virus, bacteria, cancer especially. And uh, they're compounds made by living cells recognized by the host immune system. That's the key to a biological response modifier. We discover molecules, small molecules, small peptides, uh, four kilodaltons in size and smaller, that are already recognized as the host, so you don't have a negative response or a negative reaction. <clears throat> Immunology 101. Um, a healthy immune system has three specific things, and this is what makes uh, immunology, the focus right now. 
Now, I've been in this a very, very long time. We're going to talk about Dr. James Allison, who's an immunologist, not an MD, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2018. Uh, and he actually has brought immunology to the forefront. I can tell you, I'm 70 years old. 20 years ago, immunology, we were quacks, wax, and witch doctors. Now, I've been saying the same thing for 20 years, and people seem to think, I, you know, I'm some important thing. I've been saying the same thing for 20 years as Dr. Allison and many other immunologists. So the immune system is specific. It goes after targeted pathogens. Number two, it can adapt. The immune system can adapt faster than any virus, any bacteria, all right? So a properly um, regulated and controlled immune system can mutate faster than all the mutations of, of COVID and viruses. That's key to survival. And then the most important thing is memory. Especially in cancer, when a T cell kills a cancer cell, it does two things. One, it puts out a chemotaxis signal to bring more T cells to the site of the infection injury, or, and then it births a memory T cell that has the genetic information of that cancer. And what Dr. Allison helped win that Nobel Prize for, he actually used the word cure, all right? Radiology doesn't cure cancer. Surgery won't cure cancer. Chemotherapy won't cure cancer. But if your own immune system recognizes the cancer, kills the cancer, you are now cured. You can morally, legally use the C word. Um, here's the, the history of what is called the three E's in cancer, the elimination phase. Everyone in this room probably knows that everyone has cancer. A brand new baby has cancer, but we have lines of defense that eradicate it. What happens in the equilibrium phase is that we have energy. Our immune system doesn't really want to fight it anymore. And eventually, through toll-like receptors, this is the problem, all right? Your immune system says having this virus, having this disease, having cancer is now normal. And your immune system stops fighting. Then the escape phase, we have just re uh, seen, and I'll show you some of these papers, just in the last two years, cancer puts out a don't eat me signal. Here's a cancer cell sitting right next to a T cell, and the T cell doesn't recognize it, it thinks it's part of yourself. Here is the history of uh, basic uh, immunology, starting in the late uh, 1800s, Dr. William Coley, his daughters and his grandchildren now run the Cancer Research Institute, which Dr. Allison has been a director of and I'm a part of. And he, he uh, discovered, uh, by chance, injecting staph infection into breast cancer, the immune system went after the staph infection, and while it was killing the staph infection, kept on going and killing the cancer. This is kind of the on, uh, in oncology, the birth of immunology. Of course, immunology goes back to, you know, smallpox or the very nature of a vaccine is immunology. And you go through, what, what is the pointer right here? Yeah, there we go. All right, <clears throat> you see as we come down CTLA-4, which is important in, especially in cancer, 1987. But this is kind of a dark age, excuse me, this is kind of a dark age in um, immunology in the, in the 80s, all right, until, and you'll see here, all this 92, 90, 89, 96, this is Dr. Allison and other immunologists, all right? And here you get in, in 2006 or, or 2008, once again, going all the way back 100 years, developing viruses that go after cancer, that destroy cancer, all right? And so we get to where we are today with checkpoint uh, blockades and using immunotherapy to kill cancer. Five years ago at MD Anderson, you had to fail every form of therapy in order to get immunotherapy. Now, especially at MD Anderson, immunotherapy is the first line of defense. Dr. James Allison, 
2018 Nobel Prize, three specific things. She talked about specificity, adaptability, memory, using the uh, C word cure. That, that's his actual. But the main thing he did was he brought out the purpose of to treat the immune system, not the disease. That, I'm going to try and focus on that. Treat the immune system, not the disease. We all know that the immune system can kill any virus, any pathogen, any bacteria, and it kills cancer every single day. But what we have discovered in the last two years, last three years, is that viruses and cancer put out these things to suppress the immune system. And that's what we're going to start talking about. Okay. Treat the immune system, not the disease. This is uh, something that was in his uh, dissertation. And you see that uh, the increase of uh, death by cancer, but when he used the anti-CTLA-4, which was inspiring the immune system to release T cells, death rates went down to zero. Now, blocking the negative CTLA-4, here, excuse me, Here you have uh, the activation of a major histocompatibility complex starting to uh, address a T cell, give it the message. T cells have to be given a message of what to kill, okay? And so here it's being suppressed. And here is the drug that Dr. Allison uh, developed, releasing, and you see the T cell activation. The key here is that's what's killing the cancer. It's not a chemotherapy, it's not a surgery, it's not a ration, which I'm not speaking against, but we're talking about what's going to happen in the next 100 years. In the next 100 years, immunotherapy will be 200 years old, especially when it comes to cancer. But here you see T cell activation, whose only goal in life is to find the cancer and kill it. This is uh, the different cancers that this particular uh, immunotherapy works on. However, there is a cost. Many things that are called immunotherapy are agents that block certain things of the immune system. For instance, now in cancer, that's not that important because either you defeat the cancer or you don't, all right? But in many other autoimmune conditions, uh, one of the key factors in many of the drugs that are out there is blocking tumor necrotic factor alpha. Tumor necrotic factor. You block tumor necrotic factor long enough, what are you going to get? If you block the thing that kills cancer cells long enough, all right? Again, in cancer therapy, it's not that important because either you kill the cancer and you survive or you succumb. These are some of the uh, highly toxic happens, things that happen from uh, monoclonal antibodies. That's just a cartoon to remind us of what happens, especially with cancer and COVID. COVID, the SARS virus, is one of the four viruses that suppresses the ability of your body to produce interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is your number one defense against uh, viruses, actually against any pathogen. Now here you see, and this is the word we're going to start working on right now is overwhelm. In panel A and panel B, you have the don't eat me signals going out, causing people just to die. All right? In panel C and panel D, through immunotherapy, you're suppressing the don't eat me message, and what happens? The body starts killing the cancer. This is tumor escape uh, and T lymphocytes. Those are, uh, you'll see here, this is where your uh, MAC, major histocompatibility complex one and two, which are essential for recognizing cancer. And so cancer and viruses suppress MHC one and two in your body. That's what recognizes the danger. Here you have uh, Japanese uh, encephalitis, Zika, dengue fever, and um, SARS. 
And that's, that, that's the mechanical expression of how it suppresses the immune system. It suppresses MHC 1 and 2. It suppresses interferon gamma. It overwhelms your immune system. And so what do we want to do? We want to develop therapeutics that overwhelm the defense mechanism. Here's actually how the COVID-19 overwhelms the innate immune system by inhibiting interfering gamma. Now, the other thing that gets suppressed is adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate, as you all know, is the energy of the cell. That's why we even can operate. As physicians, what's one of the first symptoms of any kind of disease? Fatigue, all right? Because these, these pathogens stop the production of adenosine triphosphate. You can't store adenosine triphosphate. Just want to ask you a question. Do you know how much adenosine triphosphate you produce in a day if you're healthy? Your body weight. Your body weight. You produce adenosine triphosphate, your body weight. And as soon as you get sick, one of the first symptoms is I have no energy. Why? Because the pathogen is suppressing the uh, production of adenosine triphosphate. This is just another diagram of under acute inflammation, excuse me, chronic inflammation, it suppresses ATP, which starts this cycle of not having enough energy. You need energy to produce immune cells. Immune cells come from your bone marrow. That takes copious amounts of energy. The irrefutable issue, our immune systems are under constant environmental assault, all right? Uh, but we have to keep that immune system robust to, uh, to defend against disease. Obviously, if we didn't have operating immune systems, we wouldn't be here right now, all right? Um, <clears throat> but as, as things have gone on, we have antibacterial uh, resistant, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and these are things that medicine is having to deal with. 50% of all Western disease is autoimmune. 50 years ago, 10% of disease was autoimmune. We're doing something wrong. Something's happening someplace. And if you ever go online or Google watching a T cell kill a cancer cell, just now think about that T cell that's killing that cancer cell. If it gets a message to go after your myelin sheath, multiple sclerosis, to go after your connective tissue, lupus, to go after your joints, rheumatoid arthritis, these unbelievably strong, potent parts of our immune system that keep us alive, they get these aberrant signals and they start going after you. Inflammation, there's many types of inflammation, classic inflammation. As an immunologist, we've been saying for 25, 30 years that chronic inflammation is the genesis of all disease. We're wax, quacks, we're witch doctors. Five years ago, traditional medicine says what? Chronic inflammation is the genesis of all disease. The perfect storm, chronic inflammation, produces series of misread signaling pathways. <clears throat> Again, um, I teach at many different levels, so if I'm, uh, I hope I'm not coming across condescending in, in any way because I have no right to be condescending in any way. <clears throat> but um, message, we're nothing but huge chemical factories. Everything we do is, is promoted by a chemical. It's, it's one, in, in neurology, you know, we have synapses. And you know, there's nothing in your brain that's hardwired. For me to be talking right now, chemical messages are going from one synapsis to another. It's, and, you disrupt that chemical messaging and everything starts going downhill. Cancer Research Institute says uh, inflammation is a multifaceted role in carcinogenesis, and this is the big one. Seven out of 10 of uh, diseases that kill us, the pathogenesis is chronic inflammation. Perfect storm, you got chronic inflammation, if it's allowed to proceed, produces these aberrant messages. Now, <clears throat> the immune system, as wonderful as it is, when it gets confused, it makes stuff up. 
That does sound very scientific. But when it starts getting these aberrant signals, all of a sudden, let's try this chemical. Let's try this chemical. And then you get to what people have now heard about, cytokine storm. You know, the world did not even know what cytokine storm was. Immunologists know what cytokine storm is. Cytokine storm is your body going, let's try this. Let's try that. And that's what happens. And the problem with cytokine storm, it can kill you. These are just some of the diseases that are now been focused by published peer review research that start with chronic inflammation. That's just a cellular picture of how chronic inflammation happens at the cell. If you ever saw a picture of a cell, which I'm sure all of you had, to go from transduction, getting a signal outside the cell, into the interior of the cell, then to transcriptions, there's 47 different chemical reactions that have to go properly before it gets to the nucleus. That's a lot of place for things to go wrong. Infeprium. Infeprium is the product that we have developed. It's in uh, trials. It's approved in several other jurisdictions. But it is a pure, true biological response modifier. <clears throat> so I want to kind of get away from uh, the product itself. But <clears throat> what we discovered, there is what we call a general of the immune system. It's a small, very small, uh, three-linked peptide that every vertebrate mammal has. And we've done enough research and peer-reviewed research to know or show that if you're healthy, you produce this molecule in abundance. If you're sick, you, you produce a whole lot less of it all the way down to you don't produce any of it. If you don't produce any of this molecule, all right, you're opportunistic for disease. What we have done following Dr. Allison's lead uh, in, in, in trials that we've done and in jurisdictions where we actually use the product, we give you this product until you start producing the molecule yourself again. Once you start producing the molecule yourself, you don't have to take this product. So technically, it becomes a cure. If you start producing your, these molecules yourself, you go to homeostasis. <clears throat> Prophylactically and therapeutically, it treats bacteria, viral assaults, and cancer. Why? Because the same immune systems go off after any pathogen, viral, bacterial. We did testing at the Noguchi Institute in Ghana, which is where the United States Navy does their uh, malaria testing, because malaria kills more people than anything, all right? And your immune system can kill that parasite. The actions addressed by a biological response modifier. You start cellular uh, signaling properly. It kind of wipes the slate clean. If you've ever been to a rock concert, how many people have ever been to a rock concert? And you've been there where the music is so loud, you can't even talk to the person next to you. That's chronic inflammation in the human body. The music is so loud, it can't talk to each other. And so what a biological response modifier does, it erases the board and starts the body talking to itself again, chemically. Remember, we're nothing but chemical factories. <clears throat> this is a peer-reviewed um, published paper where um, mice were injected with the uh, B16F10 melanoma model, which is a classic model for cancer. It's hardly ever been passed by any therapeutic, and uh, the uh, cancer uh, nodule is decreased by 50%, which is a significant difference. And how does it do it? Okay, the red graph is interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is the whistle of the immune system. It's what starts calling and marshalling your immune system to the site of an attack, all right? What happens in chronic inflammation is that interleukin-6 doesn't get turned off. And then acute inflammation, which is the good inflammation, turns into chronic inflammation, which will kill you. So what happens, <clears throat> after about hour six, interleukin-10 goes up. Interleukin-10 shuts off chronic inflammation. Now, everyone knows that interleukin-10 does that. The problem with it, if you give interleukin-10 in an exogenous manner from the outside, there's no dosing. So one cc for a 100-pound woman works fine, one cc for a 300 pound man, he doesn't get sick, he dies. Same with interferon gamma. 
Uh, those of you who are my age, 70 and older, remember Time Magazine, Newsweek Magazine in the late 70s says they found a cure for cancer. It was interferon gamma. Why didn't it get approved by the FDA? Because they couldn't give it externally without causing all kinds of problems. Uh, interleukin-6 takes care of the bacterial infection. All right, then interleukin-10 downgrades it. That's what's supposed to happen. Now, these are other cytokines that have been upregulated by the, by the administration of ephephrium as a biological response modifier. You see, at three hours, there's your signal. There's your alarm bell. But up with it starts interleukin-12 and granulum uh, macrophage colony stimulating factor. At 24 hours, interleukin-6 is down. That's what you want. Because you don't need to keep ringing the bell. You don't need to keep sending the alarm. You just not, now, you know, bring the fire engine and start putting the fire out. But look at interleukin-12, and then look at this. That's interfering gamma. It upregulates a thousand percent. This is what we want to talk about. You overwhelm the overwhelming uh, issues of the pathogens. We have now learned in the last two years alone that cancer and all these viruses put out suppression chemicals to suppress your immune system. Uh, interleukin-12 is a T-cell stimulating factor, and it stimulates growth of T-cells and produces interferon gamma, as well as tumor necrotic factor alpha. This is a 58-year-old man, uh, stage four lung cancer, who underwent three rounds of chemotherapy with no response. The, uh, it went to his colon and his bladder went to uh, our facility in Mexico, and he underwent just 15 injections of ephephrium. And, this, and, and uh, Dr. Allison, in his dissertation for the Nobel Prize, shows similar uh, things of how T cells work. So here, you have the tumors. After injections of ephephrium, you see the tumors getting smaller, but this is the one I like. They fill with T cells. The tumors fill with T cells and then they start deflating like a balloon. That's not chemo, that's not radiation, that's not surgery, that's your personal immune system. Sorry, I kind of get evangelical. I <laughs> okay, what did I do? What did I just do? What happened? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, and, and this uh, patient is alive today. Now this is uh, a patient uh, had throat and neck cancer, and his only option was uh, radiation. He was going to have to probably eat through a tube in his stomach, and wasn't going to be able to talk. And he went to our facility, which is the Angeles Hospital in uh, Monterey, which is the finest hospital in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And just had uh, 20 doses of ephephrium. And you can see, there it was. And that was gone. That was five years ago. He is alive today. Why? Because of memory. His own immune system killed the cancer. He might get some other form of cancer. But that cancer will never come back because now he has memory T cells that have the genetic information of that cancer. Now, this is just showing, uh, uh, now, the research name for infeprium is um, ICPF immune cell potentiating factor. And just showing you with other um, diseases how it did the same thing. Because a pathogen to your immune system is a pathogen, virus, bacteria, cancer. Here's showing uh, that that's a whole 30-minute dissertation right there about the immune system. But again, showing the survival rates of cholera, uh, canine parvovirus, all right, uh, is virtually fatal to puppies, and uh, one injection of uh, uh, the animal product, which is called Pumaclear, which is USDA approved. Uh, brought the, uh, uh, saved the puppy's lives. Now, here, this is important. These are human specimens showing these cytokines 
Now, what's real important on how you see a biological response modifier, patient 103, you see in 101 and 102, we're not sick. And so interleukin-6 is, is an upregulator. But KW103 was fighting an infection. So his uh, interleukin-6 was already elevated. Now, if you gave interleukin-6 externally, it would go off the scale. But a biological response modifier recognizes that his interleukin-6 was already elevated and didn't elevate anymore. And then this is the key to biological response modifier. It upregulates, and then within 48 to uh, 72 hours, it goes back to normal. Interleukin-8 is, is a cytokine that sends immune cells to the site of injury uh, and uh, disease. <coughs> uh, the reason I talk about this, monocyte chemoattractive protein number one, right, is upregulated about hour 20 of the biological response modifier. Monocyte chemoattractive protein number one is what opens up the blood-brain barrier to get immune cells into your uh, spinal system. Very important point we'll maybe be able to talk about. South African experience. South Africa had a pandemic of pediatric immune deficiency. Does anyone know what that is? That's AIDS without being AIDS. And it was a, it was a pandemic and children were dying and of course, and how this works, it suppresses your ability to produce these cytokines which upregulate CD4 and CD8, which are your defense mechanisms. So we got asked by the South African government to come in there. They gave us uh, MCC FDA 21 approval, emergency approval. And, um, and by the way, th this is a published paper. Uh, uh, CD4 and CD8 counts multiplied by three to five times and we literally stopped this pandemic. The lymphatic system. We're talking about the age of discovery. Everyone before me is talking about these discoveries, all right? The lymphatic system, no one even knew what it was until about five years ago. It's the lymphatic system of the central nervous system. It only opens up under REM sleep. What's one of the problems with disease? What is one of the things you don't do? You don't sleep. And so especially in neurological conditions, the lymphatic system stops up and all these beta amyloids and all these other things keep circulating and the plaque you see in neurological uh, x-rays and everything else is your immune system sticking this stuff because it can't get it out, all right? Biological response modifiers open up the lymphatic system and start draining this stuff out. That's just the uh, USDA approval of PumaClear and small, but right there it says it's approved as an immunomodulator. First one ever. And that's what we're trying to do with Infeprium, by the way, is not just get it approved one, one disease, one drug, but get it approved as a biological response modifier. The problem, our immune system's under constant attack. Uh, actually, that's a repeat, <laughs> sorry. Conclusion, I'm within 20 minutes, all right? Okay, <clears throat> recent proven and published observations have opened the doors to a more effective and safer therapy that don't jeopardize the host quality of life. I got into this field because my first wife was misdiagnosed with cancer. Very similar to Dr. James Allison, who got into cancer research because he held his mother's hand who died of cancer, and he was there when she died. My wife was misdiagnosed for five years, and the great thing, I'm from Alaska, the great thing about MD Anderson is that when they said we could give her enough chemotherapy and radiation, but that'd probably kill her, they said there's this little holistic clinic up in Spring Branch, Texas, that we send all of our hopeless cases to. And that's what started my path 42 years ago of finding out what this immune system is and what it can do. Because we got to be able to develop thera therapeutics that don't harm the host. And it takes a long time to turn the ship around, but Dr. Allison started it when he said, treat the immune system, not the disease. As it says in the next paragraph, 
by inspiring bold initiatives and research not only change concepts, but the, the actual standards of care. The goal for the 21st century and, and beyond is to locate, test, replicate small molecules from living cells that the host will not reject, all right? Already recognized by the host immune system as self, avoid negative events and side effects. This process assists the host immune response in an endogenous way from the inside. If I can give you a molecule that causes you to upregulate interferon gamma, there is zero negative effect. The same with interleukin-10. Bring the host back to homeostasis. That's the very definition of what true biological response modification does. Pulmoclerin and fepronil are a very small part of proven therapies that point to a new horizon of medicines to be created, applied to and relieve the human condition of unmet medical needs. Financially, Unmet medical needs in this country alone is a $100 billion market. Diseases that have no cure, primary progressive MS. There are drugs that can help treat relapsing remitting, but primary progressive MS, zero. And you physicians, you know the amount of diseases that are out there, that there is nothing for. That's why the Congress passed the Orphan Drug Act in 1984, because if there's something like re re reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is chronic pain that you want to kill yourself over, um, but there's only 60,000 people. Who's going to spend 12 years and $3.6 billion to treat 50,000 people? So they passed the Orphan Drug Act and unmet medical needs, and I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. I think many of us got into medicine for personal stories like that. Okay, real quick, we have lunch right out there. Uh, take 10 minutes, uh, go out, grab your lunch, come back in, and we'll get on with the afternoon uh, uh, sessions. Thank you very much. 10 minutes. When people bring their lunch in, are we going to do Chris? I'm sorry. After, 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 after um, people bring their lunch in, are they doing Q&A or just move on to the next? We're going to be doing, um, we're going to run off to the next speakers because we're one out of them. I tried. I knew it was going to be like this. I mean, it's just, I'm going to go check in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Thanks. You think we're all right?
¿Dónde está el pasado? Alejandro, tomamos una foto conmigo. Será un honor, un placer.
Hola, hola, hola. Vaya. Odio. Hello, hello.
Aló. Welcome everyone again. A lot of networking, a lot of fun conversations. We can. can someone help me close the doors then, please? And maybe Dr. Adams can, can come in. Thank you. Where is Dr. Haddad? Oh, OK. okay yeah. <laughs> we're, we're getting into the last part of our 20th anniversary medical symposium, a model of healthcare for the 21st century. This presentation, this introduction I had to, I had to make. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce one of the individuals, the doctors that I admire the most. Um, a role model, a friend, a costeño from the Caribbean coast of Colombia. I met him when I was in medical school. And re last night we remember that um, a student organization that I started in Javeriana University sponsored one of his first publications on the use of bazooko, crack cocaine, among youth in Colombia. That's a source of big pride for us and big, it was an honor. Alejandro Haddad, Alex Haddad, is a physician, philosopher, author. He is one of the big innovators in e-health. He founded the Center for Global E-Health Innovations. He's been to more than 100 countries trying to help on changing how healthcare is delivered to the neediest people in the world. Aside from that, he has written 11 books, countless articles. He designed the Haddad scale to evaluate the quality of controlled clinical trials. It is my pleasure to introduce Alejandro Haddad. Alex, please. Well, it's, it's really a joy uh, to be here, and, and it seems incredible that 20 years have passed, Alfred, and I still remember him as a kid, a medical student, a teenager, and, uh, and here we are. Some people think in numbers, and, and some others think in, in verse or in songs. I don't know how many of you experience the same thing. I think in questions. So I will begin with a question. When was the last time you thought about the meaning of health? What is health? Yeah. And, uh, and this happened to me, the realization that I hadn't thought about a word that was in probably the three titles I had at the time in the year 2008. Uh, when I found myself, and please um, activate this, when I found myself uh, as a patient in my own hospital. This is a very interesting experience, yeah. to be a patient as a physician in the same institution where you have been serving people. The world looks completely different. Uh, my doctor, my physician, who is a physician's physician, uh, suggested that I had some tests, thinking that I might have had colon cancer at the time, year 2008. And you go through the motions, pun intended. And uh, even the, the gowns, become something very noticeable. Okay? They give you one, they remove your identity, they take your cell phones, you cannot communicate with anybody, you become one component on a production line. I had to beg to get two gowns, okay? because the decision was, do I expose my front or the back? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I managed to get two. But the question that came to me when I was recovering from one of many procedures was, 
could I be healthy even if I am diagnosed with cancer? Could I be a healthy patient? That sounded crazy. I know how many inner voices you can hear somewhere around our heads or inside. I have about seven inner voices. But one of them said, are you stupid? How could you be a healthy patient? Another said, hey, why are you wondering about the meaning of health? Don't you know what health means? And I realized that even though I had gone to university for 20 years, I was there waiting okay, to be discharged. And I didn't know what health meant. So what is health? I'll throw myself out there. Um, it's the uh, biopsycho, biopsycho social um, well-being of a human. OK, then is it, if it is well-being, why do we need two words? Then it should be well-being. You see, and well-being is uh, a component uh, of the definition of health. So you are right on the mark by the WHO, 2008. Okay. I found myself, by the way, the cancer was ruled out. And uh, I was very relieved. And the Minister of Health of Spain invited me to a ministerial meeting in the European Union where people were gathering from all over the world to talk about health system strategy. And in a room, a big room, there was a microphone, and they uh, called a break to celebrate the 60th birthday of the World Health Organization, which was created in 1948. And I couldn't resist. I went to the microphone, and I said, what is health? And people started to laugh. And then I held my ground there. And the laughter just died down. And somebody raised a hand and said, Dr. Haddad, we define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease or infirmity when we created this organization that we are celebrating here today. I said, OK, OK, yeah, heard it. I, that's what came to me when I was at the hospital. It didn't make much sense because of the word complete. So raise your hand, please, if you have complete. And that's what I said in front of the microphone. Yeah. Raise your hand if you have complete physical mental, and social well-being. If you want to pee, you don't have complete physical well-being. If you're worried about something, if you didn't sleep well last night, you cannot have complete well-being. So raise your hand if you have complete physical, mental, and social well-being. We're screwed. We're, none of us. It's, it's healthy. I mean, this is the implication of, of that. And we have had a definition of, of, of health that has been unchanged since 1948, that condemned us all to be not healthy. Okay. Somebody at this meeting said to me, oh, by the way, the chair of the session said, thank you, doctor. Next question. <laughs> and I was left there. I said, huh. I don't want to say what is in my head, but you can imagine WTF. <laughs> and I came down, and somebody said, Alex, at our meetings, you usually throw grenades, but this was a nuclear bomb. <laughs> At that time, there was a new editor of the British Medical Journal, and I had the fortune to be on the International Advisory Board. And Fiona Godley, she just stepped down, said, I want to do something bold with the journal, something different. Any ideas? 
I raised my hand. She said, yes, Alex. I said, what if we invite the world to have a conversation about the meaning of hell? And she said, I like it. I like it. I said, OK, what next? I said, let's write an editorial in the British Medical Journal. And let's use every possible means we have at the disposal of the journal to invite humanity to contribute to something that is different from this. Okay. Three years, we were engaged in this global conversation. And, um, and halfway through, a message, well, a phone call comes, the Minister of Health of the Netherlands, or the Ministry of Health of the Netherlands, expressing concern about the fact that they couldn't allocate the budget because there was confusion about what health means. Anyway, we ended up in The Hague, hosted by the Netherlands for a weekend. And the deal was to come up with something useful. And this is a summary of what we proposed. And by the way, if somebody can flip that a little bit, that would be great. So we proposed, and this made the cover of the British Medical Journal in 2011, to propose that health be considered as an ability, and the ability to adapt to the inevitable physical, mental, or social challenges that we face through life as an ability. This opens the door for us to, to become better at it, to teach how to adapt to these challenges, to recognize that we are constantly challenged and yet, we could be healthy if we manage to adapt to those, to those challenges. Yeah. And then very soon, okay, it was clear to us that we have had a very powerful tool at our disposal to judge whether a person was healthy or not. And it wasn't me as a physician, which was my role. Okay. I was taught at medical school that health is a state of incomplete diagnosis. You give me enough time, and I would diagnose something, OK? <laughs> so now, the game could change if we flipped the balance of power, and we enabled each person to self-report their own level of health. And this is called self-reported health, by the way. This is the first item on quality of life uh, question is like the SF36. Every country tends to have a report okay, of the health status of the population just by asking this question. Okay? So I'm going to ask us to raise our hands in response to this question. So in general, would you say that your health is, raise it if it is poor, raise your hand if it is fair, OK, not a single hand up. I'm very happy because people in the US, by the way, 2022 publication, more than 700,000 people in the study, those who report their health as poor or fair, which is negative health, live 23 years less than those who consider their health as positive, as good, very good, or excellent. 23 years on average. I mean, we are talking about a massive predictive power from a single question. So raise your hands, please, if you consider your health to be good, very good, or excellent. Wow, five minutes ago, we were all not healthy. Now, we're all healthy. <laughs> you see, this, this, is, this is pretty powerful stuff. Yeah? Because the implications can be dramatic. Studies on people with metastatic cancer, they know the cancer has spread throughout their bodies. They know it's incurable. This question is asked, 63% consider their health to be positive with metastatic cancer. And when we look at mortality, it is the best predictor of mortality for people with cancer, better than the clinical judgment of the oncologists or any test that we can throw at cancer, at cancer patients. It is as if we had an internal compass. You see, as if we had this weird sense that combines pretty much everything that is happening in our lives that allow us to pick one word 
to judge the state of our health. Now we have data from more than 2 million people in more than 120 countries. Okay? And when we combine that, it seems that about two thirds of humanity consider themselves to be healthy. Okay? This is more pandemic than COVID. And we call it a pandemic of health. Health is pandemic. Yeah. So we then asked people, why did you judge your health to be positive? Why? And think about why you judge your health to be positive. And then we asked people, probably for the first time ever, what do you need for your health to stay positive or to switch from negative to positive? How many of you picked a medical reason for your health to be positive? One, one, two, three, for your health to be positive now, three, okay? 90% of people or more think of a reason that is not medical to be healthy. This is big because we're spending in the US alone close to $4 trillion a year on the 10%. What if we also, I'm not saying instead of, what if we also paid attention to the 90% that is not medical? Because the risk of negative health is big. The mortality triples within a given period of time between match groups that report their health as positive or negative. The number of admissions to emergency rooms goes through the roof with negative health. Cost of care is humongous, et cetera, et cetera. So there was something in that conceptualization or definition of health which was there all the time that then required some extra attention. If health is the ability to adapt, what are we talking about when we use the word adaptation? When are we adapted to something? Okay, because the, the fact that most people consider themselves healthy is a reflection that somehow we are adapting to these challenges that life is presenting to us. And there are these three components. We need a challenge, then change in response to that challenge, and then getting better as a result of the encounter with the challenge. Okay? This is different from resilience. Resilience, you are challenged, you change, you respond to the challenge and you go back to where you were. To adapt, we need to improve. Okay. In fact, resilience may not even exist because even if you think you went back to your ori original point, you learn something, hopefully, along the way. Okay. There is a downside to adaptation. And this will be developed even more in a book that will be coming up in January of 2023, titled Healthy No Matter What, and it's one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. The co-author is our youngest daughter, uh, who made this contribution, amongst many others. Because I was asking, how can we ensure that every human could be experiencing positive health? And by the way, with the Colombian Federation of Coffee Growers, we, re we reported the first group ever in which everybody reported positive health. And by the way, we have it here. So it's possible to get everybody to report. You're wearing glasses, for example. You're adapting just with your glasses. And you have an eye disease, and you too, and you too. So there is a price that we pay every time we encounter a challenge. And this is what we have called the toxic stress load. And in most cases, we don't notice this. And inflammation, we heard about it, seems to be playing a big role. But also hormonal changes. Because every time we are facing a challenge, we get stressed. That stress triggers, even if we don't notice it, by the way. Okay? Hormonal and immune changes in us. And it accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. And it ends up manifesting in the form of a disease, which is what we tend to 
to face and try to tackle within the clinical environment. But by the time somebody gets a diagnosis of the disease, it is a reflection of uh, an accumulating load. And welcome, how are you? Excuse me. Absolutely. What are your names? Are you feeling healthy? Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> so, fascinating. Uh, I, have had, I have had people shooting at each other in auditoria. It was in Mogadishu once, two people. So I'm glad this was what happened here. And um, OK, so we have the ability to adapt on the one hand, and the price we, pays, we pay to adapt on the other. And, and uh, so if we have inevitable challenges, I would like to leave with you another concept, which is the concept of inevitable opportunities. Wow, you understand? So let's look at that other side. If it is inevitable to be challenged, let's make sure we find opportunities every time we are challenged. Okay? And now, for example, one third of Americans are sleep deprived. Raise your hand if you didn't get enough sleep last night. There you go. <laughs> okay. This is a challenge. And somehow, from this response, it, it has become inevitable. 95% of new parents are sleep deprived. I wonder about what happens with the 5%. Well, that has triggered opportunities to adapt. Okay. Either substances like caffeine or better pillows, but an entire industry has been uh, developed around this. And so business opportunities for sure, but also opportunities to rethink, especially now uh, that we have gone through or continue to go through a pandemic about how to modify the way in which we live and work. Okay. And hopefully we have learned about this. When we come to the health system or the healthcare system, which is a subset of what should be a health system okay, that includes the medical system. So imagine like three circles, the medical system focused on diagnosing and treating disease. That's what medicine is. And by the way, there is an article out there. If you type Haddad, what is medicine? I hope you enjoy it. We haven't stopped to think about what is medicine, by the way. And it gets pretty scary pretty quickly. We really don't know what medicine is. And we looked at the faculties of medicine that are members of the World Association of, Facu of, of, of Faculties of Medicine, and in none of them there was a statement to say, this is what we teach people, by the way. The Institute of Medicine doesn't say what it's all about. Okay. Or the journals. Journal of the American Medical Association. OK, what is that? We don't know. So if you're interested, let me know, because we are trying to open a conversation about the meaning of medicine. But for sure, medicine is at the core, diagnosis and treatment of diseases. Then we have a healthcare, and then we have health. Okay. And within healthcare, we are trying to put things that are not necessarily includes medicine and all the allied professions. But this is how most healthcare systems look like in the world. It's like a Mexican standoff. The editor of the book said, would that be impolite? to call it a Mexican standoff okay, in the age of political correctness. Okay? But this is what happens. The, the clinicians and the, and the institutions where they work, the payers, the government, the patients, everybody pointing at each other, not trusting each, anybody. And whomever moves, loses. Okay? So we are under lots of stress within the healthcare system constantly accumulating toxic stress load at the systemic way. Because it not only happens to us as individuals, it happens to us as communities or as entire sectors. So being around the world, um, 101 countries so far, looking for hooligans, wonderful human beings who are challenging the status quo, and organizations that have been able to prove that a different reality is possible. Okay? And I've been collecting 
these incredibly extraordinary people and organizations for more than 30 years. And uh, identifying innovations from around the world that are ready to be implemented in special places to see how much we could change reality to get it as close to what we would like it to be. And one of the best surprises of my life is that there was a group in Bogota, Colombia, like the blue bird of happiness. I don't know if you remember that Chinese fable, this brother and sister go out looking for this blue bird of happiness because they are very sad. They come home frustrated. They didn't find the blue bird of happiness. And they hear some chirping in the backyard. It had been there all along. So as a Colombian, I launched a book the other day, and the CEO of an insurance company there said, let's collaborate. And they were providing services to 1.3 million people in Bogota, and at a very bad time. FARC was in the middle, and the government of the peace process, the dollar was in, in trouble, and this group uh, was at risk of bankruptcy. And in Colombia, uh, the government allocates $500 per person per year, and this is adjusted to purchasing parity power. And they said, we are keen okay, to evaluate what happens when the best innovations that are appropriate to us could be brought together within a network approach to health services. We published a book in 2017 and I think it captures it in the root of the title. The key was trust. And trust has been eroded a lot with COVID. We don't trust the media, we don't trust the government, we don't trust science, we don't trust, we don't trust, we don't trust, we don't trust. At that point, this group that included 36 organizations, hospitals, okay, payers, distributors, et cetera, et cetera, identified the lack of trust as their main weak point, And they decided to work on trust. So uh, it was clear that chronic diseases were the main source of, of, of expenditures. So a lot of attention was paid to the inevitability. That that's, looks like a nice uh, 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 flag, pride flag. But this is the, the number of chronic diseases that we accumulate as we age. Okay? And it's almost impossible to find one person with a single chronic disease. There is something called comorbidities, pluripathologies. We tend to accumulate these diseases, which are, by definition, um, uh, incurable. So given that it is inevitable uh, to, to live with these things as time progresses, this group decided to rethink the main place where services were provided and decided to create this kind of facilities, beautiful, by the way, to look after people outside the walls of the hospital, which had been the default place for a while. And they managed to deal with 90% of clinical cases outside the hospitals. And then the question is, what is the essence of a hospital? What should we protect within the hospital at all costs? We don't ask that kind of questions. Only five things. Anything beyond these five things is like going to the corner shop to buy milk by helicopter. Because the hospital is the most dangerous place in society, period. Outside the battlefield. Okay? We are dangerous people. So these five things, OK? And probably the most important should be to support those in the community to manage complex cases there so they don't become decompensated and have to come to the emergency room. But life-threatening emergencies, experimental interventions, intensive care, and major diagnostic, surgical, or medical procedures. These five things. Anything else could be done outside. And what did this group do? And this is called Compensar. In Colombia, by law, 4% of the paycheck, okay, if you are employed at an organization, 4% of your paycheck goes into a pool, and the organization, the company, the corporation, decides where that money goes to provide the employees 
with services that are focused on well-being. Cooking classes, dancing classes, yoga, exercise, travel. There are hotels that are created with this pool money to uh, uh, complement what people can find or can afford in their normal lives. Okay? But look at this. Patients, okay, they developed a mechanism to allow patients to be transferred from the emergency room to their homes and to be cared for with the same level of care but less risk at home instead of the hospital. Okay? And then they realized that if a trusted network was going to be built, they had to embed people in each of the institutions, 36, okay, and connect them so they could exchange insights. Okay? And these were called the liaison professionals. So they had people whose job was mostly there to open bottlenecks, to figure out how to solve problems, and then to communicate with everybody when a new insight was generated. So look, this worked here. Be atten attentive to that, because you might want to apply it at your institution and helping raise the bar simultaneously of all these organizations that at some point were competitors. They were on the Mexican standoff mode. And they needed very good information systems for this, to the point that now patients can change their own doctors on their mobile phone. They have access even to the financial information of the institution if they so wish. Electronic health records available on any platform. Yeah. Clinicians, the cleaners, anybody could access information about how the network is working because transparency is essential to building trust. Yeah. And, um, and then one of the conclusions we reached is that we had to separate the challenges, especially the clinical challenges. That we need to make every possible effort to prevent the preventable, to cure the curable, to relieve the relievable, to control the controllable, and to steer the inevitable. Okay. And they were bright enough, because this organization, Compensar, which includes the 1.3 million people within the healthcare system, is made of 4.5 million people who work at 96,000 companies. And they see themselves as a platform for well-being. So they started to create facilities like that to take care of the 90% of the needs that are not medical and to get healthcare professionals with well-being professionals in the same building. And we would go there and say, who is the health professional? Half of them would raise their hand. Who is a well-being professional? The other half. By the end of our conversations, we'll say, who is a healthcare professional? Everybody. Who is a well-being professional? Everybody. And then we realized that health is part of well-being, not what the WHO thought, that well-being was part of health. And that well-being can also be assessed using a simple question, which is, in general, okay, how would you rate your ability to judge that your life is going well? So judge whether your life is going well or is well. And we started to look at that. And then we confront it's another book, which is, called, uh, is focused on sustainable well-being for all, based on the data from these experiences. And we have one copy here for Alivio that we will leave if you're interested. It's available on the web. One of the challenges that this group accepted when they brought us in was to consider themselves as a country. 1.3 million people. We said, we need to benchmark you against countries. Because Luxembourg, you have twice the population of Luxembourg. 1.3 million people, Estonia. And these are members of the OECD. So what happens if we use the indicators to judge the quality of entire health systems for nations and apply them to you? And we want open books. So we went from, with people from Maastricht in the Netherlands, from Harvard, from Toronto, and we went inside to look at their data. And they were number one in the world in terms of self-reported health. And two other indicators were better than Israel, Canada, the US, Spain, France, with one-fourth of the expenditure per capita on average. 
and 20 times less than in the US, by the way. So as financial people pay attention to money, of course, we developed this unit, which is how many dollars would be needed to achieve each percentage point of self-reported health. With our trusted network, less than $7. In the US, 116 In Canada or the UK, where there are universal healthcare systems, again, multiples of that. So the opportunity, you see, to reallocate resources, to, to, to look at things differently and increase the margins, even for the businesses. I mean, this is, going, this is beneficial potentially for businesses, for profit or not for profit in terms of, of, of reducing costs and improving quality. And we met the quadruple aim within that. So now, the opportunity, the inevitable opportunity, is to figure out a way to ensure okay, that we go to what we call end of one care. Each person is different. It's like what happens with our mobile phones. If we open the front page of, of any of our phones, we may have the same applications, or we may not, probably the combination of applications, but it's the same pool of apps. But somehow, each of us has managed to select and to prioritize what makes sense for us. And we end up with our own profile. So what we have learned from these experiences is that it is possible to identify some services that satisfy the needs of groups. And there are others that need to be brought into a menu to satisfy the needs of each person, all the way from the clinical to the philanthropic. Because some people say, what I need is companionship. By the way, loneliness is killing a lot of people. And leading to a lot of diagnosis of depression and prescription of antidepressants, when what people need is human connection. Okay? So uh, some people, by being engaged with, with uh, foundations, with charities, and all that, get to have much more human connection. And in that case, we can prevent a lot of unnecessary use of health services. But anyway, the concept of massive individualization, which big tech has figured out, okay, is probably the most important inevitable opportunity that we have now. How to ensure that each of us can have access to what is needed, when it's needed, how it's needed, so we can enjoy a life okay, that we perceive as healthy ideally until our last breath. That would require another shift. And we, we tend to say, seeing is believing. Show me the data. We have the data. This is possible. The challenge is the other way around. Okay? Believing is seeing. We need to give ourselves permission to believe that a different reality is possible. And then all sorts of possibilities that remain invisible start to become noticeable. Yeah. So that's the invitation. And thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs>
he was a fast rising star in academia. He was um, presenting at meetings. He was, he was doing everything that you need to do to move up the academic ladder from assistant professor to professor and fast on a way to live in that academic rock star lifestyle of once you break through. He told me one time that someone very close to him asked him when he talked about he had a feeling that he needed to do more or more for the community. And someone asked him, are you going to quit all this and take care of Mexicans? And he said, yes. And that's what he did. He built it 20 years ago to take care of the most unserved, underserved, and needy population in Indiana, Indiana before a lot of this stuff was happening at IU, before it was cool. And he built it. First starting off on West Washington Street out of his home, and then over on the east side where, he, where we are now. Now we're a two-story building. We have every service under one roof that you can possibly imagine, including surgery, radiology, ultrasound, physical therapy. It's a multidisciplinary building where, every, where one can come and get all the services they could possibly need in a culturally relevant manner, in their own language, and, um, and, and with the understanding that no matter how they come, with or without papers, they're gonna be understood. He built all this and much more because he gives people opportunity. And he told me recently, I want to show immigrant people that they can come to this country and be successful. And you can come to this country and you can grow. And it's a place to launch and we're going to do big things at Olivio and I see a bright future for Olivio. But I'm going to start off with introducing Dr. Alfredo Lopez to the podium right now to talk to you a little bit about where we're going in the 21st century. Yes. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. What an honor. I'll try to keep my cool after that. It's been an emotional two weeks. Um, the main message I want to say is our healthcare system needs to empower primary care physicians. We need to stop this fragmentation. We need to stop these extraordinary costs and expenses, and we need to focus on really the good old doc, the doctor who is there in the trenches taking care of the people. Alex was saying, yeah, we need to take people out of the hospital. Hospitals are dangerous places. That, that, that is true. We've known it for years. So the main message here is let's empower primary care physicians. I have nothing to disclose. Um, no. Let's see. There. Dr. Lopez, this is Dr. Zendejas, Esperanza Zendejas. Okay. I've heard that you are working and volunteering with the Hispanic Education Center, which today is La Plaza. And I would like to give you a very good, extend you a very good invitation. Would you consider coming to my radio program? I said, wow, hmm. becoming a celebrity, very close, very quickly. And then she said, well, the radio program is every Thursday at 5 a.m. And it was in the far west side of town. Mm. And then she said, but I'll give you coffee. And I didn't drink coffee then. So it was triple whammy. I, it was 5 a.m., far, and coffee that I didn't like. But I took the invitation. And the important part of this program was that people could call in 
ask questions, and connect to a doctor. And I wanted to stay true to my training. My training is I was a specialist, a subspecialist in stroke medicine. Um, what was I doing there answering questions about the skin condition or GI or anxiety? But I thought, well, I think I can do it better than if they go to any other place just to read or to ask someone who is not a non-physician. So I decided to do it. And week after week, we got this incredible amount of, of, of calls. And they knew that I, I, I worked at Wishart Hospital, today Eskenazi. So my clinic, it was a morning clinic. Um, usually we saw 20 to 25 patients, stroke patients, neurology patients. But slowly, the count of patients was growing with a lot of diverse faces, a lot of Latino faces. And the patients, uh, the nurses started getting, <laughs> getting a little annoyed. They said, a doctor, we cannot see 40 patients in the morning. We need to do something about it. And then I realized that the patients were saying that they had a headache or they had numbness, and truly they had another condition. They had GERD. They had um, skin rash or something like that. But they knew, they learned quickly how to work the system. They would say, oh, I have a headache, so they could get to the clinic. Once again, starting, st staying true to my training, I said, well, you need to go to the primary care clinic, right? I was a subspecialist. Sub you need to go to the, to the internal medicine doctors, to the family practice doctors. And they would come back disappointed or uh, restless or mad sometimes, saying, doctor, why do you do that? Um, I missed the appointment, and now I have a six-month wait period. Or they didn't have an interpreter, and I couldn't connect with the doctor. Or I didn't feel very well liked in that clinic. I said, that was the time that I realized we needed to do something. We needed to open something that was culturally relevant and that we could take care of people with the approach that Chris was mentioning, kind of a one-stop shop, trying to take care of a patient in a holistic manner. This is a view from above. We started not in that place. We started in a very modest examining room on West Washington. And then within a few months, we went to a famous La Casita. Dr. Tejada knows La Casita very well because he started ultrasounds there. And then after one year, I would drive on West Washington Street and I would see this beautiful building by St. Vincent Hospital, St. Vincent Clinic. And they had a huge, um, huge, um, what is this, station uh, parking lot. A huge parking lot. CVS, and the parking lot was empty. One car, two cars. But I would drive by and say, what if we could have that place? What if we could start the clinic there? And within a year, Bruce Gordon, who was the real estate manager at St. Vincent Hospital, called me and said, doctor, would you consider moving your operations to this building? This is not working for us, but it might work for you. And that was an incredible answer that, that I, I didn't expect. And then we could really enhance our services, motivate other doctors to come and feel that they could really, with dignity and with proficiency, see our patients there. We brought physical therapy. We brought psychology. We brought Dr. Julio Sanchez then. You remember? You went to that one. And uh, then we, we set the grounds and the foundation for significant growth. This is a disclaimer. I'm a neurologist. I don't pretend to pontificate or to teach how to be a primary care doctor or what is the correct way. But I have 20 years of experiences, 20 years of anecdotes that I can share with you and that can help us. Some of these ideas that we developed have worked very well, and that's what I want to share with you. My first lesson, so I'm going to share seven brief lessons. Seven brief lessons, and this is paraphrasing a physicist that I love. His name is Carlo Rovelli. He does seven brief lessons on physics. So let's do the seven brief lessons on primary care. Um, the first one is, I w it was my second rotation in Chicago, at one of the hospitals affiliated with the University of Illinois, oncology rotation. And there was this lady who never smiled. She was always... Uh, she wouldn't talk. She wasn't talkative. She appeared down. She had stage three ovarian cancer. So I assumed the cancer is really, is really making her depressed. Day after day, for at least three days, I would try to talk to her, cheer her up, nothing worked. 
fourth day I come and she's all smiles. Hi, doctor. It's so good to see you, Dr. Lopez. Oh, what happened here? I, I, I went through my routine of discussing the labs, the chemotherapy that she was getting, and, but I was puzzled. I said, well, what happened? And then she said, doctor, finally the nurses heard me. They brought my dentures. Now I can smile. Now I can talk to you. She felt that's so important for her, her appearance. I was mistakenly assuming that because she has cancer, she didn't have any other concerns of her appearance, of her well-being, as we were discussing. So it was my very first lesson in true medicine. And on the right, you can see what the message is. Meet patients at the patient's level. And what I mean at the level is not that we are a higher level, no. It's just face-to-face -face so we can really understand what they are going through. So lesson number one, seek a genuine connection. Doctors as scientists, we like knowledge as a sequential, logical, cumulative source of, of knowledge. But that, that's how we, how we learn, because we're scientists. Um, that's mostly from the left hemisphere of the brain. But I think providers, particularly uh, primary care doctors, should think more to complement that important knowledge with the right hemisphere, which is gestalt, intuition, gut feelings. There's a lot of information that you can get and can make you a much better practitioner if you pay attention to that. On this picture, we're gonna start with the sec second lesson. On the left, you can see a very eager, almost mad physician ready to cure or kill or excise something. That's what we do, right? We're strong, we want to take care of illness. On the right, we see a doctor who is pondering, thinking, questioning what the next step is. Lesson number two is listen generously. And I, this is not my concept. I borrowed this concept from Dr. Um, Ramen, Naomi Ramen, who is a palliative doctor in California. And one interesting thing in JAMA study about 10 years ago, 23 seconds. Do you know what 23 seconds is? Is the average time that a doctor spends talking to a patient before, I'm sorry, that's the average time that the patient starts talking to a doctor before he's interrupted. So after 23 seconds, the patient is interrupted by the doctor. That's the length or the extension of attention that we pay to our patients. 23 long seconds, I guess. So, and this has been compounded by documentation. We have a computer, we're dictating, um, and then that reflexive urge to treat. Right? The patient is telling me, well, doctor, I have this, let's say, for example, sore throat. I'm thinking antibiotic. I'm thinking about a strep. A. It's, it's almost a reflex. We, we tend to be very quick. And um, like the doctor that you saw the picture in the cartoon, that syringe, we're ready. We're ready to treat. So what are the solutions here that I propose? You have to extend. Definitely, we have to extend those 23 seconds. Definitely, we need more help. We, there's now virtual scribes. In our clinic, we have extraordinary medical assistants who can help with the documentation, so we can focus, providers can focus more on education, on, on um, explaining what, what's going on with the patient. We need to ponder about side effects and be open to other alternatives. And I want you to remember this, generous listening implies taking an active part of the process of learning and unlearning conducive to healing. And this unlearning, I'm borrowing from my friend, Alex Haddad. He has one of his books, is called Unlearning. Next, lesson number three that I learned over these past 20 years, providers and clinics can be agents of change. Dr. Kane was alluding that we've done a lot of health, uh, health fairs. Um, I remember one of our future nurse practitioners, I don't see him here now, he started with us when he was in high school. He was looking for some meaning in his life. There were, some things were not going right. And we decided, well, why don't you come here, learn to take blood pressure, learn how to do a glucometry. Maybe you find something that is exciting for you here. And like that, you can multiply that by tens or hundreds. We've had a lot of high school students or young students who either are confused or are in addiction or are in trouble in your school. And we said, maybe you find meaning here as a medical assistant learning these skills that then you can use in your life. Um, so providers and clinics can be agents of change, youth opportunities, role models, ADHD, we tend to reflectively go to our methylphenidates and our stimulants and things like that, and that's perfect, they work, but they're not sufficient. 
they're not pharmacology is not enough is not for a complete and thorough evaluation of a patient so engage patients engage relatives engage teachers engage pastors this is very important clinics can be agents of change and primary care doctors can do it as well now we need to find the time for them to do it what is this can you tell what that is what that represents anyone What is it? A castle? Okay, a castle. I like it. It's a castle. I think that's a depiction of a, what is white and beautiful and pricey? Ivory. So that's a depiction of ivory tower. Ivory tower, and if you, what is it, if you were to say something else about the picture, what would you say? Where is that located? Where is it? I'm sorry? In a valley? In a valley? And far really far, it's distant, right? So the point that I'm saying, here, that I'm trying to get across here, academic medicine and sometimes medicine in general is like an ivory tower, beautiful, well polished, but very distant. And that's why we believe that health fairs are such an extraordinary solution. Here you can see over the years, Jorge Ayala, who is, has been my right hand for many years. Um, on the right side, some of the old ones. On the left, upper, one of the most recent ones in Lafayette, Indiana, across different populations. We've done health fairs with diabetes. Our Fridays for many years were red day because it was the Stop Diabetes Day and everybody dressed on, on red. And we did a lot of work with the American Diabetes Association as well. So lesson number four, easy access. Go where the patients are. You heard many of the speakers today talking about home care, talking about telemedicine, talking about, now I'm talking about health fairs. We need to go where the patients are. Primary care physicians can and should do this. So, I wanted to tell you about the first one, Eagle Terrace. That was back in 2001, just before we opened. We saw 70 patients that day. After I left Wishart, I went there. And uh, Anna Hill and Veronica Guerrero and another gentleman by name Leal helped us. Um, we diagnosed a mass, we diagnosed diabetes, we diagnosed hypertension. They didn't have access to a doctor. And we, can, we could canalize them then to the county hospital or to other health facilities in town. And um, since then, we, I remember the Marion County prostate screening bus. We took it everywhere, Elkhart, Rensselaer, um, Evansville. It was a lot of fun. So um, a clear message is also important here is we tell people who otherwise have no access, we tell them, you count. You are important to us. We can bring all these resources because you matter. And that, just that little aspect, can be really the beginning of healing. This one, super docs. On the left, with COVID brought a lot of challenges to us in, in healthcare. Many people talked about the burnout, but there was another face of that coin. And in a few minutes, we'll hear from one of the leaders of the management of the pandemic, Dr. Jerome Adams, who took on, on his shoulders to convey the message to really be um, a catalyst for all the information and resources to, to, com to combat this virus. So in, in examples like Dr. Adams tell us, many of the doctors felt, hey, we're important again. We can make a difference through the coronavirus. Yes, there was burnout when you worked in an ICU, but at the same time, you could be a person that could share this important knowledge on vaccines, on testing, on isolation, all of that. So band of saviors. So, oops, lesson number five is effective healers need to be healthy and feel fulfilled. That is very clear. A frustrated, depressed, anxious, rushed doctor cannot be an effective healer, period. Or provider, or nurse practitioner, physical therapist, or psychologist cannot be an effective healer. 61% of the nurses are concerned about burnout stable numbers from 2012 and all of these years around 50 percent of doctors at some point feel the burnout so what are the antidotes to that so one for primary care doctors more autonomy we depend a lot either from what insurance company says what the hospital 
leadership has. We need our PCPs to be more autonomous. We need less administrative burden. Report here, MIPS there, um, all of these forms. They are not medicine. We need the right people, the smart people to do those. Doctors need to be taking care of people. And alternative activities, embrace physical and intellectual activities as well. And the most important for me, a sense of purpose. One of the big lessons for me over the past 20 years of taking care of the patients that we do is that there's always, I can never go to bed without thinking, wow, this was great. We made a difference. That sense of purpose. The next one, that's anybody, can, who can name these two artists? It's a little blurry. Anybody knows who those artists are? Youngsters, come on guys. Middle scene, nobody. On the left, what is it? Alicia Keys on the left, excellent. And then Andra Day is the one on the right. There's a song called I'll Rise Up, which I love. And there's an uh, incredible performance at the Radio City Hall in New York with a big choir of about 200 people. It's so powerful. But I always remember that verse. All we need is hope, and for that, we have each other. Lesson number six is the doctor-patient relationship is foundationally a human experience. We're not talking about AI. We loved technology. Today we talk about video capsule. We talk about imaging of a carotid artery, which, all these coils. It's wonderful. The technology has made patients' life better. But at the core of the practice of medicine, foundationally, is a human experience. It is not a reimbursement type of practice. It is not an academic exercise. It is not a requirement to go through your day and fulfill your work day, or just a strictly professional relationship. It has to be professional, but not strictly so. So stories, understanding the families, talk about hobbies, that is not only fair talk in a practice, in, in, when you interview a patient, they're nece absolutely necessary. Shared challenges, many times, I have shared with my patients, raising kids, in a new country, being an immigrant, um, challenges of the parents coming and not having enough activities to enjoy. Those, and I share those, those challenges with, with my patients because it's a shared experience. We're all on this together. And then the message here is replace the I, it, I, the doctor, it, the patient, with the I, thou, or I, you. Really personal and that concept of a team, when we are talking about management of chronic illnesses, diabetes, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, we always mention in our clinic, we are a team. We're on this together. Yes, I have some knowledge to testing and medications and um, biopsies or surgery, but you have all the power of changing risk factors, diet, nutrition, exercise, keeping yourself active. So that's lesson number six. Lesson number seven. And this is where I think is the main message. PCPs, primary care providers, are in the business of ruling in. What does that mean? We are experts in our urgent cares, in our emergency rooms, in the business of ruling out. We are experts on th exactly, I can tell you, what you don't have. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I can tell you with 100% certainty what you don't have. I come with chest pain, you don't have an aneurysm, you don't have a myocardial infarction, you don't have cardiac amyloidosis, you don't have a cardiac myxoma, you don't have aortic stenosis that is critical. We're perfect. Yes, 100%. Uh, doctor, uh, what do I have? And I can tell you that you don't have this, and this information you can take and make an appointment. Have you heard that? Have you seen that? that primary care doctors don't have that luxury. They, they, patients come with questions, with needs. We need to solve them. We need to solve them in that sacred temple called the consultation room. That is, that is our job. And then I wanted to tell you this, now that we talk about value-based medicine, which is a very, very important concept, uh, usually uh, used here in, the, in, in this country for reimbursement purposes. 
But I think value-based medicine was invented in the 19th century with that incredible phrase that we all remember, right? To cure sometimes, Dr. Romero, right? To relieve often and to comfort always. That's an old adage, I, 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 and it helps me. So when I'm, in the, and, and that's not for a philosophical discussion. Every encounter that we have as physicians, that's what we need to have in mind. Comfort always. Terminal cancer, oh yeah, we can comfort. We can give information. We can remember dangers are important when you're in hospital, right? Uh, you have um, depression, okay. Alejandro was saying, connection. Do you have this contact with a pastor, or this contact with, in, in your community, sports? Connect people. Um, so, yes, and I'm not saying please, don't misunderstand me, I love science. I love SSRIs, SNRIs, all the atypical antidepressants, ketamine when it's necessary, transcranial magnetic stimulation for patients with refractory depression. That is real, there's real benefits there, but it's not the only answer. So, the immense value of primary care doctors is this ruling in diagnosis. Oh, okay, what happened there? Where's Julio Sanchez? Say hi. <laughs> Julio Sanchez, um, you probably know, I, I already mentioned, we didn't close our clinic one single day during COVID. We had a COVID clinic and we had the non-COVID clinic. This man has broad, sturdy, resistant shoulders. He took onto himself to lead the efforts for caring for this population. Uh, when every other clinic was closing, when everybody sometimes leaving late, right? Trying to use the evidence base that we have, even if limited. Um, Julio took into that. And I remember, he's not a friend of, of meetings. Someone has called him before a mysterious captain, one of my friends here. Yeah, uh, he, he, he's, he doesn't like me, big meetings. And I, I wonder how you feel today now when I'm saying this. But um, he said the following, I firmly believe that the Alivio model can share practical lessons for a more effective and fulfilling primary care in America. That was your statement, I kept it here. And I truly believe that. With the lessons that I have shared with you, multiple services under one roof, extended hours, communication between providers and ancillary staff, varied sources of reimbursement, and keep education, community service, and research as necessary complements of clinical practice. Thank you, Julio, for that. And to our youth, there's some YIQ students here, Young Innovators Quest. Um, that's an organization that deals with, um, motivates students to get into STEM fields. And I tell you, beware if you're try trying to think of a healthcare profession. You just heard, you can, it's long hours, many years, you are still studying and you're, all your friends in IT and other fields are, are making money and having fun and taking pictures for Instagram. Uh, and you're in medical school or dental school or all these really, really big efforts. But I tell you, beware also that you will have the risk, and this is quote unquote, of connecting with others at the closest possible human level. You can save life, you can enrich them, and like one of our speakers say, you can guide them to adapt to the challenges. You can help a whole community. So I wanna thank Alivio for these 20 years. It's been these seven brief lessons. Lessons that we've learned from Columbus, Indiana, where Jorge started that clinic, or from Lafayette, Indiana, where Yalit is leading that effort on the left, or in Alivio West with Gerardo is leading that other effort. Uh, and we think, we hope that for the next 20 years, many more of these clinics will, will be in the state of Indiana, maybe in other states. We have a doctor visiting from out of the state who's looking at our model. Uh, but always keeping all these principles, these seven principles that I just mentioned. And I'll leave you with this quote. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was very special. Now, the main dish, as if that wasn't, right? We have so many lectures. Main course, Dr. Jerome Adams. We're so proud of his presence here. Thank you, Jerome, for being here. Dr. Adams. When I, when I think Surgeon General of the United States of America, my God, <laughs> that's incredible. He didn't say Attorney General. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey. Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're better looking than that, that other guy. <laughs> um, just, just briefly, a little anecdote here. Um, I'm very proud of saying this. Uh, Sean Kiefer was the chief of staff of, of Governor Pence, and he was looking at different potential um, candidates for commissioner of health of the state. Rafael Sanchez, who's a great friend, called me and said, hey, would you be interested in being interviewed? I said, oh, come on, man. I, I, I don't know much about public service. Anyway, I went to the interview, and uh, I knew that someone else was interviewed uh, by Sean, and so glad that you were picked as, as the, our commissioner. The, the work that Dr. Adams did there was incredible, particularly, remember, with Clark County. Mm -hmm. So please tell us about that when, when, when you have a chance. And then I'm going to leave the microphone for you. Are, are you do you have the, OK, good. So then if you can tell us a little bit about your history, and I'm going to ask also Dr. Virginia Kane to join us, and Dr. Alejandro Haddad, <laughs> Dr. Alex Haddad, and hopefully we'll have. But we want to start with a conversation about if you can tell us about your history. Mm -hmm. Some words about the pandemic, what happened. Oh, come, come on up, come on up. Come on, come on. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and um, the tr as, as we transition to this new phase, what do you suggest, what do you recommend, what do you, can you tell us? Later, if you can tell us about academic and your new role, okay? Thank you. Fantastic, well, well hello everyone. Hello. Everyone doing okay? Uh, I came in earlier, and there have been some great sessions, so uh, I know you're all stimulated, but everyone, why don't you just stand up for a second? Okay, everyone yeah. just stand up, stretch out, <laughs> because uh, that's the problem at these conferences. We talk about health and well-being, and then we sit all day long. You know? <laughs> you need to get up, stretch around, get the blood flowing. Okay, well, all right. Some well, dancing, too. <laughs> well, uh, we, hey, we're going to dance later, right? <laughs> no, it, it, it's really fantastic to be here, and... Uh, uh, Dr. Haddad, I loved your talk. It was just fantastic. It was validating for me to hear you say many of the things that I've said before. And I like to think in questions, too. So I'm going to challenge you all with, with two quick questions, because the, uh, the theme of the conference is a model of health care for the 21st century. And uh, you were challenged earlier. Raise your hand if you think the US has the best health care in the world. Wow, not a single per OK, we got two over there. OK, we have two. So um, let me ask you this question. If you were diagnosed with cancer and needed a liver transplant, is there anywhere else in the world you'd want to be besides at Johns Hopkins or Mayo Clinic or right here at Indiana University? Anywhere in the world you'd rather be? No. No? So in many ways, the US does deliver the best health care in the world. Uh, I'd argue it's just incredibly inequitable and incredibly downstream. And this is someone who's speaking um, as the husband of a wife who was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma when um, I was Surgeon General of the United States. You talked about your cancer journey. Again, nowhere in the world I'd rather be than in the United States. And that's important for us to understand because when we talk about health care, uh, we often um, are speaking different languages. Uh, and we need to understand what we're talking about and who our audience is and uh, who we're talking to and what are the metrics we're tracking. Because if you're speaking to, to someone whose wife was just treated with cancer here in the United States with immunotherapy, which you heard us talk about before, ipilimumab, you heard about that earlier, that's, that's what my wife was treated with. Metastatic melanoma and now she is in remission, um, praise God. And, and If we'd been in most of the rest of the world, she would not have gotten that treatment and might not be here today. And if you are talking to someone who's in that situation, you say the US has terrible health care, I'm, I'm going to shut down. So we have to understand who we're talking to and we have to define it. Um, the, the next point I'd bring up is that uh, 
I think when we talk about health care, and you mentioned this earlier, um, we're talking about the wrong thing because the U.S. doesn't have a health care system, uh, in my opinion. What we have is a sick reimbursement system. Right. What we do is we wait for people to get sick, and then what do we do in the United States? We don't do what the studies consistently show us will restore and maintain health. We do what we get paid to do. Um, I'm an anesthesiologist. I uh, have been involved in hundreds of toe, foot, ankle amputations in my life uh, for diabetes. And guess what? I got paid for every single one of them. I got paid for every single one of them. You know what I didn't get paid for a single time? To talk to those patients about diet, about exercise, to ask them what their community looked like and whether or not they were able to do the things that would prevent that toe amputation from turning into a foot amputation, from turning into an ankle amputation, from turning into you know, an upper leg amputation. Didn't get paid for that. So we just keep on chopping off toes and feet and legs. That's the US health care system. And this is something that I've, uh, I, I've seen happen over the years, but you asked about um, me to tell you a little bit about myself. It's interesting, I'm a dad now. Um, I've got a 17, a 16, and a 12-year-old, and, uh, and they give me fits. Uh, I was the first Surgeon General in modern times to have school-age kids. So while we were dealing with vaping and e-cigarettes, my kids were literally calling me from school saying, Dad, there's kids vaping in the bathroom. As we're contemplating whether or not we're going to shut down schools for COVID, this wasn't me, 69-year-old C. Everett Coop, talking about it. This was me having my wife on the other end of the phone saying, you better not shut down our schools because I don't know what we're gonna do with these kids. I mean, real conversations, real trade-offs. But I think about the differences between my kids now, and we live in Fishers. There's two different hospitals. There's a St. Vincent's and a, um, and a IUER within five minutes of our house. Um, I think about when I grew up, and uh, when I was in second grade, it's when I took the first of three helicopter rides in my life. Um, uh, the other helicopter rides were when I was Surgeon General of the United States. One when Puerto Rico had the three category five hurricanes and we had to go over and survey the damage from those hurricanes. But my first helicopter ride in my life was when I was in second grade. And uh, I was in a rural community and uh, I have asthma. And uh, I had an asthma attack so severe that my rural community couldn't um, treat me appropriately. They couldn't keep me alive. And you, you, you both talked about the fact that you go to hospitals for intensive care, for emergency care. Um, they thought I was going to die. So they put little eight-year-old me in a helicopter, told my parents, you can't, we don't have room for you on the helicopter. Flew me to Children's Hospital in Washington, DC, um, because I was in status asthmaticus to save my life. And uh, black boys are six times more likely to die of asthma than anyone else out there. We know children of color are more likely to die from asthma than white children are. This is not something that I had to learn as a physician in medical school. This is something I understood from how I grew up. I knew even back then that our opportunities for health we're not there. Our ability to deal with the challenges in our life, as you mentioned, um, we're not the same in rural Southern Maryland as they are for my kids in Fishers, Indiana. Uh, many of you know the story about my brother, and uh, this is another prop that I, uh, that I have. My, uh, my brother, uh, while I was Surgeon General of the United States standing at a podium next to the President, the most powerful man in the world, my brother was sitting in a prison cell about 25 miles away due to crimes he'd committed to support his addiction. And uh, th that juxtaposition is, is, is just, it's still, every time I think about it, I just, wow, wow. And we like to talk about bad parents and bad upbringing. We grew up in the same house, same parents, same opportunities. Uh, and his brother was the Surgeon General of the United States. And we still couldn't prevent it from happening. And what did I learn from that? Well, I learned that, that um, none of us can do it as individuals. We can't even do it as families. That it takes truly a community of support to help people go in the right direction versus to go in the wrong direction. And for me, when I look back through my life, uh, 
I uh, often think about the mentors, the sponsors, the people who, um, by the grace of God, came into my life and helped me out and guided me. Um, but that wasn't through my own doing. Yes, I worked hard. Yes, I had God-given uh, gifts. But if I hadn't had those people and those opportunities in my life, I would not be here today as Surgeon General of the United States. I might be sitting in a jail cell just as my brother was sitting in a jail cell. And so when I became Surgeon General of the United States, uh, I tried to emphasize prevention and wellness and building healthy communities. Uh, and one of the first things I did was put out an naloxone advisory, um, calling on more people to, to know about and to carry naloxone uh, because uh, it's a drug that can save a life. Once upon a time, people were dying of CPR, or dying of, of heart attacks just dying because uh, they'd have a heart attack and the ambulance couldn't get there in time. And uh, uh, we taught pretty much the whole country to be able to uh, administer CPR. You can't go in a room now, and I've done this, I kid you not, dozens if not hundreds of times, um, non-medical rooms. I mean, I know we're, we're in a stacked audience here, but uh, I go into a room and I ask people, raise your hand if you know CPR. You can't go in a room of more than 10 people and not find someone who knows CPR. That didn't used to be the case. Well, now you're more likely to encounter someone having an opioid overdose in that front lobby than you are to encounter someone having a heart attack. But how many of you have naloxone on you? We need to, to normalize um, addiction and treatment and harm reduction and recovery. And I tried to do that as Surgeon General of the United States because I believe stigma kills more people than heroin. Stigma keeps people in the shadows. It keeps people from admitting they have a problem. It keeps people from being willing to ask for help. It keeps people from being willing to offer help. And, uh, and again, even when I talk about naloxone, I use it as a bridge to talk about the upstream predictors of health and wellness. Um, the fact that, uh, that my brother, again, in that same rural community, didn't have treatment for anxiety and depression. So he self-medicated with tobacco, with alcohol, with uh, marijuana, and then one day someone gave him a pill and he describes it as a light switch going off. But that happened because we didn't have those opportunities. And, and in that neighborhood, and particularly in communities of color, even if we had those opportunities, there was stigma against raising your hand and saying, I got a problem, because we're told, suck it up, pull yourself up by your, up by your bootstraps. We need to, to normalize, again, uh, the idea that, that it's okay not to be okay. And we know that, that many of us are not okay. Um, over the past several years, we've seen, over last year, we saw opioid overdoses, deaths um, skyrocket, up 30%, um, up 40% in black and brown communities. 40% in black and brown communities. We saw uh, in young people, suicidality skyrocket. And again, particularly so in black and brown communities. These are the things that we need to talk about. These are the things that are happening outside of our hospital walls. And you both talked about this. You talked about the fact, and, and I have a slide, um, but I didn't want to bring slides today because I knew you all were going to be tired at the end of the day. Um, but it's that slide that many of you have seen uh, that shows uh, what we spend on health. And, and we spend um, between um, eight and nine and a half cent, uh, 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 85 to, to, to 95 cents of every dollar we spend is spent on health care. Remember, sick reimbursement. But that's only 10 to 20 percent of what actually helps us be healthy. So what, what helps us be healthy? It's things like transportation. It's things like paid time off if your kid gets sick. You know, I talked about my asthma. Every time I got sick, my mother had to take off work. So uh, we talk about the inability of, of, of us to be able to staff um, different places now. How many of those mothers and fathers, but if we're going to be honest, mothers do still do the majority of the, the child care and child rearing, are checked out because they have a sick kid at home, a sick kid that wouldn't be sick if we actually had the supports that they needed in their, uh, in their communities. Uh, a job, a job that pays a living wage. I talked about my brother. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be addicted to heroin. My brother didn't. No one does. My brother goes into treatment. Um, 
and it's usually treatment that is um, disconnected far away from, uh, from his family and his home because we don't have resources in our community. Then he gets released from treatment and uh, he goes back to our community. And our community is not a recovery friendly community. He can't get a job or if he gets a job, it's making minimum wage at McDonald's or Burger King. He doesn't have transportation, so he's relying on my um, 75 year old parents to drive him back and forth to work um, all the time. And eventually, he gets tired of, of, of feeling like he's running on a treadmill and going backwards. And so he goes to hang out with his same old friends, falls back into addiction, and the cycle continues over and over again. Uh, I remember talking to someone who was in recovery, long-term recovery, when I was in Philadelphia, and he said the number one predictor of whether or not someone's going to be successful in recovery, whether or not they have a good job. And you may have never heard someone say that's a predictor for recovery before, but we can get you clean. Right? They talk about treatment as being the easy part. We can get you clean. The challenge is once you leave and you go back into the community, are you in a recovery-friendly community where you have meaning in your life? And in the United States especially, we derive our meaning from our employment. You get meaning from, from uh, flipping burgers and, and making fries? Well, you can. I don't want to dismiss that. I flipped burgers and made fries when I was young. But I also knew that there was the potential for me to do more if I wanted to do more. My brother doesn't have that opportunity. So he looks at, am I going to make fries for the rest of my life for 10 bucks an hour? Um, or am I going to go back and self-medicate again? So, so I, I just say all that to set the stage for you because um, I want to finish with, with one more point, and then I want to get into Q&A, and I hope you all have some questions, and I hope you get to take advantage of some of these uh, wonderful folks we have up here and ask, ask them questions. But uh, many, of, many of my friends and family, many of you all, quite frankly, ask the question, how could you work for that man? How, how, could, how could you be there? How would you, how, wh wh why did you stay there? Well, I know, yeah, I know. Dr. Kane, Dr. Kane is one of my longtime mentors, and she always, she, sometimes she slapped me in the back of the head. She'd be like, watch yourself, Jerome. Watch what you say and don't get in trouble. She keeps me out of trouble. Um, but, 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 you know, uh, there's a saying, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Yes. And um, knowing how I grew up, and knowing that in many cases, I was the only person of color in the room, in the room, the only person who'd grown up poor, the only person who'd grown up rural, the only person with asthma, the only person whose brother was in jail, in the room. How could I not be there? How could I not stay there? Yeah. And uh, I see. Yeah. And I say that to you all because um, one of the biggest frustrations that I had and continue to have is, is with politics. It's within our, with our inability to be able to have a rational conversation about women's health, about guns, about drugs and harm reduction, about who should have access to health care and who should pay for it, about all these things. And I hope that, that Olivio can be an example for, for folks out there that, yes, you, we can do better. We can be better if we put the patient in our communities first instead of putting reimbursement and politics first. So I could go on for forever, but again, I just wanted to give you a taste of, of how my mind operates because it's easy for you to look at that caricature that you see on Fox News or on uh, NBC, you know see me on Sean Hannity or see me on Rachel Maddow and, and uh, you get this caricature in your mind of who you think I am. But, but I was there fighting for you all. Uh, I truly was. Uh, I remember being in the Situation Room and we were talking about shutting down. And, uh, and I said, well, there's what the science says, but what happens if people who don't have health insurance and who are living paycheck to paycheck can't pay their bills and they get evicted. And uh, that's where the rent protections came from um, in the pandemic. And again, a lot of things that you can say negative about the former administration, but a lot of those conversations and a lot of the things that came out to protect people happened because I, and there were other people at the table, and because you all spoke up 
and help people understand. Dr. Kane, uh, she got, she's got a thousand jobs, but one of them is uh, being part of the National Medical Association. And the National Medical Association really pushed hard to make sure we were collecting demographic data about who was being impacted by the pandemic and that we were thinking about those social determinants of health, the things that Olivia Health Center actually addresses uh, for folks. And that we were also thinking about, and, and I'll, I'll close with this, we've accumulated a health debt over the last two years, and it's not a COVID health debt, it's the missed cancer screenings, the missed diabetes care, the uh, missed childhood vaccinations, uh, the missed mammographies, um, all those things that, that got missed because of the pandemic, because people were scared to come in for care, because places were closed down. So I wanna applaud you all, as Alfredo did, for keeping open safely. Safely was key. Keeping open um, so that people didn't miss care when they, uh, when they otherwise needed that care. Because here's the dirty little secret. More people die every year from cancer, from um, uncontrolled hypertension, from uh, other chronic diseases, then it died at the peak of COVID. More people died last year from uncontrolled hypertension than died from COVID. And this will continue to happen, and we're actually gonna see it accelerate. So we have to learn to walk and chew gum at the same time. We've gotta help people get vaccinated, get boosted, um, learn to, to understand when it's appropriate to take certain measures to protect themselves from COVID, but we can't let it be at the expense of paying attention to those other issues um, that we know are impacting them. And we can't let it be at the expense of prevention and health and wellness. So I'm gonna shut up now, um, but uh, uh, thank you all for the opportunity. Before we open for questions here, I wanted to ask a question to the three of you. How do we get these talented individuals here in hospitals and all physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, to be more involved so they can have a voice. How do we get them? Because we know what's going, what's going on with the patients. You know what happened to you earlier. How do we get our colleagues more involved in what you do, in what you do, and on behalf of our patients? I'd love for Dr. Kane to start. Oh. We, we've been talking for a while. They've heard from us. <laughs> no, it's a, um, it's, it's a very, it's a very difficult um, situation, but I'm very fortunate to be in a community that at least for our Latino X population, uh, they seem to be very capable of advocating for themselves. And, and I say that because at the start of this COVID epidemic, um, at least our health department, you know, we we're patting ourselves on the back and thought we were doing a incredible job with our testing and our vaccinations. And I had about 20 to 25 uh, Latino organizations send a letter to the Mayor Hotset and myself to say, well, are you aware that we have such a significant number of undocumented immigrants to our city who cannot even read? It's not just health literacy, they can't read. So how can they register for a test mm -hmm. when it's, uh, even if it's in Spanish, they can't read it? And how do they know where to go to get vaccinated or even understand the safety profile related to the benefits and the other things that they need to be concerned about um, if they can't um, understand English or Spanish. And I say this is that we have to, um, you're going to have to be, I guess the word I want to say, if you wait for the invitation for someone to invite you to come in and um, uh, provide services, it will never happen. <laughs> You, you have to be aggressive, and you have to invite yourself in. And I'm gonna tell you that story about that, but I think that's so critical for all of us. And let me say, we have some beautiful marathons here where we got 
people who were Spanish speaking from so many of our business sector to come and do marathons, registering over a thousand people a day with a callathon. Mm -hmm. Just call, you give us information on the telephone, we'll register you. Uh, we'll come and you can come and get vaccinated, but you do it in places where it's convenient yes. for them, places where they're comfortable with, where they normally go, where they're in their own social works. And so I think until we're able to provide resources to the very people who are in your social networks, we can't make a difference. So I'm happy to say that we gave over $1.3 million to community-based organizations to do that community outreach, to do that community education. And I want to announce this today, that when you look at our vaccination rates, if you're between the ages of 25 and 60, over 90% of our Latino ex population are vaccinated in Marion County. We have the highest vaccination rates in that age group compared to any other racial and ethnic population. And I honestly have to say, couldn't have done it without you. So we need you to advocate for yourselves. We need you to get out there, but you also know you have to be there where they're making policy decisions too. Mm -hmm. So if you're with a healthcare system, try to figure out how you can be on those committees that make decision making for that healthcare system. And then the other piece of course is you have to continue to advocate uh, for your patients if you hear something that's wrong. When we had the H1N1 epidemic, we were saying to ourselves, wow, we have so many Latino families that need to get the vaccine for H1N1. And even though we had community health centers, because I worked at Wishart too, um, and I still work at Asganazi, um, but you can't call and get into a community health center, you know, in the time frame you always need to do that. And I said, wow, what are we going to do? You know, hey, we're going to call this man, Alfredo. <laughs> we would call and say, Alfredo, I got to get a family over to you this afternoon because we got that time frame that we've got to get them vaccinated and they've had exposure. And he would take every patient we referred and not charge them. Mm. Now, I'm sorry, you might have had partners and I'm not supposed to tell you this, <laughs> say this out loud, but he would take every patient we referred and we referred a lot of patients and this is when it's a family and you know you don't have time to work out all those logistics and everything in terms of reimbursement you've got to care for the very people because they're like your family yeah. so but continue to uh, work with us okay help us to identify what the resources are and let's get rid of the stigma because one thing unlike for others, people of color, we face a significant amount of tension and stress unlike our white counterparts. Mm -hmm. we, we, we experience. So over time, that stress, um, you know, your hormonal imbalances that take place with that, um, you, you, you experience an enormous a challenge that a lot of different racial and ethnic populations yep. don't always experience, especially in our pregnancies and in other health conditions. Uh, I just want to foot stomp a couple of points Dr. Kane made. Number one, um, she talked about literacy, and it got me thinking about other barriers to health. And you, we talk about these technological advances, all these new opportunities, and they are great opportunities. There's been a 38 fold increase in telehealth um, since the beginning of the pandemic, 38 fold. CMS was paying for 10,000 telehealth visits a week pre-pandemic, it was up to a million um, a week at the peak of the pandemic. It's come back down, but it's 38 fold higher. That said, broadband access is a social determinant of health. Uh, it's, it's nice to say you can access all these things on your phone, um, 
even going back to the pandemic, when we looked at schooling um, and who was able to do homeschooling versus, uh, versus who was not. Uh, we need to make sure everyone has the tools to be able to appropriately take advantage of this new digital world and this new digital health world, or else we're gonna see disparities actually continue to, uh, uh, to, to increase. But you asked, what would I say to you all? Um, did you wanna jump in? And, no, yeah. I'm gonna let What I would say um, very quickly uh, is that, number one, oh, oh, he's got a microphone, oh, okay, so that, okay, that's okay, for you. Okay, so um, okay. Data, business, and politics. So uh, in March of 2020, February, March of 2020, the president asked me how many patients uh, in the United States have COVID right now? I don't know, Mr. President. How many uh, uh, hospital beds do we have available? I don't know, Mr. President. How many ventilators uh, uh, do we have with people on ventilators? I don't know, Mr. President. And then he said something not so nice to me. Um, but, 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 the proof that, but, but, but the point is, that now you can go to the Marion County or the Indiana State Department of Health website and find out how many people have COVID in the last 24 hours, how many people are on ventilators, how many people are in hospitals. That data, if you can't measure it, you can't move it. Uh, and, and COVID showed us the power of real-time data, but we need to continue to push to have that data available and we need to have it broken down demographically. One of the challenges was even once we got it, we st then, then it's okay, how many um, uh, people in our Hispanic and Latinx populations are getting COVID? Um, what does this look like in the black community? What does this look like in the indigenous and, and Native American communities? Because it looked different and it popped up in different ways in all of those communities. Uh, if we don't collect that data, then we can't actually direct resources to where they're needed the most. So that's one thing you can do is demand that data broken down demographically. Um, number two, we have to bring the business community into this. And why do I say that? Do you know when the Hispanic and Latinx community started to get paid attention to in COVID? It's when our meat and food supply chains started to shut down. Why? Because we knew that in the meat packing plants, and in the agricultural facilities, they were mostly, mostly employing immigrants and people of color, people from the Hispanic and Latinx populations. And I'm telling you this, I'm at the national level and that's when it was like, oh, we, we don't have food on the shelves. Remember when meat, people forget this, remember when, when there was no meat on the shelves? It was a couple of weeks there where it was like, oh, S-H-I-T, what's happening here? And they were like, well, um, these meatpacking plants um, are, are, are employing individuals who are living 20 people to a, um, to a house. And, and COVID is going in and it's just spreading like wildfire. And all of a sudden we had to pay attention. And I say that um, not with any um, pride or accolades because that, that shouldn't be the reason that, that we pay attention to people's health issues. But I'm telling you from a practical standpoint, that's what motivates people, especially in the United States, but, but across the world to act. If the business community says, hey, we need this from a workforce perspective, then they will act. And so we need to bring them in because I would rather have the head of the largest business in your community out advocating for a health intervention than to have the top doctor in your community out advocating for a health intervention. I, I've been saying for forever, we need to pay attention to social determinants of health. Um, and. Um, People ignored me, why? Because it's that doctor, he just goody two shoes, he wants us all to eat apples and exercise and tell us that everything we do is bad. Dave Ricks, CEO of Eli Lilly, um, a few weeks ago, said the exact same thing I've been saying for 10 years, it made national news. It didn't make it because he was uh, saying it from a health perspective, it made it because he was one of the largest employers in Indiana saying businesses are not gonna come to Indiana anymore if we can't maintain a healthy workforce. Uh, the final point I'd make, I said da data business politics. As much as I hate politics, and as much as we need to recognize our biases and try to see through and around our biases and be willing to work with people across the aisle, we also have to realize politics is an inextricable part of health. So I got asked, uh, I was in Switzerland and I was on a panel and I got asked to explain the US healthcare system and they gave me like five minutes. And, 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 you know, and, and so I actually told them a story because I like stories. I said, in the last, uh, Berlin, Germany, Paris, France, these are two 
cities, two major US cities, um, in two different countries, two completely different countries. They speak different languages. And in the last great world war, World War II, they tried to obliterate each other off the face of the earth. These two places are so distinct. They don't talk the same language. They're different countries. And they hated each other so much in our lifetimes that they tried to wipe each other off the face of the earth. But yet, when you look at top health issues like women's health, like drug policy, like gun policy, like universal access to health care, those two places that are so different are more aligned than Dallas, Texas, and Boston, Massachusetts. Am I wrong? We need to understand culture and politics are an inextricable part of health and health policy, particularly in the United States. And again, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So you need to get involved. You need to talk to your legislators. You need to get involved um, at a local level. You need to help them understand your issues. And you need to make the business case for why what you're asking for is important so that you can sway those political discussions. Because if you don't, you're going to continue to get eaten alive. As much as I would like to say we need to take the politics out of health, and we, need to tr and we do need to try to, I also need to tell you honestly, you can't take the politics completely out of health. And so you got to learn how to play the game, and you got to be at the table. Yeah. Alex, <clears throat> and then we have Alex, yes, too. Yes, uh, very quickly. Uh, First Alex. Uh, yeah, um, I was reflecting, listening to you, and it's a privilege to be here. And I was looking at what you can read there, and I was remembering that I'm a grandfather now. And Martha and I uh, had a magical week uh, last week with our two grandchildren who were sent to us to learn how to sleep over. <laughs> okay? So it's wonderful. OK, mm -hmm. wonderful. How to sleep over, and you learned with grandpa and grandpa, grandma and grandpa. And I was hugging them, and I was thinking, the next generation. <laughs> What kind of world are we going to give them? So uh, Alfredo, you said, how do we get our colleagues to be involved? How do we? And I was thinking, I wish the pandemic was enough of an existential threat. It's not clear yet. It has, it's not over, by the way. Yeah. Um, to prevent one of our biggest problems as a species, we are talking about a species here which is the risk of forgetting. Mm. Okay. It's very easy to forget that there were shelves with no food. It's mm -hmm. easy to forget that we had to shut down places. It's easy. All the things we went through while we faced the biggest existential threat in recent memory. Because an existential threat is something that threatens our existence. And for the first time, we saw that. Um, now, our children, I was hugging these kids. I said, there is a pandemic still going, and there are multiple pandemics of mental illness as a result of the biological viral pandemic, a pandemic of bankruptcies, a pandemic of mistrust, a pandemic of disbelief, a pandemic because ideas, behaviors, and emotions are contagious. Mm -hmm. Now we are seeing the social contagion of the non-viral things. But guess what? The Intergovernmental Panel issued a report last year on climate change. We may have crossed the line already of no return. There may be nothing we can do, by the way, about climate change. We are seeing record temperature. And those things don't seem to be strong enough for us to actually believe that we are at risk and that our children and our grandchildren may not have a future. And, and, and that is a big, a big problem. And then we have pollution. And it's not only particles from burning fossil fuels, but plastics, microplastics and nanoplastics. And I remember, I gave a lecture for an infertility conference, and I discovered data that I hope we know, we, we are more aware of than we are. Since 1973 to 2013, a reduction of 50% in sperm count. Okay, 50%. If what has happened continues, and it's continuing, by the way, we have now a nanoplastics and microplastics in utero. Mm -hmm. okay? It is expected that by 2045, there will be zero sperm, okay? no sperms. This is extinction level <laughs> threats. Okay? okay, so what do we need is my question. Yes, then it's, it's okay. And then add a nuclear war that may happen. 
probably for the first time for us as a generation, we are contemplating the possibility of that. A financial crisis, by the way, coming, another existential threat. Hmm? Okay, so, so what's the good news? Ah. <laughs> so, so the good news is that we are having this conversation, and I know there are questions here. We need to appeal, and I'm going to say it very quickly, English has two sources of words. We have Anglo-Saxon and German and Latin. And we can almost mention any term, any word, from the two sources. So I mentioned trust. That's a German part. I like the Latin counterpart, which is confianza. Okay? Mm, confianza. Confianza, like in English, okay, is confidence. But we give in Spanish a different flavor to it, mm. because we recognize the root co, that in Latin means with. Mm. We need more withness. We talk about community, that has co. We talk about communicating, that has co. Cooperating, conversations. Co, okay? co, co, co. And, and, and confidence and confianza in Spanish means to be able to see something with each other. Okay? Because once we do that, we can believe that that is real. So how could we build confidence in the Spanish sense, confianza? trust that implies a social emotion of, that, that is produced by the belief that together we can do what seems impossible. And I think this is the time. And, um, and hopefully we'll raise to the challenge and our grandchildren will be able to look at us and say, thank you guys, you did it. Okay? And not what the F happened there. You're a psychopath. Mm -hmm. hmm? Yep. We are the first generation in our lifetimes who can't honestly look our kids in the eye and say we're leaving you a better world than the mm -hmm. one that was left to us. And that is, that is not an opinion, that is by a number of objective stats when you look at um, life expectancy, um, when, you, when you look at, uh, again, the planet and pollution, when you look at the trajectory of a, a number of scientific variables, we are not leaving our children a better world than the one our parents um, and maybe, rest. Jerome, that self-interest, which seems to be a very strong driver for humans, might be the answer. Exactly. Okay? <laughs> it's thinking about our children and our grandchildren and say, we cannot do that to them because we'll be doing it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. exactly. We'll see. Dr. Garrido? Yeah, yeah. So after, after hearing you, I'm not sure this question is relevant. I'm, uh, you know, these are a few of the things that stress me every day, thinking about a possible nuclear war, the plastics and what we're doing to the climate. Uh, I, I agree with you, what, what kind of world we live in. I was going to make a comment and I was going to ask a question for Dr. Adams. Uh, thank you for being here, Dr. Kane, thank you for being here. Alex, it has been a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, the comment is, there is a place where we can all go and make comments, it's called regulations.gov, mm -hmm which is it puts all the regulations in the United States uh, Senate and uh, the chambers. Uh, and anyone can go in and make a comment or ask questions. And this is a good way that any individual in the US can make an impact in policy in the US. One, two, we can, we can rely in our medical societies, AGS, AMA, mm -hmm. AAFP, yeah. ACP, and they all have groups of interest uh, for politics and policies. And this is another way we can. So that was my contribution for your question, Dr. Lopez. I, I want to stop you. And, and please don't sit down. I want you to finish. But I want you all to understand the importance of what, what he said. And it's something I didn't appreciate until I ran the State Department of Health. That's how important the regulatory and executive branches are. We all think about the legislative branches and passing laws and, and, pass, and passing legislation. Um, but they pass a law that says the health commissioner shall. Well, then the health commissioner shall or shall not, or shall decide how many people they put on this or how much money they use to fund it. And there is so much more leeway I've found in regulation than there is in legislation. And you've seen, again, number one, Congress is just completely dysfunctional. So you can't get any law passed um, anymore. Uh, but that's opened up the executive and, regu and regulatory um, mm. um, uh, branches to be even more powerful. And you've seen these wide swings 
um, when governors change or when presidents change and then agencies turn over in terms of what can and can't happen. But there are still processes to weigh in and people don't know about those processes. Correct. So it's important to weigh in when these rules, when these regulations are being made because it's just as and in many cases more impactful than when the laws itself are being written. And you may think that this uh, website is not monitored and is not followed, and it actually it is. It needs to be, every, every input needs to be answered. So you give it a few days and you may get an answer from the government on your question on regulation or your or covenant regulation. So the question I had is uh, the, the Latino segment of the population in the US, I'm talking about population a lot today. Population, Latino population uh, is the biggest minority in the United States, just over African Americans. 19% of the Latino population in the United States compared to 13% Correct. of blacks and African Americans Correct. in the United States. So now, that, that being said, Latinos are not a race. We are a conglomerate of races mm -hmm. that go under a cultural umbrella. Yes. There is black Latinos, there is people like me, a mix of everything else, there is white Latinos, there is uh, Asian descent Latinos, you know, it's just the culture. My question goes to how do we make sure that we are counted in every medical information, in every medical data that we have, there is always the white mm -hmm. and the African American. Mm -hmm. And we go over the Hispanic, which is the biggest minority, and it always upset me that we are not even counted and I, granted, I think this is something that has to do with immigration pay, probably, mm -hmm. but we are still here and we're still part of, part of, the, of the country, like, like you noted on the, on the uh, meatpacking plant, yeah. and we're part of the economy, so what can we do to be counted at least on healthcare and data? Uh, I'd let Dr. Kane take that one as it, because she, she is, she's the expert in, in this space. So Dr. Kane, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. So one of the major problems we have is, is that um, we know that you know that Latinos make up 19 percent of the United States, but a significant percentage of them also are undocumented, and so they're very concerned that if I give some information, especially to the government, this may result in the government trying to have me removed from an immunization standpoint. And I will honestly say it varies depending on what state you live in and depending on what city that you reside in. And uh, we have a lot of folks that, you know, they're, they're the single, they may be the single um, household income, one person for a whole generational family that's living in their household. And they can't afford, if they lose their paycheck, it impacts so many people in the household. So I think one of the things we, we have to do and what we had to do because people didn't always have the proper documentation and we have to also, you have to publicly and be able to say uh, we can provide a identification system for you where you don't have to fear that immigration is gonna knock on your door uh, in terms of of you being concerned about certain things. You also have to identify, um, I hate to say it, certain healthcare systems that you can go to and know that you're safe, yes. that you're receiving healthcare services. Everybody's not equal. Everybody's not equitable. So this is where um, we have to fill in providing that information for them. But at the other side of the coin, you still have to hit your state policy makers because on the national front, you really, you don't want it where you're having to go to each state or each city trying to fix this problem. You really want to fix it nationally. So that means you have to hit your policy makers and you've got to the number one thing, if I had to tell you what improves health outcome, education, education, education. I'm talking about education in the schools. I'm talking about your Latino population graduating from high school, going on to undergraduate school, 
Education is going to be the number one point of making a difference in the country, but also it's about voting power. It's voting power. You know, you can, you don't have to say nothing. You're powerful just from your vote. And you, we have to let people know, I'm unhappy with this uh, stance. I will, um, who was it? Uh, what's our, uh, our U.S. Senator? Um, yeah. Young. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person, I'll be honest with you, I go visit my state legislators and I go see them on Capitol Hill. And I, and I, I told um, Senator Young uh, that I thought more dollars should be residing in public health. And we need to have more services for social determinants of health. So he goes on to tell me, very smart, very, very intelligent. He goes on to tell me, well, the state should do more, providing more resources. I guess he knows about that billion dollar reserve we have somewhere in the state of Indiana. And I said, you know what, you are so right. I agree with you. Trust me, I do agree with you. But I pay a hell of a lot of taxes. And I think that some of my federal dollars should come back to me in the state of Indiana. We rank 48th in the country for public health, that we spend for public health dollars in the United States. 48th worse in terms of what we pay for public health. So why should my federal dollars be utilized in another state that I'm paying for? So I think we gotta get smart and be, he said, well, I didn't think about it that way. I said, well, I think you need to think about it that way. Now, if you, don't, you wanna fix it so I don't have to pay no federal taxes, then I'll be quiet about this. I won't say nothing else <laughs> or whatever. But since you're getting a heck of a lot of money from me, I think it should be spent here on the people that I feel those resources should be spent on. So I think we got to really start to learn how to articulate our arguments where they make sense. So culture climate, you talked about that. Well, do you know because of culture climate, the continent is temperature is warming so much, hey, we're not going to have fish in those streams and those lakes. They won't even be there for us, for people and populations to utilize. We got to understand Lake Mead in uh, Nevada. It's, it's a, a beautiful water reservoir. Three thirds of its water now is all gone. So we, if we don't start protecting our environment um, and understand what we mean by culture climate, so we got to explain it in a way that people understand it, uh, we have to continue to do this fight. I want to say, talk about Olivia really quickly because there's two different things that Dr. Kane mentioned that I want to footstop. Number one, we need to educate our citizens about the importance. It's easy, for, for, it's easy to come up with reasons why you shouldn't participate in different studies or give your demographic data. Unfortunately, uh, legitimate reasons that people have are well-founded reasons. We need to help them understand that when you don't give your data, and we just came out of the census in, in uh, 2020. Dr. Kane talked about voting power. That determines how much federal funding goes to your state. That determines how many legislators you get. There are states that lost legislators, that lost voting power because of it. It determines um, ultimately who's gonna be in charge to divvy up who gets that legislative power. And when people don't participate, then that's another 10 years, another decade that you've lost that funding that ability to be able to, uh, to, 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 to get that information. And on a state level, when Dr. Kane talks about public health funding, a lot of times that public health funding goes to places that are identified as having the greatest need. If we don't have good data collection to show that we have a need based on certain demographic variables, then we're not gonna get that data. So we need to help educate our citizenry, but we also need to create a trust point. And Dr. Kane said something, she said, that we have a 90% vaccination rate um, in our uh, um, Latino and Hispanic. Uh, and, and, and that happened because of you all, because of the trust you all have in the community. I, I mean, I used to run the State Department of Health. Um, I, I think, we're, I think they're, they're doing as good of a job as they can with, with, with limited resources. Um, but that said, the state can't take credit for that. Um, that is because there are partners like Olivio in the community 
that folks feel comfortable going to and getting vaccinated. And when they feel comfortable going and getting vaccinated, when there's that, tr that, that person with confiance in the middle who you can go to, then that's how you get people to give their demographic data. That's how you get people to get vaccinated. That's how you get people to overcome what in many cases are well-founded fears and concerns they have. Uh, for, uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for the opportunity. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna try to lighten up a little bit because this is almost like a doomsday conversation in a way of climate change and health. But um, if you actually look at the numbers, and this is something I've always had trouble to reconcile. In 1950, we would be living approximately 45 years. That was our expectancy of life. Hear that? 45 years. Today, it's 73 years. So in, 50, in 70 years, we increased our expectancy of life in 28 mm -hmm. years, something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, actually 30 years. Actually 30 yeah. years, okay, even better. And 25 of those 30 years was related to public health achievement. Yep. Exactly, exactly. So um, to that point, this is an achievement never heard of any species in this planet. The only one are animals in zoos that actually increase their expectancy of life just because availability of health, uh, vegetarian, veterinarian, and availability, availability of food. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to throw that data out there because not all is gray, not all is, 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 is in doomsday. The but first unfortunately, year, just, when you look at the opioid epidemic, yeah, the that, first we, year, we hit that peak and it started to come back down again with opioid overdoses. And I'm not, I'm, it's not doomsday, we, yeah. we, you're right. We, yeah. do, we do need to find some positives, but that's the challenge. And when yeah. you look at that data, we hit the apex a few years ago and we leveled off. You know, by three months, mm -hmm. by three months only, after 28 of increase. Yep. So you see the, the, the relationship. Exactly. It's extremely, so I, I always, uh, and I always tell this to my, my, my kids because I do want to have grandkids. <laughs> I want them to feel that this, human beings are extremely resilient. Mm -hmm. We have to be aware about this. Can you imagine our grandparents who were out of a depression in a second world world, if they would be okay. saying, what would they say in that moment that this, there was no viability? Yes. Yeah, my, my, grandpa, my grandparents would say, Notice how privileged you are, exactly. and don't blow it. Okay. Don't blow it, <laughs> don't because blow it. there is a fine line between adapting and maladapting, mm -hmm. and now exactly. we are becoming maladapted exactly. species, and, and species, my, you see? And my, and my comment goes into, not, I don't want to say this, but in a way, are we a generation quite soft in that way, that our expectation is extremely high? And that goes to what you, very, I've heard many of your lectures about happiness and about, and about even self-reporting health. Isn't it an expectation factor that really makes us think, like I have a, I have a my grandmother at 80, she could not get up out of, uh, out of a wheelchair. I have patients today, 80 years old, going up Mount Washington. So mm -hmm. you see the yep. difference yep. of ages and time. So anyway, I want to stop at, yep. in a bright point uh, that, you know, not all is lost. <laughs> Let's well, not blow it. Let's not blow it. Hmm? Well, you know, and, and it's funny because one of the things that I think is a challenge when you ask what, what's, some of it's expectation, but, and, and we were talking about this earlier. We talk about precision medicine. Um, uh, everything in this society is, is becoming more and more focused on the individual. And there are some good things about that, but we're losing sight of the community, of the co, of the whole, of the population. Uh, even with COVID, it's my right to choose what I want to do and what I don't want to do versus thinking about how that impacts other people. Um, I, I really worry uh, that the difference between those, those generations, they rallied. They came around. You know, you, you look at, uh, again, World War II. Um, the people who survived a tragic time were known as our greatest generation. Why? Because everything they did in response to World War II was about rallying, about rallying against the enemy. What's been our response to COVID? It certainly hasn't been rallying. It's been all about me, 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 me. And you know, what are you gonna do for me? What is this gonna do for me? You can't make me do something to try to help other people. That's what concerns me. And I think as parents, 
Um, we need to really help our kids understand the, the symbiotic relationship that we have with each other and with the planet and that we can't continue to exist and thrive if we don't uh, and, and, and adapt. Adapt if we don't um, do it together. Dr. Kane? So my, my last point is when I, when I told you about that vaccination rate in that for the Latino system, it, it's over 90 percent. That implies there was some incredible, incredible community education and outreach from Latino ex populations to make that happen. And so resources are brought to them. You can't tell me there's nothing they can't do. Yes. And they proved That's it definitely. in the city of Indianapolis, uh -huh. Marion County. Yes. So I think we're going to have a, a great young generation, mm -hmm. a Latino ex population leaders. Hey, they're going to carry it to the bank. And while we, mm -hmm. we took forever to get just that gun violence legislation bipartisan, I think this new generation that's coming from us, and that's why I say invest in our resources, invest in our youth, do that mentoring we need to do for them, and hey, they're going to take care of us. All right, sorry, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to take care of us. Any other questions? Camila? Yes. Oh, Camila first, and then there is somebody else over there. Okay, so this is uh, shifting gears a little bit, but I wanted to dive deeper into spirituality real quick. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, I know that everybody has you know, different opinions on this, but in your opinion, what's the place or the importance of spirituality in medicine? Um, you know, a lot of people say miracles you know, happen and, well, doctors will, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so basically that's my question, the importance of spirituality. definitely think miracles happen, but also I think for the resilience of a community and an individual, um, it, your faith has provides you with tremendous um, fortitude, character, uh, perseverance in terms of what happens to you. I only have one sister, a younger sister. I'm from Arkansas, and uh, she called me one night to say that uh, she took forever to find the telephone. She said, it must be a, we get a lot of tornadoes in Arkansas, so it's not unusual for the, you know, lights to go out completely. And she says, it's so funny, I had to, I couldn't find the phone, I finally called you, but she says, I, you know, she tries to watch the weather every day and she didn't hear any new weather. And she says, it's just completely black here. And I said, well, let me just check on, let me call your neighbor and let's see what's going on to see, you know, what's happening with the electricity. So I call across the street, and the neighbor says, well, I see the lights in your sister's in this house. All the lights are on. So that gave me a heart attack, because mm -hmm. this is now like 9 o'clock mm -hmm. at night, and if the lights are on and she can't, she's totally blind, I says, oh, my God, what's going on? So I got the ambulance to come and pick her up. This is a small little town. And I couldn't get an answer. You know, you call these hospital <laughs> systems trying to get an answer, and no one would tell me anything. So like 2 in the morning, finally got the doctor who says, well, we did a CT scan and whatever. We couldn't find anything wrong with her. And I said, well, what did the ophthalmologist say? Well, they have an ophthalmologist. Well, the ophthalmologist, you know, didn't come, on, come, come to see her. I said, what do you mean the ophthalmologist didn't come and see her? Uh, Dr. Abrams, you understand what I'm saying here? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, and see, this is a problem, I think, when you have people of color, that I, I assume that if it was the mayor, somebody, the ophthalmologist would have come in, but they didn't feel the need to come in, and they couldn't find anything wrong on the CT scan. And they had to wait because somebody from India was reading the scan uh, at 2 in the morning. So. I was on a plane at 6 in the morning. I got to Little Rock, Arkansas by 8 o'clock. I had to drive an hour to pick her up and then get her back uh, to University of uh, Arkansas Medical School. And I said, I need to talk to the resident on call 
because I have an emergency, you know. And uh, well, who are you? I'm Dr. Kane, and I'm infectious disease faculty. I didn't say I was from Indiana University. So, <laughs> so they assumed I was from University of Arkansas. <laughs> okay, okay. So of course she got immediate care because it's a faculty member, and it turned out she had had a uh, stroke, uh, and it, uh, a stroke where she had lost her yeah. eyesight, and we uh, during that visit. We, didn't, we knew she had a congenital heart defect, but we thought it was benign, and of course, it wasn't benign, and she flipped the blood clot yep. to her head, but she also flipped the blood clot to her kidneys, okay? So she was having a hypertensive encephalopathy, and they told us within 24 hours, they didn't think she was gonna make it because they couldn't get her blood pressure down. So fast forward real quick. Uh, she totally lost her vision from June the 12th all the way to October, totally blind. I couldn't get, they wanted her to do Braille and she was just very angry because she was a college professor, yeah. you know, and you know, if you can't see, it's very difficult to teach your students. And she had to go under dialysis mm -hmm. uh, three days a week and got a, um, from a patient customer standpoint, very poor. Uh, services, but having to go to Arkansas Drive an hour and 15 minutes three times a week in order to get dialysis, um, very depressing. But I, in October, I went to visit her to care, I went to all her medical visits, and uh, I'm getting some food for her, and she says, wow, um, are you wearing something red? I dropped the plate. I was wearing a red jacket. So after being blind from June to all the way to October, she started to see color. And in December, she could actually distinguish her face. It took that long for her just to even distinguish her face. And that was her first miracle, because she's a reportable case, one of three people in the country. Um, she was on dialysis for two years and couldn't get the labs right. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, there's something wrong with these labs. And, and that's okay, well, I'll come back. So they did the labs one more week, still wrong, and they sent it to another outside of the medical center lab to say that she no longer required dialysis. Mm -hmm. for, so someone being on dialysis for two years, no longer requires dialysis, she got her sight back now that she can drive. She, she's not 100%, granted she can't get on the highways, but at least she can drive to the grocery store yeah. now. That's a miracle, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would like to, to call for a collective, co, co, collective, communal miracle. Mm -hmm. okay? you, you use the word spirituality. Uh, I had the fortune about 20 years ago, more now, uh, to be invited by a group of uh, religious leaders. There were rabbis, imams, uh, gurus, uh, priests, ministers, etc. And they wanted to create a master's in spirituality and health, the first in Canada. And they invited me to be part of the group, and, and I couldn't help it. I said, what do we mean by spirituality? And we did a review of the literature and two words came out, became noticeable, purpose and meaning. Across every culture, faith and everything, purpose and meaning. And I'm looking at the next generation, those two words there, generation, genesis, generate genesis, origin. And what if the collective miracle we should aspire to generate together is to look at our children and grandchildren as our main source of purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. What would happen if we were able to do that? Huh? That would be a miracle worth thinking. Yeah. Hmm? Absolutely. Indeed. Absolutely. Dr. Haddad mentioned earlier um, isolation as a predictor of poor health. Um, spirituality, we know from the literature, to your point, is connected with better health. Yep. Um, it, it, it actually, you know, scientifically is connected with better health. People who have a spiritual home or, or have a spiritual belief 
because you are less likely to be isolated, you're more likely to be connected, you're no, more likely to have purpose and meaning. These are predictors of whether or not you're gonna say, well, my health is, is, is good or better. Or if you say, ah, things are pretty bad. And so it's an incredibly important part. I say a long time ago, unfortunately, we cut the head off from the rest of the body. And we said, if it happens from your neck down, your doctor will see you now and your insurance will pay for it. And if it happens from here up, then, uh, then good luck. And that's whether it's dental health or auditory health or vision health or mental health or spiritual health. And so uh, the, the best practices now are integrative health, where we bring all those together. And actually, this time last week, I was in Alaska, and we were uh, um, visiting indig some indigenous communities. And uh, they've done a really good job there of incorporating traditional Western medicine with, uh, with their spirituality and their spiritual medicine. And uh, they've had great success um, really creating that holistic environment where people feel comfortable coming in. The other thing is spiritual homes are great places to make those connections for care. I would rather have your rabbi or your imam, you know, or your, or your pastor telling you, go out and get your blood sugar checked, go get that vaccination, than to have your doctor telling you to do it. Because I know in communities of color especially, they'll do it if their pastor says to do it. If their doctor says to do it, they're gonna be like, eh. <laughs> it becomes compelling. Exactly. One more one interesting point on, this, on, on spirituality, that many of the practices that are across many spiritual beliefs, prayer, meditation, um, have been studied. And uh, from the brain point of view in neuroscience, when you are engaging in these activities, there's some networks called the default network and similar that promote healing, promote better mm -hmm. sleep, promote uh, relaxation. And on the other hand, if you do systemic markers of inflammation, they decrease. So it's very interesting. Even if we don't get into scientific proof or not proof of spirituality or, uh, or an afterlife and so forth, even on the scientific level, we can say inflammation decreases and your brain works better yes. and promotes healing. So thank you for that question. Very important. Adam, you want to? Yeah, practice. Okay, I don't know. I'll speak out loud. It's not a problem. Um, so we've talked to. It's on now. Okay. All right. So we've talked a little bit about what patients uh, really want, and I kind, of, I kind of focus on a few different aspects, access to care, quality care, and the rising cost of care. So as experts in your field, uh, and influential voices in the community, what is one innovative idea that each of you have to help patients with those three facets, and how do you imagine that changing over the, past five, or the next five years? Well, I'm gonna jump in really quickly because I put out a Surgeon General's report that was unlike any other Surgeon General's report that had been put out um, because I wrote it with the UVA Darden School of Business, with the Chamber of Commerce, with the Business Roundtable, and it was called Community Health and Economic Prosperity, um, Engaging Businesses. And, uh, and we did that because in my public health career um, that goes back now, um, I got my 2000s, 2000s when I got my MPH at, at Berkeley, so it goes back 22 years. I found that whenever health is pitted against business, we lose over and over and over again. Here in Indiana, haven't raised tobacco taxes in decades. Is it because people don't know that cigarettes are bad for you? Is it because people don't know that the higher the cost of the cigarettes, um, the fewer the people that smoke? No, it's because every time we debate it, someone shows up at the legislature and says, yeah, we know cigarettes are bad for you, but hey, our gas stations are gonna suffer if people drive across to Ohio or drive across, you know, to, to get their cigarettes, or drive across to Kentucky to get their cigarettes. Um, what I found is we need to make the business case for health. And COVID actually has given us a tremendous opportunity because COVID has shown us that if we're not healthy as a community, you're not gonna have a healthy workforce and it's gonna shut down your economy. So if there was one thing I could, could do, and I am actually trying to do it, it is to intentionally engage businesses. We, we make the case that healthcare is the number two expense for most businesses. Do you know when you buy a General Motors car, you are paying more for healthcare than you are for steel in that car? Paying more for healthcare. And this is why Ontario produces more cars than Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's why you're seeing a lot of these companies going to other countries to produce their products because there is a healthcare cost 
built in to um, building anything, producing anything in the United States that is quite simply unsustainable. We talk about raising the minimum wage. Well, actually, the salaries in the United States have gone up if you include health care costs in that salary. It's just that everything else has been stagnant or going down because the health care costs keep rising. So if I could do one thing, it would be to have the business leaders, the Dave Ricks, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the uh, Jeff Bezoses of the world out there making the case that we need to create healthier communities um, for so, to, to create a healthier so, economic So climate. Dave Ricks is out there, uh, head of uh, Lilly Pharmaceutical mm -hmm. Company, uh, made his presence. Yep. Oh, both you and I were at the economic uh, luncheon, and he's even actually been on national TV to say that we're, we've got to get control of the cost. And if you look at the state of Indiana, um, one of our healthcare systems ranks seventh overall in terms of healthcare costs. <laughs> and we're in the Midwest, so you say, wow, how's our healthcare costs higher than, say, that state of New York, New York or California. Some, some of those other places? So I think uh, they are listening, healthcare systems now. I think we're going to see a major difference, but we definitely have to be more transparent in our costs. So why should a uh, heart stent cost $20,000 in one hospital system and another at $3,000? We need to know it before going in um, to uh, have our health care costs. I mean, hey, when I go buy my tire for my car or anything else, you know, I get the prices. So the same should be for health care costs. And until that happens, that's huge. That's what we need to do to make the transparency there. And then also, um, I want to see your results. So, mm -hmm. you know, I may be getting my, my heart stent from you, but tell me how successful are you with your heart stents at the same time? The quality. Yes, quality. the quality is huge. Did you have thoughts? Ms. Andrew? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Senjo. Um, I'm from Haiti. Uh, I was a physician from my country, coming to the U.S. trying to study to get uh, medical residency here. But in the in the meantime, I didn't know what to do to make a difference. I mean, to be I was wondering if I could be helpful. And then I found Halivio. I'm not Latino. I'm Haitian, but they welcomed me. So that's the first thing I want to point out: the diversity of this institution. So it's primarily a Latino clinic, but I don't want you to think that we only see Latino patients and only Latino work, work with them. Yes. So I'm Haitian and I work with, with them. When I was passing my interview with Dr. Lopez, I guess I, guess I knew about 10 Spanish words, uh, but I used them well. God, God blessed, blessed me and I got the job. Yes, and I got the job. But now I'm practicing with, with patients and more and more my, my Spanish is, is, is getting better. So I would like to point out that this institution, um, they, they don't prioritize money, but compassion and good care. And the patients, they are like family. When they come, they know everything. And they, sometimes they are telling me about the clinic, about the dynamic, about everyone who is working at the clinic. And when they see me, they automatically know that I'm new because they didn't know me. Uh, before. Um, what I, I would like to say um, for my question is that um, did, you, did you know that some people, immigrants in the U.S. and Indiana, don't know if they, can, if they can go to the hospital if they don't have insurance, even though they have money? Mm -hmm. I met a person like that, Haitian like me, who is sick but cannot go to the hospital wondering if they will find care because they don't have insurance. And right now, we have a lot of Haitian in the state of Indiana. So my question, uh, I leave you started with the idea that Dr. Lopez had from the, the radio program that he had. And then many patients were, I mean, asking question, question, question. And now they are coming to Alivio, even though they don't have, don't, they don't have insurance, mm -hmm. but they, they, they get care and they feel comfortable. So what can we do before we go to the state level, because, before we go to 
regulations to the Senate to, 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 for law uh, because, be, before you go to, I mean, public funding. But what can we do uh, so we can make people aware that, first of all, they can still get care? And then if we do so, letting them know that they can get care, how can we help them through the process? Because, because at Alivio, if the patient does, doesn't have money, so we worked with the patient. Mm -hmm. we, 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 uh, we set up plan of payment so that the patient can still get care and have a way to pay. So what can we do in the same sense? Because I live here right now, we, we be, we, we're becoming a system with uh, several clinics. But at the state level, what can we do? Can we start, uh, to finish, can we start by a uh, campaign, campaign of sensibilization, sensibilization for people so they can be aware that they can get medical care and then what can we do to, to help them? Uh, you know, depending on your, whatever your, um, your, your, what particular ethnic population you are, there are a lot of communication channels that people use, whether social media, it may be radio, or it could even be your faith base. And I think you have to reach out to get those resources there. So is there a Haitian, for example, radio program that people listen to that you need to get that message out? Or they may, there may be some um, community civic um, facility that a lot may go to, or they may, it could even be like a, a community um, place where I, I wash my clothes, laundry. You know, a laundry mat or places like that. So you have to figure out from a social network where they are, but resources have to be provided in order to fund that outreach to those entities. But this is all about developing critical partnerships to get the message out. And do what you're doing. Keep telling you your really story. You really have to do, yes. Keep telling your story because I will tell you again, and I said this earlier, I'm having someone at the table sharing those stories with your leaders um, will help them. There's so many people out there. I guarantee you if I went on Twitter right now, because I do it about once a week and say there are still barriers to people being able to get vaccinations. No, there's not. Vaccines are everywhere. I can go to my CVS, I can go to my Walgreens, I can go wherever and get a vaccination. No, there are people out there who still do not know that they can walk in and get free health care for COVID or um, EMTALA, for, for, for really any emergency situation. People do not know that, but th th that's a problem. But the big problem is that people in charge think that everybody knows it and think that they don't have to address that issue. But you do have to be careful. I'm going to be honest with you, you have to be careful because you might have some money, but to go to an ER for like a sore throat, mm -hmm. you get a thousand dollar bill. Right. Yep. And if you don't pay after a while, they're going to send collections oh, yeah. after you, and it can affect your credit. So we have to be careful when we're talking to people about referrals and and how they're utilizing these services. And and everybody doesn't go to collections now, so that may be important where you send a referral for mm -hmm. someone, depending on what the problem is. And, and two very quick points, Sandro and, and everyone. One is that. Mm, we need to convince uh, financial institutions and business. You've been talking a lot about business. That is good business to invest in communities and in young doctors to place clinics and multi-services. Yes. Yes. That's number one. Number two, we need to work with academics. Most of our medical students never see an option of opening a practice, not anymore. They see uh, academic medicine, they see big groups medicine, they see public health, or they see others. But they seldom or none, none of the time, they see a practicing doctor in the community. The problem so, is women are taking over medicine. You just need to know that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a good reminder. It's still good business to do that. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to say that. Any, any other questions? Dr. Smedley. Yeah, oh, it is? Okay. Uh, returning to mental health, the American Psychological Association has uh, issued a warning, general warning, 
that we put, that families and especially children avoid constant watching and streaming of the violence that occurs coming through our TVs, our laptops, and iPads. Um, there's a concept called racial trauma, mm -hmm. so that this is particularly true for uh, persons of color, Latinos, African Americans. And so I was just wondering if you all had any suggestions from, from the state and uh, federal level, any ways to get the word out to, uh, you know, one, one out of every five people in the United States has some kind of diagnosable and treatable challenge. And this was before the pandemic, mm -hmm. before what I call the two pandemics, COVID and racial violence. And so there's a challenge here when you don't have to be physically present in a traumatic situation, shooting, racial violence, or what have you. You can, if you continually allow yourself in this 24-hour news cycle to bombard your senses with every four or five hours when they talk about a shooting or when they talk about uh, racial violence, you can be traumatized, with a minor tra trauma. There's no, no official diagnosis, but it's very much like PTSD. So I'm just wondering if you all had any suggestions. I know I talk to my, every client that I have, whether mm -hmm. it's depression, anxiety, whatever, monitor your news uh, watching. There so, are, so with, you, with all of the, with all of, with, with all of the streaming, movies, mm -hmm. Netflix, Hulu, and so forth, there are thousands of things that you can, movies that you can watch, comedies or whatever you can watch on TV. But you need to minimize your constant streaming of violent acts, acts, acts on television. So a couple things I want you to be aware of really quickly. The current Surgeon General, my uh, successor, Dr. Murthy, put out a, um, a Surgeon General's advisory um, about the youth mental health crisis that, that, it, that is going on right now. And when we put out these types of advisories, it is to raise awareness and to give people like you um, extra wind in your sails when you say this is an issue. Because you're saying it's an issue and the Surgeon General of the United States says it's an issue and then the data is collected. So go to surgeongeneral.gov, check out that advisory, use that as wind in your sails. Also know that um, b uh, bipartisan legislation allowed the, the, uh, the um, soon to be released 988 mental health crisis hotline to be approved. And in July, I believe July 16th, um, there will be a new mental health hotline, 988. And we need to make sure people know about that so that when people, and especially youth, are in crisis, they have a number that they can call. We know in many cases, um, communities of color are scared to call 911 if they're having a mental health crisis because they don't send a social worker, they don't send a mental health expert, they send a police officer. And you're as likely to be shot as you are to get help in some of these cases. And so those are two national things that are going on. Surgeon General's Advisory 988 to help raise attention to that issue. Okay, we're gonna to start to wrap up. One more question by Luis, and then I'm gonna ask each of you if you can just give a very brief um, last statement for, for, for the group. You have, you have a right. So, uh, wonderful panel. I just want to mention from uh, a previous question from Adam, um, I, I, and I want to thank you, Dr. Lopez, for giving me the opportunity to be a colleague to you mm -hmm. and um, taking over the foundation that you started. Wow. So uh, we talked about education, and, and, and thank you, Dr. Kane, for being a sponsor of some of the students that we work with. So that's the thank yous. I will thank you, Dr. Lopez's mom, um, Ruby, for being in the community as well. So that's, that's the list, that's the Oscar side of things, you know, thank yous. But um, on the innovation question, doc, uh, working with Alivio, uh, thanks to Obamacare, and as, as we evolved into having employees, we were thinking, how, how can we serve them better? So, so that, thank you for that analogy on um, Detroit and Ontario, right, the, the dynamic. 
I said, like, how, how can we take better care of our employees on the healthcare side? And talk, I talked to Dr. Lopez then, a business, you know, talk business. How can we do this, right? So they opened the clinic, uh, a VIP program to us and extended that to us uh, for exchange of a modest amount of money that we could do. So that compared to healthcare insurance or you know, that, that side of business. I, I would have to pay about $400 per employee. Um, I got a better deal with Alivio. So, so that's, that's number one. Number two, Obamacare, you can go and get your access to that. Number three, I said, instead of giving those $400 to the insurance company, I can just give $2,000 to my employees for anything. So then it shrinks that deductible part mm -hmm. so they can have $2,000 up front Let's say they have a $6,000, so then the first $2,000 we provide to them, right? So they can go to a leave, you have the better prices, reduced prices, and then we reimburse them for that up to $2,000. Then the rest, the other $4,000, they would have to cover, but it's for anything, mental health. Um, I've seen Dr. Smedley with the, with the clients and all that, um, but anything. You need aspirin, we'll reimburse you. you mm -hmm. Your kid had eye surgery, we'll reimburse you. Like they call, right? The family. So just wanted to, to thank everybody. I don't know if you want to comment or not, but that's just uh, for illustration for everybody. Thank you, Luis. Well, I'm going to ask if we start with Dr. Virginia Kane. I'll speak first. Okay. Yes, you're always Ladies first. Ladies first. You're always first. Then yeah, maybe Alex and Dr. Adams. Um, um, just want to state that when you looked at all those different countries and health outcomes versus the United States, uh, most, of those most of those countries spent like two to three times the resources for social service resources yes. that address the social determinants. Mm -hmm. So I want us not to forget that while you're providing medical care, we have kids sometimes in the summer, they don't have any food <laughs> on the table or the electricity bill may be turned off because they can't pay the rent, can't keep it up with the living wages. So I want us to think about um, how do we invest in our youth, in our children. One, address the literacy. Teach them how to read. We need to teach our children how to read. That's, that's the number one thing Number two, we got to make sure that our children are fed. Because, you know, I don't care where they are. If they're hungry, they're going to be sick and whatever. So I think those two things, and I think if we all partner together, focus on those resources and physical activity after, after school, summer programs, there's so many programs that they can do that they don't have to watch TV. They don't have to play those computer games. Um, I think soccer's dangerous, but that's just me personally, because I got kicked in the stomach. But there are a lot of inexpensive things out there that we can support with our youth that will make them healthy and things we can do together as a family. Mm -hmm. Walk, bicycle, learn how to swim. Hey, be a tennis star, you know. It won't hurt. In Indiana, everybody loves basketball. So I just think there are wonderful opportunities that we can bring some great resources out there. And the health department is always happy to partner with great, great health care systems such as this particular medical center. Love it. Yeah, trying to peek. What to say? How many people came here from outside the U.S.? From where? Oh. From where? From where did you come? I'm a Palestinian. Well, I've been this No, no, but to this meeting, like in the last 48 hours. Okay. Well, I came from Florida. Okay, that could be <laughs> like a different country. <laughs> Martha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Martha, you and I might be the only people here who came to this event and traveled from outside the country. So, I'm going to try to represent 
two billion people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my best here. Uh, this country is very special. And, uh, and it's at risk. And for those of us who, who live outside, um, there is a lot uh, riding on what happens here um, for the next generation. I'm focusing on that, those two words, the next generation. There is no scarcity here. There is abundance. And, and I think it's important to recognize the privilege that exists in this country. Even the poorest person would be viewed by families I've seen in Sierra Leone, in Colombia, yes. and other parts of the world as extremely privileged. So this is, this is the time to figure out, because innovation has made this country what it is. And innovation is what results when you invest knowledge to generate value. And you need talent and opportunity. Knowledge, talent, and opportunity give you value to society. And it's not only financial. In fact, financial is almost a secondary effect of doing the right thing. So I have a plea to make, which is to raise to the occasion. This is a historical moment, and the future of the species depends on the decisions that are made here, more than ever. Don't blow it. <laughs> Lead by example is the only way to do it. And this is the moment when we need great examples, more than ever. So we've had a wonderful conversation today. And I want to thank my, uh, my fellow panelists for, for being up here. Um, and we've talked about a lot of heavy things. But I, I want to leave you on a positive note. And I want you to, to think about um, adaptation and opportunity. Um, what makes us different than all the other animals that exist on this planet? It is our ability to adapt, to change, to evolve. And to adapt to change itself. <clears throat> exactly. Just and not to specific conditions. Yes. It's built in us. Exactly. Exactly. And so I want you to, to, to understand that. I want you to understand that the greatest advances in health policy uh, in this country and on this planet have come not during times of calm, but during times of crisis. When you look at World War I, that was when we had massive expansion in blood banking and blood transfusion therapy. And that saved tens of millions, hundreds of millions of lives because of a tragedy, a terrible tragedy that was World War I. Did you know World War II was the first Operation Warp Speed? We saw a massive expansion of production of penicillin. Um, and that penicillin saved lives. And that expansion of antibiotic usage saved tens of millions of lives afterwards. The Gulf War um, gave us massive expansions in trauma therapy. Um, it's where we came up with the 3 2 one rule and where we started to adapt the way that we cared for patients who had traumatic injuries. This pandemic is a tragedy by any measure, but it's no greater, greater tragedy than World War I or World War II or the Gulf War. It is a tragedy. It's also an opportunity. It is a tremendous opportunity for us to reflect on what was broken about the system that we weren't willing to change before, that now we have an opportunity to change because we see it and because we can galvanize support around it. So I share um, your, your challenge to all of us. We can look at this as a tragedy alone. We can look at it as something that we want to put in the rearview mirror and never, ever, ever think about again. Or we can look at it as our once in a generation opportunity to really fix some of the fundamentally broken parts of our systems and to innovate such that we save exponentially more lives in the future than were lost during this tragedy. And that's what I'm committed to doing. That's what I'm convinced humans are going to do because I have faith in humanity. And that's, what I'm going to, yeah, that's what I'm convinced we're going to do in the United States because um, arguably better than anyone in the world, we, uh, over the course of, of, of mankind, we've shown that we have the ability to adapt, to innovate, and to thrive in the face of challenges. So I want to challenge you all 
to think about it that way. Every time someone says something bad, think about, okay, but what can we take out of that that's a lesson to be learned and a positive uh, that, we can, that we can bring to, to, to bear to change things in the future so that we don't have that bad again and that we have exponentially more good that comes out of it. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you, you for, for, again, your support of me as Surgeon General of the United States. Yeah. And I hope that you all will continue to mentor and sponsor young people so that we can have many more Surgeons General who understand <laughs> uh, our challenges and who represent us at the table so that we aren't on the menu. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to all of you who came today. Many of you we've known from Alivio, from the community, doctors, speakers. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. What a celebration. I mean, we celebrated with lectures and speech and thinking. This is wonderful, and uh, we want to continue with Alivio, and um, we want to continue making a difference in this community and many other communities. Thank you very much. Have a great day, and thank you to all the speakers.